shall we start now i will begin with the introduction and uh, yeah, i think that will be fine okay just a minute just a minute yeah. we can start cool. and you can switch on your video actually yeah yeah sure. so uh, good morning all uh, welcome to uh, second day of uh, research college day series of events i hope you had a great time yesterday and today is the most power packed day like we have session starting from 9 am until uh, 8 pm today so don't miss any of them so it's going to be exciting uh, to give a very uh, very great and enthusiastic uh, start for the day we have dr arpan yagnik here uh, who is an expert in creative aerobics as we all know creativity is something which is going to uh, change the future and it really uh, fuels innovation so uh, today arpan yagnik will be uh, giving us some in uh, some insights on how to use life of uh, students as well as uh, researchers and how to incorporate this into your uh, regular work so he is a te uh, ted speaker and published author of peer reviewed journals and he is also the author of the book uh, creative aerobics and yeah he has uh, many uh, many awards to his uh, to his eminence and i would like to uh, give the mic to dr arpan yagnik sir uh, Sir, you can uh, start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, warm welcome. I am very excited and stoked about uh, sharing something that is very close to my heart. And I hope that after uh, this uh, talk, this one uh, interaction, it uh, becomes close to you as well. So. Um, this whole talk uh, about creativity and i have a powerpoint let me share that as well so that we can all uh, go together um this uh, came about and uh, when i was contacted about this for about 2 months ago uh, something that really caught my eye was the theme the theme of uh, shunya zero and especially in the work that i do in creative aerobics there is a concept uh, which very closely aligns to shunya and zero and um, i'll be talking about it as well uh, in one of the slides but i really hope that you are all um, settled it's a warm um, warm uh, morning over there i believe and um, you've all um, had some good breakfast so let us get this uh, going so this is something that you all are quite familiar with it is something that many of you have done it brings nostalgia uh, it brings some fond memories of when you were a child and um, you by now already also have a picture emerging from this like you know what will be the end game over here this is a very important uh, sort of a metaphor uh, over here and our life so far in a lot of ways has been like this we acquire certain uh knowledge we develop certain knowledge systems and we apply them and there are certain steps that we follow uh and here you know uh, the knowledge of number system and you can either follow the ascending order or the descending order you know about it you can follow and regardless of what you choose eventually a beautiful picture is going to emerge and uh that is the sort of guarantee that we all have that if we do certain things if we fill in uh, like fill out certain check boxes a beautiful picture is going to emerge something similar i also thought when i was growing up that hey if i you know go to school get good marks 
you know, then go to college, then get a job, things will work out like that. Um, but I started realizing early on that uh, this is not how life works. Increasingly now than before 15 or 20 years ago when I started thinking about uh, these things. There were a lot of changes, but these changes were extremely subtle. It was like a slow moving glacier. The top layer was moving very slowly, but there was a lot of movement which was not visible. And um, I took some drastic steps in my life, changed my path uh, absolutely. And um, I ended up in a situation where um, I'm very happy with myself. And I hope that uh, this, after this talk, one of the things um, long-term goal that I have is that by using creativity and creative aerobics, you uh, become happy with yourself. Because when you are happy uh, with yourself, you also develop this ability to go a little bit beyond and uh, help others and do good for others. And I'm sure uh, that most of you over here, you're looking to do good and bring about a positive change in the society and so on. So life for me was like this, and I was just, you know, joining one dot after the other. And so far, most of you guys and girls are also doing uh, the same. However, if you have not realized it, and if you have not seen it, peace, is in danger. For a lot of things to be accomplished, we require a certain form of peace. For a lot of elaborative good to happen, you require peace. But peace is an endangered entity now. You pick any place on this planet, there is trouble brewing. It is simmering. South America, Central America, North America, Africa, Europe, Middle East, Southeast Asia. There is trouble everywhere. So although they say that we are enjoying one of the longest periods of peace, but there is trouble brewing everywhere. In addition to that, stability is extinct. There is not, no, no certainty, there is no guarantee. Today, you have a job, forget tomorrow, today evening you might not have one. Today, you are enjoying good health. Tomorrow, <laughs> we are definitely seeing the same with the surge, the second surge of the coronavirus pandemic in India. I think we have crossed uh, 85,000 numbers in day yesterday. So, so many things are unstable. They are unstirred, certain. We are constantly on a war mode. We're constantly, you know, fighting fires everywhere. We're constantly, you know, yearning for that little piece of uh, peace and stability. We are living in what has been uh, long referred to as the VUCA world. Volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity. These are all what there is left and we have to still you know create a beautiful picture for us we still have to join the dots the only problem is those dots don't exist those dots don't align those do dots don't have any numbers 
So using some of our current knowledge systems, we are unable to create that beautiful picture that we want to. And this has baffled us, many of us. It has caught us, you know, uh, in a very vulnerable state where, of course, we are going to bounce back. There's, you know, no option, but it has caught us off guard. So with some of these things, while um, technology has, uh, you know, played a great role, but if you, you know, ask a certain group of uh, scholars, they say that uh, there is not a real, real sort of um, invention or a discovery that has happened like in the last decade, except for uh, GANs, uh, the adversarial network uh, sort of thing. But so we really have to now, you know, come out of this um, quicksand. What is something that is going to help us get out of this? Um, and that is creativity. Creativity is not easy. And the reason why I say this is because um, it's challenging, it's layered, it's uh, enigmatic, it's puzzling, it's nebulous. Creativity is something that you have to put effort. Creativity is, you know, uh, a developed ability. It is an acquired trait. So creativity is not easy, but it can be trained. It can be enhanced. It can be, uh, you know, inculcated in your daily life, in your daily routine, in your research. Creativity as a field of uh, research, I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of uh, when it started. Um, American Psychological Association, APA, in 1950, uh, its president, J.P. Guilford, he gave an address where he said that creativity is something that must be studied. And then there was some interest that was gathered uh, people who were studying the concepts and notions of intelligence, they started looking at uh, creativity and, and it went on. But uh, systematic research in creativity and systematic uh, agency of creativity as a subfield or a field did not really start, you know, like some 30 years ago and it is still not there yet. So it is still very nascent. Um, it was sort of a foster child in uh, psychology. And then there were some other, uh, you know, allied disciplines that picked up on it uh, a little bit here and there. Uh, but it is very difficult to quantify. Uh, there are so many measures. There are so many different ways to look at it. Where does creativity lie? Is it in the person? Is it in the process? Uh, is it in the place? Uh, is it in the product, the output? There's just so many complications. So proper explication of creativity, although tremendous efforts have been made, uh, has not really happened. So I'm not going to go into all of that, although that is a phenomenal um, opportunity for research uh, for many of you who might be interested in it, uh, developing scales, um, you know, items and instruments, for measuring creativity in different domains. Uh, you know, there is creativity in kids, which is different from creativity in engineers. Uh, Purdue did some research, I believe in um, 1960s or 70s, where they were trying to um, measure creativity amongst engineers. Uh, after that, maybe two, one or two more attempts have been made to measure creativity among uh, engineers, because, you know, the verbal and the literal aspects of creativity or the measurements, uh, they say that, you know, if you are trying to test or examine the strength of alligator in flying, uh, that's not what uh, is a good strategy to do. So you have to measure its strength in the water, in its, you know, uh, arena, in its core domain. So 
what are some of the ways that you can measure creativity or enhance creativity among engineers, different types of engineers, different fields uh, of engineering. So this is a huge area of research and I, I encourage many of you to look into it because this is going to be very important and your contribution in this area, if you happen to do so, will be uh, path breaking. So creativity um, is something that is uh, like an elusive uh, unicorn. You know, if you all want it, we all uh, want to have it, but it's just uh, not available that easily. So what is creativity? Let's very quickly look at it. There are many uh, definitions of creativity, some of you know the ones that are common that you know about, and I'm not going to uh, get into some of you know those uh, typical ones, the ability to share uh, or come up with original ideas that have a value and things like that. This is a very special explanation, uh, which I'm going to share with you and I'm sharing with you right now. Uh, and if you want to locate this, you will have to go to the FAQ section of MacArthur Genius Grant webpage. Um, MacArthur Genius is one of uh, the most prestigious uh, honor that an individual can uh, receive. And this is in my humble opinion, because uh, most awards and rewards, they come with certain types of strings attached. Um, somebody has to nominate you, you have to apply for it. But MacArthur Genius is something where you cannot apply for it. No one can nominate you. And there is a, a secret team of individuals that actually follows you and your work for, uh, you know, sometimes decades, not, not, you know, six months or one year, but decade. And then they choose you for this honor and then they give you quite a substantial amount of money, uh, more than half a million dollars with no strings attached. You can do whatever, you can just put it in your bank and you know live on an island for the rest of your life. But of course, people who are so dedicated and committed, they don't do that. So this is uh, the explanation of creativity from the MacArthur Genius uh, website. It's in the FAQ section if you wanna go and look it up. What does it say? Um, that creativity is a drive and ability. It's two things, it's not just one, it's not just ability. It's also about the attitude. It's about this you know, drive, that zeal from within to make something new or to connect the seemingly unconnected. Uh, we started this talk with, uh, you know, this uh, exercise about connecting uh, the dots. But as we enter this world where peace is uh, endangered and stability is extinct, some of these dots, they don't exist. So how are you going to connect them? You still have to make meaning. You still have to, you know, uh, create a, a context out of nothing. How are you going to do that? So creativity is this element that allows you to make something new or to connect the seemingly unconnected in significant ways. The term significant is very important. And you all, especially being from the research background, I don't have to uh, go much into detail, otherwise, I usually have to dedicate anywhere between five and seven minutes to explain the meaning of the term significant the way uh, we understand it. So as to enrich um, uh, in connect these seemingly unconnected in significant ways to enrich our understandings of ourselves. Um, as medical science progresses, we know a lot about ourselves, but still there's so much that we do not know about ourselves, the way we work, our brain, there are just so many puzzles that are unsolved yet. There is so much about our um, anatomy, there is so much about our behaviors, there is so much uh, diversity amongst ourselves that 
we still don't know a lot about ourselves. So here we are trying to connect these doors, which are unconnected to enrich our understanding of ourselves, our communities. If we are complex, our com communities are made of many, many complex interactions. So just imagine all the interaction effect that's working out there uh, and making a community, the world, the universe. I think I just read that uh, very recently we realized that the size of our galaxy, somebody started measuring it and it is not what we thought. It was, you know, much bigger than we anticipated it. Uh, what do we know about exoplanets? Planets that are beyond our solar system. So there's so much more to know and understand, but it can't happen uh, just by not developing this ability and drive to create something new or to connect the seemingly unconnected. And creativity can take uh, you know, many different forms. And that's the beautiful thing about this. You can um, ask questions that open fields of uh, you know, different inquiries at, as yet unexplored. There is so much. Who knew there would be so much one year ago that there would be so much to know and learn and explore about uh, coronavirus. It was not even on any radar or map or, you know, it was not um, a research ag agenda that was actively being, uh, you know, discovered or, or sought after. But there are so many questions that have emerged. There are so many different explorations that had to be conducted and many different fields all the way from, you know, production facilities, a lot of engineering required in the development of masks and whatnot. Uh, the entire vaccine uh, in, in the US over here, uh, it was all under the banner of uh, Operation uh, Warp Speed, where you know vaccines were developed. India did a phenomenal job with its uh, developing its two uh, vaccines, and it is providing vaccines to a huge portion of the world is what I understand. And uh, according to the last estimate, India has uh, already vaccinated uh, a close to 65 million uh, people, which is pretty phenomenal. So creativity can take many forms, uh, innovative solutions to perplexing problems. Hunger is still a problem. Malaria is still a problem. You know, we are pretty much on the last verge of uh, eliminating polio but there are so many, pollution is such a problem. Uh, we, every, practically every day we hear about um, the bad quality of air in New Delhi and how you know, it's so bad that you can't go out, you can't keep your windows open. These are perplexing problems and we've got to solve them. And we, the existing means have not worked yet. We have also come at a point and a juncture in our uh, you know, um, life that we cannot go back on some of these things. If somebody asks you to not use vehicles, not use some, some of the modern amenities, our dependence on them, uh, our reliance on them has increased so much that it's, it's not easy to go back on some of these advances. We cannot go back you know, to the stone ages and live like that, which means that we have to come up with some really, really innovative ways to solve these perplexing problems. What is required? Research, creative research, creative problem solving is needed. Um, how are we going to solve the problem of microplastics? Something to think about. And of course, I'm sure there are so many um, uh, you know, different uh, initiatives are uh, you know, going on. Just the other day, I heard of something called the Great Bubble Barrier. Plastics that go um, into river, that flow into the river, they are now using bubbles and creating barriers. And this is known as the Great Bubble Barrier. 
bubbles are you know they just uh, use uh, oxygen and some kind of air to create this barrier and bubbles they always rise up and the beauty of this is that it will channel up to 97% of uh, pollutants and it will channel it into a, a recycling and a processing waste processing facility but it will not inhibit the marine and the aquatic life from moving across fishes can go through the bubble barrier but the the plastic and other uh, pollutants they cannot so some of these are very innovative solutions uh, these are also novel methods tools art forms uh, we need these to entertain ourselves ideas from different disciplines into wholly new constructions right now there's so much research technology is coming together with computing uh, with media telecommunications these are coming uh, different understanding from uh, different fields are being you know fused together interdisciplinarity is becoming huge bioinformatics you know um, different aspects of um, you know data visualizations and data science uh, big data all of these things there's so much more to be done there's so much learning from some of the traditional disciplines uh, digital humanities are coming up in a huge ways in in huge way so uh, all these uh, fusions of different disciplines it is only possible by seeing certain things that are not being seen yet and you require a creative uh, you know brain for that the last one is my favorite one and uh, that is producing works that broaden the horizons of our imagination and the very thought that our imagination has some kind of a horizon is a bit scary and now if there is a force if there is an element that can broaden the horizon of our imagination that's got to be a phoenix force it is something that we have to absolutely make a part of our life and um, that is something that i i hope that you take away uh, from this talk that creativity is a phoenix force it can transform you it can change not just you but life around you people around you communities around you the way you incorporate it in your research in your work it's it's just next level it is going to give you a competitive edge but your competitive edge is going to transform this world so uh, i hope that i've been um, able to explain what creativity is to you and of course there are so many definitions you can look them up but this is my favorite explanation and i wanted you to understand what creativity is i wanted you to get a very holistic view of creativity and the different forms that it can take so you have to ask yourself these questions how can we create you know new constructions new tools new methods novel you know art forms innovative solutions and and take this thing further um along with this i want you to also understand this little hierarchy that creativity is like the crude oil you know without creativity there are no ideas ideas are a by product of creativity if you are creative you can generate more ideas and that is one of the like you know standard uh, tests the ability to generate ideas flexibility fluency you know originality the more ideas that you are able to generate that's because of your creativity so creativity is like the crude oil if there is creativity then there are ideas amongst this massive universal set of ideas there are some which gain social acceptance they also gain commercial success such ideas become innovation engineering and technology is you know there are so many successful ideas 
there are so many successful innovations but for every successful innovation there were 100 different ideas the uh, form of printing press that uh, we see the german one the gutenberg printing press was not the first uh, one the chinese were uh, doing printing since the 12th century but their idea or their form um, of printing press did not gain prominence because of you know certain uh, defects or deficiencies in it and therefore it never became the innovation that it should have so um, for every one successful innovation there are 100 or 99 failed ideas and all of these come from creativity. So it is very important if you are uh, looking towards, you know, being an entrepreneur and creating innovation, a creativity is at the base of it. Without it, you know, you can't really do much. Even if you want to be an entrepreneur within an organizational setup, if you want to work, what does an organization value? Somebody who has a lot of ideas or somebody who does not have a lot of Creativity is consistently among the top three um, traits or skills that employers want from their employees. Have you gotten training for creativity? I don't think so. Um, there are hardly any places that actually teach you creativity. A lot of people talk about ideas and innovations, but you don't really get trained in creativity. You don't really get trained in how to be creative. So. Um, through your research, there can be some pedagogical research that you can do over here, uh, which can enhance your curriculum and uh, how to make students, engineering students more creative. There's a lot of scope in this area and there are sections within, you know, I think uh, different engineering conferences which encourage such type of research. So, um, I hope you understand this very uh, important distinction between some of these. And um, now we are going to move on to creative aerobics. So I hope um, you all are with me so far. I've given you an understanding of um, what creativity is, why is it important, and uh, now, Let's move on to something called creative aerobics. So um, we've talked about, you know, the need to be creative. So how can you be creative? There are many different strategies uh, to enhance your creativity, to practice creativity. And creative aerobics is one of them. Um, it is my favorite. You can say I have a biased view, but uh, I have a rationale for why it is my favorite. So some of the, I'm sure you must have heard of the term brainstorming and uh, you know, uh, the research on brainstorming started in 50s and 60s and it was all about idea generation. And uh, earlier research suggested that uh, it was, you know, an individual brainstorming, this great job and things like that. But then it was later uh, realized that uh, Brainstorming works well in uh, large groups. There's something called uh, creative exhaustion. Uh, if you are just asked to generate a lot of ideas in quick succession, you're not used to it. So you get exhausted. Eventually research in 70s came, you know, uh, concluded that brainstorming is the most effective in small groups. Not just any type of small groups, but small diverse groups, heterogeneous groups. Um, nowadays, it is very hard to find people, small, diverse groups. It is very hard to pull together a group. I love creative aerobics because here you don't need a small group. It creates these random systems within you. It creates an innate ability to utilize your uh, left side of the brain and the right side of the brain uh, in a synchronized and uh, a very uh, synergetic fashion that you yourself become a small heterogeneous group. You develop systems and, and creative aerobics has already developed a system and all you do is just surrender to that system 
and at the end of it you generate multiple solutions in quick succession so uh, this is the you know title page of the book and you see there's uh, you know so much uh, going on and we linda and i we don't like to call creative aerobics work it's play play is fun work can be fun but i don't know but play is always fun so creative aer aerobics allows you to play and as a result of this play a lot of beautiful and amazing things come creative aerobics is something that has been around now for two decades students using creative aerobics have uh, you know gained uh, or acquired more than 200 awards national and international awards in different areas i have been teaching creative aerobics for a while to my students and uh, there's so many success stories but again i'm not here to share these success stories to you and you know gloat in the glory of the past i'm here to create some success stories so with creative aerobics the purpose and the goal is to fuel your imagination and uh, broaden that horizon of your imagination uh, creative aerobics is a radical ideation system it is made up of four simple mental exercises all the four exercises are interconnected as well as individually um, they are independent but it's a beautiful uh, sort of a montage if i for lack of a better term of these mental exercises that allow you to you know enhance yourself go into something that you did not think of and it just makes a certain process it's a process it's a system it takes the focus away from the outcome and puts it on the process which relieves the stress uh, anytime you like you know uh, jumping to the end solution if you have to give the right answer it's stressful so we want to remove that stress and uh, make it easy and fun for you so this is all about just today i'm going to talk about these mental exercises um, and give you a little bit of taste of how it works and, and things like that. But it is a journey that you have to take. Um, of course, you can reach out to me at any point of time and I'll help um, like I do many others, you know, in, in thinking different things here. Uh, but today, this is just like a teaser, an appetizer. And um, later on, of course, uh, we can engage in, in a much in-depth sort of things in uh, different aspects. So uh, the first creative aerobics is finding facts. So this is something that you do pretty well and pretty often. Uh, facts, you all know what facts are and you find them. So you just uh, uh, pick, say for example, here we are going to stick with an orange. And what are some of the facts about an orange? So if you have to do that, there are so many different ways to do that. Uh, you can go and Google it and, you know, the bunch of facts and different information will come up. You can use your senses, your experiences. So say, for example, right now, the orange is, orange is in color. Um, it is juicy. It has different layers. Uh, it has an outer skin. Uh, it can be uh, heavy. When it falls, it makes like a thud sort of a sound. Uh, oranges, good oranges are found in Nagpur in India and uh, Florida in the US. They're good in vitamin C. These are all facts. You, you can do so much research and you're used to it. So this is your left side of the brain. You're used to it. So creative aerobics slowly eases you into some of these things. So uh, here, um, as I said, again, you can... Uh, use your secondary research or, you know, your primary experiences, or you can use your senses to sort of come up with a bunch of facts. Similarly, there are a lot of problems and, you know, for these solving them or creating new processes, this one of these first steps, it helps. And here you don't even think about the problem or anything, but just take something and then start listing down everything that you know. Basically, you want to make sure that you exhaust your what it is everything that there is in the what it is you have to know 
So, um, and I'll talk about what it is and what it isn't in a while, but till now, till then hold your horses. Second is naming names. That's your CA2, Creative Aerobics 2. And here we slowly move into your uh, right side of the brain. Uh, this is where we really start going into some of you know, the aspects of creativity. And also from the what it is to the what it isn't. Earlier, we were looking at you know, what an orange was. An orange was orange in color, orange was you know, juicy, uh, it was citrus fruit, it was you know, rich in vitamin C. Here, we are going to look at what an orange is not. An orange is not an apple, an orange is not a water bottle, an orange is not a computer. An orange is not a wall. So all of these become new names. You're moving into the zone of the what it isn't. There are different strategies to do that. Um, so if we have to say, for example, come up with new names of an orange, um, the first strategy is you just look around, you know, what are some of the things that are around? Oh, there is an air duster uh, around. There is a pair of glasses, there is a mouse, uh, there is a monitor, there's a charger, there's a pair of glasses, there's a Wi-Fi router, there's a printer, um, there's a stapler. I'm in an office, so those are the things. And these are all new names. You can use one of the facts. Um, say one of the facts was that orange was round, or orange is round. You can take uh, you know, that fact, that round, and you can come up with things that are round but are not orange. So the question here would be, what are some of the things that are round but are not orange? I'm sure you are already thinking of um, answers over here. Some of the things that are round but are not orange are an eyeball, an actual ball, like a cricket ball, um, the earth, the tire, like wheel, um, you know, that, uh, I don't know what's called uh, in English, but we call it uh, ganti, the garganti, where you make, uh, you know, all the, the flour, you know, of the grains. So this is another way you can use another fact, what are some of the things that are, you know, uh, juicy, but are not uh, orange. So you can think of it in that way. Uh, then you can create a system of random selection. Say, for example, if you have a book in front of you, you can just start looking at, you know, randomly just opening a page and creating like, you know, seeing for the first uh, noun that you see. New names have to be nouns, names have to be nouns. Directed selection, here you can create certain, you know, rules. And this is, this is a very important one because you should be able to create these systems as well. So uh, you can think of um, nouns that start uh, with the letter S, uh, a snake, a snail, a sailboard, uh, a sailfish, a um, salt, and many more. You can, um, you know, create other uh, systems where you can think of nouns that have one of the vowels. So like tear, tail, T-A-I-L, tail. Uh, and things like that. So here, these are some strategies. Of course, I teach this entire thing in a 16 week course. So we go so much in depth and we go different levels and layers and there's so much over here because we are actually foray, uh, foraying into the what it isn't over here. But I'm just giving you a very quick, you know, rundown of this thing. With that said, uh, this is again about the orange uh, and I want to talk about the what it is and the what it isn't. And this is where short, uh, sort of the, the shunya, the zero also comes into place. You can see that there is a circle and uh, you see the what it is written in it. So everything that an orange is, is but contained within. An orange is orange in color, it is juicy. Everything is inside of the zero. But that is not just the universe. It's like just looking at one side of the graph. There is so much more and there is so much beyond the zero. So we have to develop ways of going into the what it isn't. 
there are so many solutions out there which are um, available but not accessible to us at the moment using our current knowledge systems. So we have to develop some new knowledge systems, some new ways of going into what it isn't and bringing back those solutions from there. So this zeroing, this shunyata, we have to stop because in, in engineering, there is limited research that is being done uh, in creativity and how creativity and creative problem solving can help. We are restricted by the uh, perimeter of the zero of the shunya. But here, shunya gives us an opportunity of going beyond and looking beyond. And we have to, in some ways, promise ourselves to be disciplined about going into our what is, is it, what it isn't. The real beauty of life, the real joy of life lies in the what it isn't. It is hard, it is challenging, it can, there can be fear, but that's where the real life is. So for you to go into some of these path-breaking aspects is what is important for you. Um, going, moving further, Creative Aerobics 3, CA3, is uh, finding similarities between dissimilar objects, you know. And this is very important because this, doing this allows us the ability to see things that, you know, other people, like, oh, how did you see that? How, how come I did not see that? So um, one of the classic uh, examples over here is what are some of the similarities between a cat and a refrigerator? And, uh, you know, I'm sure you will also be thinking about this, but uh, they both have milk in them. They both have a tail, the cord. They both make similar sounds. They're both cold. Uh, They're both found in the kitchen. There are so many similarities. On the face of it, there's nothing in common. They are both very dissimilar. But if you really turn on the creative switch, you will realize that there's so much similarity. Um, I have a running bet with my students that I have a $100 uh, note in my pocket. And if you can come up with two things that have no similarities in them, between them, then I will happily give you that $100. So far, I have not had to give that $100 away. So I still have those. And again, I openly challenge you all as well that if any of you can come up with two things, two entities, anything in this entire cosmos or beyond this cosmos that don't have any similarity between them, I will mail you a check or cash or however online transfer that $100 to you. Um, Another little thing, you know, what are the similarities between a polar bear and shoelaces? And this is for you to think about, you know. Uh, again, very dissimilar, uncommon, but you may want to think about it and you will be surprised as to how many similarities you find between them. You can use some of the same concepts in your, um, you know, engineering research and things like that to come up with new uh, ways of thinking about new ways of fusing things together. So um, when you have some time, do think about the similarities between a polar bear and shoelaces. Creating new definitions, uh, creating new meanings. This is the most complex. This is where, you know, actually utilizing the right brain. Um, of course, I'm not going to uh, uh, give you too much because I do want you to take... Uh, you know, some time and read the book, go through the book. Uh, but this is one of the most complex levels because here you actually learn to use ambiguity to your advantage. This is where you learn how to manipulate certain things and, uh, you know, come up with some creative excellence. So giving new meanings, giving new definitions to some of the existing phrases and things like that. And uh, for that, I like, you know, highly encourage that uh, you all to read the book and, and go through it and create your own journey. The book is like sort of a workbook so you can, you know, work with it and it stays with you. So uh, creative aerobics is about uh, four things, four exercises, finding facts. That's your what it is, uh, naming names, CA2, which is helps you jump into the what it isn't. 
CA3, finding similarities between dissimilar here is like your real creative switch turns on. And the four, this is about manipulation and using ambiguity to your advantage, creating these opportunities, seeing those opportunities amongst, you know, the what it is and the what it isn't and creating different journeys, um, problem solving abilities and things like that. I'm going to move towards a concluding because I do want to leave some time for a question and answer. Um, there are two things, fear and ego, and I can talk about them for um, an entire day. Uh, but these are two things that prevent you. Fear that, oh, nobody else is doing this work and research in creativity. It is difficult. It is challenging. That is exactly why you should do it. Nobody's doing it. It is important. Everybody wants it. Creative industries are on a rise. Creative class is on a rise. If you don't do it, you're going to be left behind. Without creativity, you are going to be stuck with one expertise. With creativity, you're going to develop multiple expertise and you're going to, you know, what be transformed into something, um, a, a phrase that I love, a uh, renaissance a person. If you can defeat your fear, if you can go into your what it isn't, right now you are within your shunya, you are within your zero. If you rattle yourself, think about, if you reflect, uh, you will realize that, hey, there's so much more that I want to do, but I'm not able to do it. What is stopping you? The fact that you are not in your what it isn't is what is stopping you. And this is where you have to defeat your fear. So this is one very important concept that I'm uh, going to talk about. And just because you are um, an engineer, you're going to become an engineer, uh, doesn't mean that so many other fields are close to you. You have to find innovative and creative ways to fuse those fields and let your inner proclivities, you know, flourish and develop. So defeat your fear and uh, completely deplete your ego. This is one of the worst things that can happen to any human. The, it, it's just such a, a pathetic thing that it, it creates so much problems. And I, I don't even want to get started talking about it because um, the bottom line is manage your ego. Be very well connected to yourself and bring your ego down. It is something that you have to constant. It's like the game of whack-a-mole. You hit a hammer in one place, the thing comes out something else. So constantly you've got to, you know, keep it under check. You've got to defeat uh, fear. Moving on. This is pretty much my last message to you all. Your new life is going to cost you your old one. The moment you step into your what it isn't, life is going to be new, life is going to be different. If you're too much in love with your current life, it is just going to be, you know, your casket or your coffin but you have to constantly break out you have to fight entrenchment you have to defy yourself you have to defy uh, the society the norms the zeitgeist you have to defy some of these things with creativity with creative aerobics i was able to you know pay the cost of my old life now i'm a completely different i'm in a liberated emancipated state I am the master of my life. I'm contributing to myself. I'm contributing to my community. I'm contributing to the world and the universe. But for that, I had to take a brave step of jumping into my what it isn't. So this is my last and final message to you all that your new life is going to cost you your old one. The moment you step out of your what it is going to your what it isn't. Emancipation, freedom, liberation, not just yours, but everyone around you become an actual and an achievable possibility. With that, I want to conclude my message. Uh, there is a balloon. You are all like balloons. There's so much research, you know, uh, there's so much work to be done in adversarial networks, artificial intelligence, uh, creative problem solving. How are we going to solve the problem of space dust? 
uh, microplastics, how are we going to bring harmony amongst people, how are we going to enhance relations, how are we going to change behaviors, uh, so many different things. Um, the, the notion of intelligent design where machines and humans come together, there's just so much work to be done. And this balloon has to rise. And creativity, as I said, is that you know crude oil which helps generate these fire of ideas and this is going to let your balloon go up so um with that i conclude my talk you can reach out to me you know and of any in any of my social media handles uh linkedin facebook or instagram they're all arpan yagnik just my name um or you can also email me at arpan yagnik at gmail.com if you're interested in like, you know, really diving into some of the areas and enhancing or seeing certain ways of doing things. I'm happy to provide and lead you or hold your hand and take you a little bit uh, in this journey and, and, and let you forth further. So once again, thank you so much for very patiently listening to me. I hope I have added some value to you. I hope I have inspired you to take uh, creativity seriously. And I sincerely hope that uh, all your actions and decisions are inspired by creativity. And I have shared something that is very precious to me with you. And I now entrust you and put faith in you that you will take this further, make it your own, make it a part of your life and make it a part of the lives of others and uh, enrich yourself and others in the process. So thank you so much. And um, I think we will have about um, a few minutes for maybe a couple of question and answers. So if there are any question and answers, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, uh, uh, this, so this is Vamika. So first of all, thank you for uh, introducing this concept to us. And uh, uh, as you know, my special interest in creativity, I'm very much inclined to this. So I have a question like, how long do you think uh, like uh, it, this kind of a method or any kind of creative learning how long does it going to take to become a part of regular curriculum of students? Uh, it just takes one um, individual who takes the initiative. That's long it takes. So um, in my university, Penn State University, uh, it's, it's an old university. It has been around for more than 250 years. And when I look through the curriculum, the entire uh, you know, course bulletin and curriculum, I was not able to find one single course uh, that was entirely dedicated to uh, the study of creativity. There were a few mentions here and there in a few courses. Um, how long did it take? It just took, you know, uh, one person with a strong intent and a strong will to make it happen. Um, I now have introduced a course entirely on creativity, which I teach, and it is always full and packed. Um, and it is part of the curriculum and it will forever stay the part of uh, Penn State's curriculum. Similarly, um, as students, as researchers, you can develop curriculums and ask that, hey, I want to teach this. It can be a workshop or a seminar. And I'm 100% sure the moment it is on the page, it will fill up faster than any other regular course because this is the need of the day. This is the demand of the day. And there is such an overwhelming support uh, for a you know curriculum uh, on creativity and of course uh, if there is someone interested I'm more than happy to uh, work with them in developing uh, a curriculum I've done that I do that on a regular basis for others so I'm more than happy to develop a very specific course for engineers or, or whatever for IIT Madras and this can be an amazing collaborative process uh, where, you know, it might be the first times that uh, um, it's not a few people sitting in a closed room thinking about the curriculum, but this is, it's like the reverse agenda setting. So it just requires one person, strong will and intent to make it happen. Cool. Uh, so my last question is, like creativity is not something like uh, time bound. It is not like uh, if I if I sit from so and so hours, I'll be able to complete this. So it is a kind of uh, intuitive mm -hmm. flow, right? So if we try to use this method in a corporate setting or a setting in which they, they have fast paced deadlines, how does one cope with it? And how do we uh, like explain right. 
management the uh, required time or uh, needs so there so there are two things over here creative aerobics is something that is excellent for fast paced environment because there is a process regardless of what the problem is you just surrender to the process and at the end of, of the process you will have multiple you know uh, uh problems you will be able to generate multiple solutions not problem solutions in quick succession if you're not able to find a solution that aligns well with your problem you can go through the process again and it doesn't take time at all you don't have to uh you know find a whole team and a bunch of people and experts and things like that because you're going here into your what it isn't and coming up with solutions that were available but not accessible so uh corporate worlds these are things that are absolutely must and um, you want if you follow some of these things and once these things become a part of your intuitive self and flow uh, you will not even need to ask for more time because this is something that does not take time how much time does it take to find facts how much time you saw it takes to create a list of new names you know these are all very intuitive process and there are strategies uh, that you can use to help you go through it so you are like a one man um, super computer and so much processing can be done because you don't have to come up there are already systems and then you just keep on jumping there is no creative exhaustion at all so um, you don't need to ask for more times and things like that and within whatever is the given time uh, you can still generate solutions you can still generate novel and innovative uh, outcomes you just have to surrender to the process you don't have to you know create new things just go to the process get everything and you're done so um that would be my response to your question yeah thank you very much sir uh, for like i think it's late night for you so despite your busy schedule thank you uh, for taking the time today to join uh, and start this rsd uh, day 2 series of events so uh yeah as you mentioned uh, we'll be very happy to connect with you any any suitable opportunity in the upcoming days so i'll keep in touch yeah thank you thank very much thank you bye everyone and good luck with the rest of the events and uh, workshops and uh, competition bye thank you so uh, yeah so uh, yeah arjita ma'am has already joined so i i really take a uh, great pleasure in uh, inviting here inviting her for the keynote lecture today hey vamika hi arjita uh, good morning or good evening for you so yeah um, excited uh, like this is the second time i'm hearing you live so uh, i can't wait for it so <laughs> we are giving a, a professional introduction so i would like to mention one personal thing so whenever ajita is speaking you can see the twinkle in her eyes so you you will uh, that's why i i posted like it is it's going to be a sparkling uh, lecture so i'm sure many of you already know about her but i'll just uh, uh, give a few highlights about her so arjita sethi uh, is the founder of new school and founder of uh, startup india advisory india rath and she is a tedx speaker and her startup equally is uh, funded by elon musk's global learning xprize and she has reached out to people from more than 10 countries and she also currently teaches at uh, halt international business school and san francisco university so i will stop here because this list is if i try to make a list it's going to keep on going so ma'am uh, i think you should go forward for the lecture thank you so much vamika for having me um i am excited to be here uh, especially on a weekend and i know it is morning saturday morning 10 am uh hats off to everyone who is uh joining this session today on their weekend and uh thank you for joining me today um when i started uh, thinking about what i should be talking about honestly i was a little scared because i am not an engineer i am not a person who comes from tech background so i started talking to my co-founder and i was really nervous i was thinking wait what can i talk about these are the most intelligent people already they already know everything 
So what I'm going to talk about is something that uh, is completely opposite to technology and uh, something that is completely done by non-technical people because I think as you already know everything in innovation and tech, we can add to that by including entrepreneurship and innovation. So I'm going to be talking about my journey of building the three startups that I did, how I did it, and uh, what I do in Silicon Valley. And I'm also going to talk about everything that you can start doing today, right away to start your journey. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. I would love to take up questions. I would love to hear from uh, the people who are watching this session. And if you're not able to ask your questions today, reach out to me on LinkedIn or Instagram or any of the social media platforms. Happy to check in and answer anything that you have. So hi, everyone. I'm Arjita Sethi, and today I'm going to talk about how innovation led me to build and run three startups. What's going to happen in the next 60 minutes? We are going to talk about my story a little bit, and I'm going to talk about all the lessons that I've learned from my own story. I'm also going to talk about what is holding you back, what is holding most of the people back when they think about entrepreneurship and innovation, and the five ways that you can awaken that founder in you and five ways that you can actually start implementing things today itself to begin your entrepreneurship or innovation journey. I've already told you, but you can feel free to connect with me on any of the social media platforms. Uh, you can subscribe to my Substack. It's a free founder resource at any time if you need any help. I go by the name Arjita Sethi and you can find me anywhere. So don't hesitate, reach out to me. So let's get started. Hi everyone, I am Arjita Sethi. I'm founder of three startups. I am the CEO of a venture-backed AR and AI company in Silicon Valley. I sit on the advisory board of NASDAQ's Entrepreneurial Center. I have mentored and coached about 250 founders from 40 different countries in the world to launch their startups. I have taught about 20,000 people and I teach innovation and entrepreneurship and creativity at two Silicon Valley business schools. But that's not how I started. This is where I am today. It's, it's not where my roots began. I was born in a very, very small underdeveloped city in India. It was a small town, it wasn't even a city. I was born in Meerut and my mom cried the day I was born. She cried because uh, I was a girl and she realized that, you know, it's going to be difficult for me to be ambitious, to do things that I really want to. And um, uh, when I got to know about that story, I promised myself that, you know, I'm not going to let that hold me back. So I have tried to do everything where I could break that ceiling, wherever I could question the status quo. And that's how I've reached where I have here. I started my first startup at 16. Um, it was a vocational school in Delhi that trained about 10,000 people a year. We would train Indian Army soldiers who were going for UN peacekeeping missions. We would train uh, youth who were not getting employment or jobs. We would train anyone who was seeking any kind of vocation so that they could get a job. And this started at 16 because I was very bored out of my high school. I really wanted to know how education can actually lead to a means of a fulfilling life. And I saw that disconnect where everybody, when I was going into my high school, my 11th grade, everybody's saying, take science, take commerce, take humanities, if you want to do this. And at the end of the day, I, I really wanted to know uh, what is it that can give a fulfilling life or a job or a career to person? And uh, the answer was not education, actually. The answer was the right skill to get that job. Most of the people did have their degrees and they still wouldn't get through 
to an interview because their communication skills wouldn't be great. Most people still had degrees, but they still wouldn't get that job because they did not have any uh, technical skills, any computer skills. So these basic things, I saw that gap and my mom had started this company at this school and I told her at 16, I really wanna join this. This is what I wanna do and this is what I did for my first seven years as a founder. And then seven years ago, I moved to Silicon Valley uh, and I started a company called Equally that Vamika was talking about. We are an augmented reality platform. We use computer vision so that the kids don't even need schools and teachers. They can go in their surroundings and they can learn from their surroundings. And why we started this actually was every time I used to see kids interact with technology, Either they would be bored, they did not want to learn. You know, all of us might be facing that COVID fatigue already. We've had too many virtual sessions. We've had too many Zoom sessions. You're stuck to a chair, you're stuck to a, a place and you cannot move. And that's why we thought kids cannot be stuck to a technology. That's not a fun way. So we added augmented reality bit inspired from Pokemon Go and we built equally. And uh, Equally has been so well received everywhere in the world. As Vamika mentioned, we were one of the semi-finalists in the Global Learning X Prize. This was a $15 million prize that was sponsored by Elon Musk. And we were one of the semi-finalists. As you can see, this is us. At that time, Equally was called Team School of Games. And that's my co-founder and partner. We did this together. So uh, that's what I, uh, we started building. And when we became a semi-finalist in XPRIZE, I was a full-time student. I had a job in the US and my co-founder had a job. So when we got this validation that, wait, we became a semi-finalist out of almost 400 global teams for such a huge prize, that is literally the moment when we thought, wait, Maybe we are on to something. Till now, we did not know if we are building an education platform that's going to change the way kids get educated. But this validation became too real. It hit us that maybe what we are doing really is needed by the world. And that is when we started taking it more seriously. I moved to it full time and started working on it as well. And um, we went to Finland. Uh, Finland's education is ranked very highly when it comes to education and the children's well-being and their happiness and their learning levels, all of that. It's a very holistic way of education and I was intrigued. So in 2018, we thought let's go to Finland and, and explore what their education system is all about. We got into an accelerator program. For those who do not know, an accelerator program is a couple of weeks program uh, some, uh, sometimes it's two or three months, sometimes six months, depending on the program. And this accelerator program connects you to a network of experts, advisors, investors, and coaches you as you are going through your company and building it. And this program was such a great fit for us because it focused only on education and it was based in Finland. So from Silicon Valley, although you know you would think Silicon Valley is the hub of innovation, we went to see where in the world is the best education. And when we saw it was Finland, we went to Finland. And this is another thing that I want you to understand in my journey. Every time I wanted to create something, I went ahead and learned about it from the best. I don't have to tell that to you. You're already in IIT. It's the best institution, but that goes even for your entrepreneurship journey. Go and learn from the best. This is going to be very, very important. And then go ahead, give it back to other people who don't have access to it as well. So we went to Finland in 2018. We got certified by their education standards and got a 91% on our pedagogy levels. This was the next validation. We realized, wait, okay, we got through X Prize, And now even Finland's education says this is great. Now, remember, it was just my co-founder and I, and we had a couple of remote team workers around the world building this. And the first day when we went for the demo, the VCs who had come to listen to the demo pitches of this accelerator program loved our product so much that they funded us. So our first VCs are impact investors from Finland. 
People say Silicon Valley has the best network, but we found our first investors in Finland. Again, where you're located doesn't really mean much if you're really doing the right thing. So see where you are and you will be able to get that success as well. So that's when we started doing our research. Our research still happens in Finland, uh, 2021. Everything that we release, everything that we launch goes through their standards and they keep evaluating us. I'm also one of the co-founders, as Vamika said, of Startup India Advisory. It's also known as the India Rat uh, Incubator and it is the largest borderless incubator in the world. We started this last year, my co-founders and I, because we realized that Indian startups were getting disconnected because of COVID. We realized that this cannot be something that separates the innovation or stops the innovation in startups in India. So I thought, how about we bring all the education of Silicon Valley and all the mentorship globally and take it to Indian startups, especially the people who have an idea, who've built something and want to grow to the next level. So then India Rath was born and we started it last year. And then later last year, actually I started two startups last year. So later last year, I launched something called the New Founder School. After being a founder for almost 15 years, I realized that a lot of other founders were reaching out to me. Hey, I have an idea, but I don't know if it is the right idea. I am really excited about entrepreneurship, but I don't know what my next step should be. Hey, how do you build a company? Should I look for funds? I am a full-time student. I'm a full-time, I have a full-time job. Can I be an entrepreneur? All these questions started coming up. So I created something called a new founder school. So any question that you have around entrepreneurship, New Founder School is your Wikipedia, literally for your entrepreneurship questions. You can type any question and find any resource that will be credible. You will be able to find any expert. And it has reached over 250 founders in about 40 different countries in the world so far. And uh, it's just been nine months. I also worked at Google for a while as part of their public speaking expert program, which was run by the Google Developer Studio. I traveled around the offices of Google in Nigeria, Cambridge, New York, San Francisco, everywhere. And I started training a lot of engineers in how to tell their story right, how to communicate about their big ideas and big visions. It was one of the very exciting projects that I did here, and it's still close to my heart. And then in 2015, I got uh, this opportunity to give a TEDx talk, and that too in San Francisco. 2015 was literally one year after I moved to the US for the first time. I had never been to US. It was an unknown country. I moved in 2014. And this was a TEDx where I was almost about to walk away. I told my partner at that time, hey, I think I should just back out. I don't even have a story to tell. Elon Musk's wife, Justine Musk, she's a very well-reputed writer, author, and such a trailblazer, was a speaker at this event. And I told him, uh, my partner, that we, I don't, what am I going to do? Look at all this, uh, these accomplished people. They're from Howard. They're from Stanford. They're from all these schools. What am I going to do? What have I done? You know, I don't have a technical background. I have not studied from Stanford, but he pushed me. And uh, I am glad he did, because looking back, this was one of the most exciting milestones of my life. And at that time, I did not know that. But I talked about how innovation can be taken to anybody just because we have access to smart devices. And this is the power that each one of us, each one of you has because you have access to a smart device. So there is no disconnect anymore. The world is an oyster now. And in 2019, I was on the billboard of Times Square in New York City uh, of NASDAQ uh, because I sit on their advisory board and I was helping NASDAQ's entrepreneurial center to launch and scale businesses of many startups in Silicon Valley and all around the world. I wanted to share this because 
I told you about my beginning. I was born in Meerut. That's how I started. And two years ago, I was here. So I started maybe in a more nascent stage than each one of you. Each one of you has this opportunity to go to a prestigious institution and get that education. So there is no way in the world that you cannot be here. There is no way in the world you cannot be an entrepreneur, you cannot be an innovator. You can absolutely be anything you want. But let's talk about you now. Why, why should you care about my journey? Why should you care about, you know, what, why I did? I'm not special. It's just another person. There's this quote that I read. If you don't have big dreams and goals, you'll end up working for someone that does. And that's not a bad thing. You know, there are, I mean, how many of us would love to work for Elon Musk? How many of us would love to work for Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and everything? But how many of us would like to be Elon Musk? How many of us would like to be Mark Zuckerberg? How many of us would like to be Brittany Wolf of Bumble? So think about it. There is always a choice. But if you do want to become a founder, it's generally for one of these reasons. And, and I'm, I'm not sure which one you are picking, but for me, it was a collection of all these. First one, did somebody underestimate you? You cannot do it. You'd not be able to do this ever. You know, oh, come on, you, are you going to try this? Why don't you just settle down? Why don't you become this nice kid who listens to the parents, who listens to the society and just does this? Or you're looking for freedom to live your life. Um, I always wanted to live life on my own terms. And I knew I have to pay a very heavy price. I paid that heavy price. I worked so much and so hard when I didn't have to. I had my friends who had a secure job in an unknown country. They, were, they did not have to hustle or grind everything that I had to do. They're not, they did not have to uh, pay off all their savings into a business that kept failing, kept failing, kept failing for five years. But today where I am, I have the freedom to live the life that I want. I'm not dependent on a paycheck. In fact, I know 10 years from now, the legacy and the impact that I would have created would be phenomenal. And the third one is, do you have a burning desire to solve a problem? There's something stuck in your head and you know how to solve it. For me, it was education. I was bored out of my education. It wasn't engaging, it wasn't inspiring. I don't even remember any teacher that inspired me, except probably my mom. Because, and that's why I joined her in her business because she was so good at giving education. She was brilliant the way she taught. And I wanted to learn that. And then I wanted to take it to scale and teach millions of people using that methodology. So I had this burning problem and there is no lack of problems in the world right now. Climate needs help. People need help. Women need help. Minorities need help. Construction needs help. Like literally look around you and you'll find things that need help. So see, what are you most excited about? What have you noticed that nobody else has? And pick it up and do it. But I know there are things that will always be holding you back. There's always some restriction, some constraint in life. Everybody's life isn't perfect. Mine wasn't when I chose to become an entrepreneur. So the first reason, the first excuse that I hear from most people when they say I cannot be a founder or I cannot be a builder or I cannot innovate is I have no time because I have full-time school or I have a full-time job or I have too many ideas. Let me give you an example. Elon Musk is working on four companies together at the same time. He's the founder of four companies. So you cannot tell me you are busier than Elon Musk, right? 
I have three startups that I'm running and I teach at two business schools. So you cannot tell me that you do not have time. This is not a time matter. This is something else. So let's go ahead. What is it? I have limited monetary support. Okay, great. You know, you don't have the money to invest in your startup. You just don't have the bandwidth. You have to pay your bills. You have to go ahead and look after everything. I had that too. I was an immigrant in US on a dependent visa. I had to have a job to be here. If I didn't have a job, I would be sent back. So if that is your constraint, pick up that job and pay your bills with that salary, but still create that company. That job is actually going to be your backup option, which is phenomenal, which is going to pay your bills and you can still innovate. Yes, you'll have to give up your weekends, your vacation, your holidays, maybe sometimes your friends, but if it is a problem worth solving, I'll promise you, this is a journey worth taking. This is one of my favorite, favorite quotes, again, that I wanted to share with you. So instead of freaking out about these constraints, embrace them. Let them guide you. Constraints drive innovation and force focus. Instead of trying to remove them, use them to your advantage. When I started New Founder School, my focus was first-time founders and immigrant founders because I was a first-time founder at 16 in India and I did not know anything. It came from my personal constraint. Where should I look for information? How should I find a co-founder? How should I actually build this technology? I'm a non-technical person. I need a software engineer. I need an AI expert. How do I do that? And that is literally what I did. My constraints make me unique. They make me see situations and opportunities like no one else has seen, no one. So yes, it's hard and it's going to be difficult. And yes, it is not the easiest thing ever. You'll be giving up on so many pleasures, but you'll build something that nobody thought of. The last thing a lot of us think about is what if I fail? And I know this is hard, like what if I fail? When I was building Equally, we had to go through seven pivots, which means the first six products that we created put in our own savings. Nobody invested in us at that time. They failed terribly. But remember, people do not fail. My product failed. I did not fail. With every failure, I learned so much about what do parents need? What do kids need? How exactly learning happens? How exactly teachers are looking to implement solutions? I wouldn't have learned that in the first go. So I had to go through those failures. But remember, again, you do not fail. The idea fails. And you always can think of another idea. So the best way to actually figure this out, to actually solve for failure, is just go ahead and attach yourself to the mission that you're solving. My mission in life is to impact 1 billion people, either through entrepreneurship or education. I will teach in my lifetime a billion people either how to learn or how to create. That's what I'm attached to. I'm not attached to the idea that I will build. Every time there would be a new idea that takes me closer to my mission. My idea isn't special, my mission is. So it's okay to fail, but keep moving on. You have to believe it before you see it. And this is so, so important. As a, as a founder, only you can see your vision. You know, you're talking to your friend and you're it's saying, 10 o'clock. Hey, what if I built this, which is going to revolutionize the way uh, Indian farmers do farming? Let's think about that. And your friend's going to say, wait, how is that even possible? Because they do not see that vision that you see. 
hey, what if I build this carbon uh, sucking machine that's going to reduce carbon emissions in the most populated cities in the country? They wouldn't know that, only you would, because you noticed it. So let's go ahead and talk about the five steps you can take to actually start thinking like an entrepreneur, like a founder, like an innovator. Step number one, what are you passionate about? Like, truly, what, what do you care about? It could be anything. It doesn't have to be the most radical AI platform. It could be the simplest of the things. So ask yourself, what are you passionate about? Is it education? Do you want to teach? Do you want to teach thousand kids? Or do you want to create the next e-commerce or the shopping experience? Do you want to create the next social network? You don't always have to solve a problem, but you do have to be passionate about what you're building. So truly take some time today and think about it. Take a journal, write down, get honest with yourself. What do you care about? Do you care about money? Do you care about family? Do you care about uh, having better roads? Do you care about an electric car that does X, Y, Z? Do you care about going to Mars? What do you care about? Get honest with yourself. Step number two, find 25 entrepreneurs online. And don't just follow them. Please don't be their followers only. Interact with them. Vamika and I connected on Instagram. That's how I know her. That's, that's simple. Like that's literally our relationship. So go ahead, find people and talk to them. Social media is now a platform where you can actually have a chat with the people you are inspired by. Reach out to them. Ask them about their journey. Keep commenting on their post. Let them notice you. And the moment they do, be ready to share about your passion, about what you care, because that will be your moment. Do not, please do not be a silent spectator. And I know talking is hard to an unknown person. What if they don't respond? What if they don't even talk to you? Well, they are not going to talk to you already. The answer is no already, right? So reach out to people. When I was building my user pipeline at Equally, I started reaching out to people, teachers, parents, schools, everywhere. In person, I would go to schools. Online, I would reach to parents and teachers. And I sent a message to almost 10,000 people. Out of 10,000, a thousand people reached out and responded back. Out of those thousand, 100 people used our product and became our paid customer. I'm telling this from experience. And those hundred people have talked about our product, have shared it with so many people. And that is literally how you start. So surround yourself by the type of life you want to live. And you can only do that by surrounding yourself with the type of people who are living that life. So go and reach out now. There is no restriction. Talk about what you're passionate about and share it. People are ready and craving to listen to new ideas. People are ready and craving to listen to new insights, new perspectives. And you are the next generation of innovators. So don't hold back. Go do it. The next one is learn the difference. And I know we all think innovators and entrepreneurs might be same, kind of same. You know, what's the difference? What does it really mean? Um, an innovator thinks about an idea. An innovator thinks about a product. And what happens is ideas and products fail, but an entrepreneur thinks of a business. She or he will only create 
things that create revenue so that they know they're not wasting their time on anything else. An entrepreneur will always negotiate well. This doesn't mean haggling. I'm not saying go ask for discount, no. This means when you're raising money, when you're fundraising, you are saving your equity of your company. You're not just saying, oh, just give me money and I'll give you everything in my company. No, you're gonna negotiate well. You know the value of your company. Raising money is not everything. I've done it. I've raised money. I've done it through crowdfunding. I've done it through Accelerator, through VC, through Angels in New York, in Silicon Valley, in Finland, everywhere. The only yardstick of success for an entrepreneur is did they create something that got them revenue or change? Change is still difficult to measure in small term. So people start measuring it by the success, by the revenue. But the long term, now I can say that, hey, I've taught 20,000 people. But when I started, I couldn't have said that because I hadn't reached 20,000 people. And the last one is delegates their vision. An innovator wants to build everything on their own. They want to protect their idea. They want to build everything on their own. And I know that that is something a lot of early stage founders think. Let me just do it myself. But that is not how you go ahead and build a team. An entrepreneur has a phenomenal team of people working on that a vision that you know this founder is passionate about. So think, what are you good at and what are you not good at? Whatever you're not good at, think like an entrepreneur, find the best person to do that. You need to create a great team. Step four, what is your superpower? There are four types of people, according to me. This is not cited from any book or anything. I've read a lot of books. I read one book a week. So my knowledge literally is distributed. It comes from different areas. So over a period of time, I've, I've actually realized that there are these four types of people. You know, there are connectors. These connectors are people who actually find the best people in the best industry. They're not networkers. They are connectors. The next one is learner. They can learn anything. They can hack, they can grow, they can learn anything. You know, even if they don't know how to code, they learn that in six months and create, the, create that best thing. If they don't know how to do sales, they'll go ahead and they'll do this, that sale. If they don't know how to pitch, they'll learn that and they'll do that. The next is builder. Builders are people who are generally great at building products. For example, engineers. They can build the most innovative technologies. They can build the best algorithms. They can define the world, the internet, everything. And the last is storyteller. They're great at sales. They can talk about anything in such a passionate way that anybody would be convinced by whatever they say. If you can choose to be one person out of these four, please be a learner. Because a learner can become a, correct, a connector, a builder, and a storyteller according to the situation. So don't ever think you are done with education. My education is still going on. I did my undergrad in physical therapy in India. I did a diploma in theater, Shakespeare, and um, improv from London. And I did my master's in social entrepreneurship. None of these are related or make any sense. But because I have been through range of industries, I have learned range of skills. So if you can do one thing, if you can be one thing, if you can have one superpower, be a learner. Don't stop this. This process cannot stop ever. And the last one is, what is your headline? 
I want you to think about it. I'm going to give all of you about 30 seconds before I go ahead. I want you all to close your eyes and think about that magazine, that billboard, where your face is there, it's the headline, or that newspaper. Your face is there on the front page, on the cover. What does that cover say about you? What does that magazine say about you? What have you done? What is that exciting thing? Take 30 seconds and visualize it. I want you all to open your eyes and remember this vision of yours. This is where you want to reach. This is who you truly think you are. And you really are. So I want you, anytime you're doubting yourself, I cannot be an entrepreneur, I have this issue, this problem, this, go back to this headline. Go back to this cover. This is who you aspire to be. And someone who has to reach there cannot be thinking about these constraints right now. They have to keep moving ahead. No matter who you are, you might be the only that gender in that room. You might be the only that race in that room. You might be the only that type of person in that room. Use that to your advantage. That is what makes you unique. Yes, it makes you uh, different. And yes, it is the hardest thing to do. When you don't sound like people, when you don't look like people, when they don't talk to you, it is the hardest. It's a lonely journey. But it also means you have the best or the unique perspective that they will have a blind spot on. How did I get here? And I'm going to share this very honestly and very candidly. You can go onto my profiles and I talk about this very openly as well. Being an entrepreneur is a hard thing. It's a hard thing because there, there is no defined milestone, right? That there's no way that defines success. Even if I reach a billion people, I can keep reaching more. So there is no framework that says, oh, now the job is done. As an entrepreneur, the job is never done. Jeff Bezos just left Amazon and wants to start creating a newer company. So the job clearly isn't done. He doesn't need to start a new company, but he is. So it's a tough journey. How I got here, I'm no one special. I don't have a tech degree, not an engineer. When I moved to the US, I did not have a green card. My green card came last year when I got selected as the alien of extraordinary ability in the US because of my startup work. I did not have a financial security. The day when my face was there on the NASDAQ's billboard, my bank balance was negative $200. My company was funded, but as a founder, you don't take that high of a salary. You are paid the least. I did not know how I'm going to buy my groceries. I did not know how I'm going to pay my rent. I did not have any network. When I moved here, I knew nobody except my husband, my partner. That's it. He had a full-time job. So I had to build from the scratch. So I was a founder, a successful founder in India who moved to the U.S. and had to start from the scratch. And my first job in the U.S. was a data um, analyst intern, data input intern. From a CEO in India, I moved here and I started as an intern who would just do data entry. That was my first job. I was making just minimum wage. And no entrepreneurship education. Before I moved to the US, 
I had no entrepreneurship education. It's not that I did any master's or I did any PhD or anything. I did my master's in social entrepreneurship in the US. Before that, there was nothing. But there are a few things that I've done that I want to share with you that you can do now. If you feel you are in a similar restrictive situation, the first one is scavenging. And I'm very proud of this. When I knew that my passion was education and entrepreneurship, if I read anything about education and entrepreneurship, I heard anything about education and entrepreneurship, I read it, I understood it, I assimilated it, I got to know about it. Any person that I thought would be a great mentor and an expert in my field, I reached out to them. I became a scavenger. Give me more, give me every information. Even if today you would ask me what's happening in entrepreneurship globally or education globally, I know those trends because this is my industry. I knew that I'm not somebody who can build my product, but I can find the right people to build it. I can find the right resources. And for that, all of you need to be scavengers. And that is true education. Become the expert in the industry that you are most passionate about. Become that expert in the field that you truly care about. Learn everything online, offline, every person in that industry. Reach out to them. Grab a 20-minute Zoom chat with them. Scavenge the world and learn about it. And that's what I did. The next one is tolerance for ambiguity. My uh, dad was in the Indian Army, and he would always tell me when I was growing up, um, you know, you should build a tolerance for ambiguity. And I would be like, wait, what, what does that even mean? And as I've grown into a founder's life and, and run multiple startups and been through so many different phases of life, I've realized this was the best advice that he gave me. What it says is life is always going to be ambiguous. You don't know what's going to happen as an entrepreneur. You don't know if tomorrow your co-founder is going to leave you. You don't know if you're going to be funded in three months. You don't know if your product's going to launch on time or no. You don't know if customers will keep coming to you quarter after quarter. There are so many what ifs. There is so much of ambiguity. But you as a founder need to tell yourself, I know things are going to be crazy. I know I'll not know what is going to happen, but I'll figure it out. Have that trust and have that tolerance and have that resilience in the fact that no matter what is going to happen, I will figure it out. And tell yourself, mentally prepare yourself it's not gonna be easy. The faster you tell yourself that, the sooner you tell yourself that, the easier this road is going to get. It is not pie in the sky. It is not eating pancakes every day. But the moment you tell yourself that, your body automatically, mentally, physically, and emotionally prepares for that. So build that tolerance. Even now, my startups are doing well. They are well settled. No two days as an entrepreneur look the same. So most of the times I'm breathing in and letting uh, my breath out and saying, ha, huh, tolerance for ambiguity, Arjita. You have figured out everything that was thrown at you in life and you'll be able to figure this out. Have tolerance, have resilience. The last one is creating a network of mentors. There is nothing called self-made person in the world, nothing. That it is impossible to be self-made because if in your idea, even if a contractor has helped you, they have helped you. If somebody's put money in your idea, they have helped you. If somebody um, sat with you and gave you advice, they have helped you. 
So let's first get out of that situation that I have to be self-made man, woman, person. No. I want to grow with the right uh, set of people by my side. Let's become more collaborative. People who have done something in their life and have become experts, they would love to mentor you. They would love to support you. So create that network because this is the network that is going to take you to the next level. As an entrepreneur, life, again, iterating it as I've done today, probably 15 times, is lonely. It is hard. It is exciting and adventurous and beautiful, but it is hard and lonely. So you need these champions supporting you and pushing you to achieve your best and trusting you even in those days when you do not trust yourself. Last year when COVID hit, we thought our company is not going to do well. You know, schools aren't open and parents are not going to be buying. They'll be trying to save money. And we launched another product and it did really well. We launched a homeschooling product as part of our ed tech company. And we were speaking to our investors, our VCs, part of our check-ins, regular check-ins. So um, we told them that it has been a hard year, but this is how we figured it out. And we've actually doubled our revenue and it's doing so well. And we have the next thing coming up and you know our growth is on track. After the chat, they sent us an email. He said, we did not invest in your idea. We invested in you because we knew no matter what gets thrown at you, you'll figure it out. It was one of the most special moments for an investor to say this. And I'm so glad we have those people by our side who are going to help us and support us and believe in us even when we thought we were not good enough. As an entrepreneur, you need those people. So before I end today's session, I know we have about eight minutes left. I just have one question. Are you gonna sit on everything that we talked about today? Or are you going to use that courage that you've collected today, that fire that you've collected today and do something about it? Go reach out to those 25 entrepreneurs. Go connect with people. Go start thinking about building your idea. Find someone who can help you build or create something and let's create it. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna open up for any questions that anyone has. Yeah, uh, thank you Anjita ma'am for uh, an inspiring lecture today. So yeah, I have uh, taken some questions from the chat, uh, yeah. The The first one is, uh, we are talking about networking. So how do we actually start networking, that seed contact? It's only like after uh, knowing a bunch of, say, five or six people, our uh, network actually builds. So how to make that first step? Yeah, so that's a great question. So in, in uh, um, my story, when I was sharing about Equally, if um, you remember, I said, I do not know anyone here. So I went ahead, when I started thinking about education, I messaged about 10,000 people. And I just told them, hey, I'm a student. I'm looking to build a tech startup that can change the way education is given right now. Would you be able to talk to me? Out of 10,000, only 1,000 people responded back to me. So it is not the fact that you need to have people within your network, no. I started from negative network. I knew nobody and I did not even have a LinkedIn profile when I moved to Silicon Valley. I did not even know that I needed to have a LinkedIn profile. I was doing fine in India. I was okay. When I moved here, I realized, wait, you need to have a LinkedIn profile? I started going out and randomly asking people, hey, you sound interesting. Can I add you on my LinkedIn? And a lot of people said yes, but when I would send them a request, they wouldn't accept it but eventually people started accepting. So you have to start from zero. There is no way you can start from five. And remember, don't take it personally. 
people are busy. If somebody is not responding back to me, it is not that they don't like me. There is no reason. They are bogged down by work. It's crazy. It's really tiring. So probably your message got slipped and it's okay. Send them another message. If they don't respond, move on. There are billions of people in the world. If one person doesn't respond to you, it's not the end of the world. Move on to the next person and find them. I hope that answers the question, Vamika. Yeah. The next question is like a favorite question. Uh, like, I have a great idea, but how do I ensure that nobody copies it or sees it? <laughs> uh, if you have a great idea, idea it's already copied there is no way it is not copied there are no new ideas in the world the only great thing about an entrepreneur is their execution is their strategy clubhouse was launched just last year twitter spaces got launched this year discord is launching their audio platform now there are multiple companies that are thinking of doing it when Instagram, the year Instagram launched, about 2,000 other social networks launched around the world. Why all of them are not successful? All of them had the same idea. They probably heard of each other's idea and thought we could build it. It is that execution and that vision and that persistence that is successful. Tesla has been bankrupt almost four, five times. They were about to sell their company. Elon Musk was about to sell uh, Tesla to Apple because he couldn't sustain it. There are no unique ideas. There are only unique executions and strategies. So forget about the fact that people might steal my idea. Are you not passionate enough about this idea? Do you not already have a vision of this idea? He or she might steal that idea. They cannot steal everything that's in your mind already. So be that scavenger, become that expert. Investors want to put in money in experts, not just anyone who has a great idea. Ideas don't get funded. Uh, yeah, cool. My uh, next question is related to this one. Like uh, you mentioned that uh, the uh, persona or the uh, person is responsible for uh, carrying forward the idea. So what do you think are the strengths of a non-technical co-founder? Yeah, so the non-technical co-founder, which is me, the biggest strength is finding and talking to the right people again. Um, so my co-founder, he's a technical person and he would go ahead and build and we had a team that was building the product. I knew that I have known about education. I have learned about education. So the teachers and the parents would be more comfortable talking to me. When a child is using our platform, I would be the one who will be able to understand how they use it. As a non-technical founder, you are the person who can be the face of the company. You are going to be the person who's going to talk to the user and constantly ask them, what's working? What's not working? Why do you not like it? How much are you going to pay for it? Will you use it again? Can you tell a friend to use it? All this, the growth of that company is the non-technical founder's job. Cool. Uh, there is one last question. What is the book which inspired you the most in entrepreneurship? Oh my God, there are one million books. I, I read like a crazy person. I read, I said, I read one book a week. Um, but my recent book on entrepreneurship um, around fundraising would be Get Backed. That is something that we are doing in New Founder School this quarter. We are reading that book and discussing that book. So Get Backed is a great book by, on fundraising. I would say, mm, what else? Hard Things About Hard Things. That is a great book of, on entrepreneurship. Again, um, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Really great book again. Um, more than books, I think there are podcasts that I really love, like Masters of Scale by um, Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn. That is my go-to resource. So if you can go ahead and listen to that podcast, 
brilliant masters of scale. It's one of the best ones out there that I love. A16Z, that is the Andreessen Horowitz, one of the best investors and the most successful investors in Silicon Valley. They have their own podcast. Listen to that. That is brilliant. Um, in terms of books, again, there are multiple books. So follow me on Goodreads, which is a platform where I put all the books that I read. It's again, a free platform for anybody who's interested. And you can go ahead and see all the books that I have. There's another one called Range by David Epstein. It talks about how being a generalist actually helps you. So instead of going deeper into one thing, I have a breadth of knowledge and that is going to help you become a great in, uh, entrepreneur and innovator. So that is another book. Oh my God, I can keep going on, Mamika. If you wouldn't stop me, books, I'll keep going on and reading and listening, I'll keep going on. So I'm going to pause there for a second. If you need more, I am happy to share my Goodreads. Cool, yeah. Uh, I think you should follow her on Instagram. Like she keeps posting reels on uh, like infinite number of tips, which will keep you engaged throughout <laughs> your journey of entrepreneurship. Any doubt you have, I think you should just uh, check on her profile and she's very active. So uh, I would like to take this moment to thank you very much for joining us today and on, also on the behalf of management of RSD organizing team uh, to give this exemplary lecture and give a great start to RSD day two. Thank you again, Arjita. And uh, if someone wants to join your founder school, uh, please let them know how to join uh, so that, yeah. Absolutely. If you want to join New Founder School, just go on to newfounderschool.com and you'll get all the information or just reach out to me on any social network. I'm there. I'll help you out. And thank you, Vamika, and thank you everyone who invited me today. This was a very, very special experience. Um, I mean, it's one of the most prestigious organizations and institutions. So I am, I am really full of gratitude that I got to spend some time with all of you enlightened and intelligent people. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Zita. That is so sweet of you. So we hope to uh, keep in touch with you for any other uh, possible collaboration as well. Uh, see you soon again in IIT Madras campus for another event. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to the next session of Research Scholars Day, the annual research festival of IIT Madras. RSD 2021 has started with a wide range of events from lecture series to interactive talks and workshops to competitions. It aims to bring together people from different research backgrounds and encourage exchange of ideas and research interests. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to welcome our speaker for the session, Dr. Ramachandra Krishnan Swami. Thank you for joining with us here, sir. Thank Dr. You. Ramachandra Krishnaswamy is a leading aerospace and mechanical engineering consultant, a chartered mechanical engineer, and the former director of the gas turbine research establishment, DRDO. He has over 35 years of experience in eminent R&D sectors and eight years of teaching and training experience. He has steered prominent projects <coughs> in the zero engine cavalry for the light combat aircraft the marine gas turbine system and the small gas turbine system. He has launched several science and technology projects related to gas turbine engines, including the new gas turbine technology initiative, which has a project outlay nearing these 100 floats. Under his leadership, several major certified test facilities required for certification of aero engines were set up in the country, including the advanced aeronautical Material Testing Laboratory, Hyderabad. He is one of the architects of airworthiness certification process also. Sir, 
also has a major contribution in the field of metal additive manufacturing including stereolithography and FDM based rapid prototyping techniques. He has received, planned and established the state of the art rapid prototyping facility at the GTRE. The title for his today's talk is Research and Technology Challenges in the Development of Futuristic Propulsion Systems for Fighter Aero Engines. Now I would like to invite Sir to deliver his talk. Over to you, sir. Uh, sir, I think you're on mute. Okay, well, very good. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that. Uh, and I must thank you for um, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I will, without much ado, I will start sharing the screen uh, and that is there. Um, I hope, I hope you're able to see the screen and I hope I am audible. All right. Uh, I, I, I sort of uh, had a peep into the previous lecture and unlike that uh, sweet talk, uh, this presentation is going to be a, a rush uh, because the, the topic is so vast. And uh, what I propose to do in the coming 55 minutes or so, I will go through a series of uh, PPTs and explain to you the context of looking at the technology challenges. Uh, and this is therefore um, the, uh, the, the pattern of this presentation. It's going to be a talk with reference to, um, uh, with reference to uh, this topic. And I hope this uh, screen is visible and this is a full screen. I must again uh, say thank you very much. Thank you, uh, the Dean Academic Research and of course the team of this, um, uh, the, the, this, uh, the um, anchor um, uh, of, this, of this team, I mean, of this topic today. And um, what I do quickly do, would be looking at, um, the, you look at the, how we've been chasing the mirage of technology gaps. Uh, we will look at a few winding technology gaps and expectations with reference to aeronautical systems and aerothermodynamic analysis and some design challenges with reference to the engine systems. And the most important thing is the materials and manufacturing processes. There are compulsion, there are very big opportunities of a few systems. I'll briefly touch upon those things. And there are issues with the structural technologies. I'm sure uh, most of you are from IIT uh, research centers, uh, research um, the faculty, and I'm sure most of you are um, uh, aware of all these things, but I'll, I'll make a passing remark on each one of them. Uh, each instrumentation and controls, uh, uh, maybe the role of AI uh, and the machine learning and data sciences in uh, handling uh, propulsion systems and some technology concepts for advanced propulsion systems. And of course, the industry uh, academia participation, we will have a quick look at that. And I'm aware that IIT Madras has a research, many, many research programs, and they're all multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, uh, as she was mentioning, the previous people were mentioning, and enlightened uh, guys and girls. Um, and you're also not restricted with just academic excellence. You're also getting into product design and development. And therefore, this presentation will summarize the perceived needs and research opportunities, and look at probably the technologies with, whose TRLs are below what is uh, uh, required, and therefore we will look at them. Quickly, therefore, uh, a roundup of uh, the fighter aircraft and aero engine in the Indian context. Uh, we are very proud of this uh, vehicle, the Tejas, which has been delayed, and um, but it's now into uh, into services and a big production order. And there are other issues, other other systems to be developed. We must be aware of all this. I'm just repeating for the sake of continuity. Uh, we have several other aircraft uh, programs going on. And today we are talking about going beyond um, these, uh, these aircraft systems. We're talking about AMCA, the advanced medium format aircraft, and, uh, and of course the, the un, uh, unmanned format air vehicles. And we have done a, quite a bit of work in, in developing uh, propulsion systems for these vehicles. And the brief mention of these things. And today we are talking about small turbofan engines and of course the, the helicopter engines for, from HL. And we are talking about UCAV, engines for UCAV. And notwithstanding all these things that are going on, we are looking at for ahead for the fifth generation aircraft, aircraft engines for AMCA, the Advanced Medium Combat Aircraft System. And they are, st uh, they are highlighted by stealth and very low observers. So these technologies, and this is of course 11 kilonewton uh, first class engine, 
and we are looking at this. We are already late. If you look at the scenario global, uh, we have got already systems which are up on the test, test beds and development, and they're also being deployed for many, many applications. So there is an exponential demand for small gas turbines for missiles and UAVs. And if you look at uh, options available, there are many, many uh, uh, systems I brought. There are options of import, but we have now done uh, quite a bit of work on small gas systems too, and pretty soon, pretty soon we are going to have these things as platform technologies. So we need to be able to support uh, entrepreneurs, uh, small, uh, small, in, small scale industries to take up these, um, these engine programs. Now there are, of course, there's a spin off technologies uh, coming from, um, from the civilian side. But what is important is the need and the role of propellers, propeller turboprops, which we are not uh, spent time on. There is time, this is the time for us to wake up and look at propellers, turboprops like this to handle a civil and transport aircraft and cargo aircraft and even defense applications. Now, therefore, if you look at uh, the, the whole scenario, we have done enough uh, on the, in, the, in the front of in the, in the, uh, the technology front, as far as the gas turbines concerned, we are expanding them into marine industrial gas turbines, small gas turbines and so on. So the whole uh, uh, spectrum is available, but what is uh, intriguing, what is important for us to use C is, we need to jump in, the, in terms of thrust to weight ratio from a meager, very low value of eight to nine or 7.4 to nine. We are going into a 15, that's the weight ratio of 15. And today it can even reach, uh, for example, if you look at the, the forecast uh, that's been done through the versatile program, uh, Wate, uh, we are talking about thrust to weight ratio of 20. And this is quite a big challenge and we need to get up uh, provide ourselves. We had, we didn't have the advantage which other uh, equipment manufacturers, the gas turbine manufacturers had. Their technology readiness was always much better, much higher than the requirements for the engines which they were trying to build. Whereas we, uh, if you see the, uh, take a minute to get the laser pointer, and there we are. Now, if you look at our scenario, the requirements are much higher than our readiness. And you take any field, whether it's materials or manufacturing base or testing infrastructure, or even the, 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 the design know-how, the, the skill, the design skills for the, for the, for the uh, people, uh, we, we didn't have that facility. We are now therefore always chasing, chasing, and we had to parallelly build all these technologies. It is historical, but then I thought I'll take a men make a mention of that here. Uh, and therefore, let's look at that for short term and long term research goals and technology development challenges. We look at the, <coughs> sorry, give me a moment, if you don't mind. If you look at, um, Principally, the technology is uh, driven by materials and manufacture. Uh, quite a bit of that, of course, internal flows and leakages past the, <coughs> past the components inside the engine. The design of the component itself is only about 25%. So much of the focus has to be toward, to the materials and manufacturing technologies. And I'm sure <coughs> we have learned a lot of lessons. And a few of them are this, that we didn't have a a, a, a mission profile, well-defined mission profile, or total excursion, the way the pilot used the aircraft and the engines. We didn't have the, the benefit of being prepared. Uh, as I said before, materials and basic manufacturing processes should be there with you uh, much ahead of a, a possible start of the program. And therefore, this, this, therefore, we need to fill this gap. This, this is where our discussion today will be concentrating on how to be prepared uh, preemptively. And we also, one lesson that we learned is that the margins in the design of the engine system should be much more than what the aircraft needs. And the design of the component should have much more um, uh, in, in, ter in terms of, uh, um, so we say, margins again, or the engine system. So the engine should be better than the aircraft and the component should be better than the engine system. And that's a hard lesson that we have learned. So let's look at some uh, aerodynamic design challenges. So look at fan and compressor. The first thing that comes to my mind, I'm sure the guys who, who are working in aerospace departments and re related um, research activities, the flutter, which is the culmination of aerial elasticity, aerodynamics and structural dynamics uh, is a major, major concern. Even today, in spite of uh, systems being flying, uh, uh, systems flying in, 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 in aircraft, we have to understand. 
And this uh, is compounded by the fact that the engine doesn't have a clean air like a transport aircraft engine. Uh, and therefore it is having an intake, which is a very complex S shape in front of the engine. And this gives you a lot of distortion. We have done enough on this. Our TRL, the technology radiance level in this is quite, quite good. It's above, above five, it's in fact six or seven to start with. And therefore we need to concentrate on, as for the aerodynamics concern, the flutter and inlet distortion uh, and, uh, of the fans and compressor blades. And if you look at combustor, combustor works well. We understand combustors, they work very well at the, uh, at the ground level uh, testing stations. But if you look at the profile, the, the altitude versus Mach number of the aircraft, uh, and therefore the engine, the, these uh, combustor system, including the afterburner, should work at all the major corner points of the profile. And this is something which we, we have not really um, uh, concentrated on properly. And therefore there are uh, here uh, jinx here and there. And therefore we need to have the operability of this. Uh, we, we don't want the uh, combustor to shut down, uh, to flame out. Uh, and the SFC uh, should be dictated at all the corner points. So our ability to do the CFD to simulate these corner points, uh, the orders uh, mission points uh, is something which is um, worrying, but we have a good CFD uh, ex experience and our TRL for this is about six. But what's not in, uh, diff what's difficult for us is to control the temperature. The combustor output should be as clean as possible. It should be a flat profile, but in, in practice it happens that radially Along, along the, the radius of the, the turbine, for example, the temperature is not uniform. There is what is called radial pattern factor, and also around the circumference of the, 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 the combustor or the turbine blade, the temperature keeps varying. The, the, therefore, the radial pattern factor and the circumferential pattern factor need to be very clean. It cannot be more than 10, 12% or 18%, as the case may be. But in, 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 in our case, our starting point is so good, so rather not so good that we burn the turbine blades because the temperature is quite high. It could be as high as 35% of the average temperature. And therefore the pattern factor, the way you, you put in uh, the, the, the cooling air and conduct and cool the, uh, the out output from the combustor is so important that we need to put in a lot of effort. The added to this is our inability today to simulate to predict the temperature, metal temperature, on components like the turbine blades and the combustor line when they're coated with the thermal barrier coating. So the, the conjugate heat transfer, the, the, the internal flows, conjugate heat transfer, especially when there are uh, ceramic coatings, the thermal barrier coatings, uh, and these are something which, which, are, which are not good that we need to, I'll skip this uh, 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 point, uh, but therefore today we need, as far as combustion is concerned, a, con a concern a focus on stability at mission corner points. Engine should, uh, should not blow out and broad character should be understood very well. And maximum turbine temperature, exit temperature should be controllable. You should be, therefore the radial and circumferential pattern factor should be um, handled. Now turbine, it's obvious to say, it is common sense to say we need to more efficient combustion uh, turbine blades. And we need to have uh, high speed, high temperature, uh, turbine wheels, turbine blades, uh, they're dictated by materials, and of course, aerodynamic design. But today we are talking about removing uh, possibilities, uh, a sort of out of box thinking. Can we remove the, uh, the LP turbine without sacrificing uh, the performance of the engine and turbine system? And this, of course, means that the two shafts of the engine, if it's a two, two spool engine, should rotate in the opposite direction. There are other issues connected with this idea. Uh, of, um, of removing the uh, veins. Uh, that is, bearings will be affected and uh, the, 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 uh, the lubrication system will have to revisit it. But today we are talking about already uh, removing uh, veins from both the turbines, both the LP turbine and HP turbine in a typical two shaft engine. So there are a lot of thinking that, that needs to be done. So therefore, the, 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 the focus for as far as the turbine is concerned, can we have high efficiency, high temperature turbine going beyond 1900K? And can we really look at the possibilities of windless turbine stages? Coming to the back end of the thrust vectoring no of the engine, the thrust vectoring nozzle. The nozzles are typically at coaxial, but today we, have, we are trying to use a thrust vectoring nozzle. The nozzles which rotate, which bend up and down or uh, rotate circumferentially, which gives you a very high mobility, agility for the aircraft 
We can make tight maneuvers, tight turns, and also use um, short uh, uh, runways for takeoff and landing. And therefore, there's several possibilities. And today, we don't know what is, we are really, really at the crossroads. What type of the spectrum nozzles should be done? Should it be mechanical? Should it be flat? Uh, uh, put in thrust practice like this. It, is, it, 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 it means a lot of uh, system studies and analysis, or could, could it be uh, is, uh, 360 degree, 3D uh, axisymmetric um, thrust vectoring, which will give you pitched uh, roll and your control and uh, enable aircraft to do a lot of maneuvers. And today I'm sure in IIT in Madras and anywhere else, there's a lot of work going on on fluid thrust string, fluid thrust vectoring, and thereby introducing fluid from outside, we can bend the thrust, thrust axis of the engine. But this is limited to small, small uh, experimental engines. But can this be upscaled to actual engines? So today, the, the question is, uh, what about 2D and 3D circular uh, thrust vectoring nozzles? Uh, what about the materials for this? And can we really look at fluid thrust vectoring nozzle and, up, and scale it up to um, real requirements? The, the crux of the whole engine technology today, as I said, is materials and manufacturing, the process and simulation technologies. We have advanced composites, and I think we are doing a reasonably good. We have used uh, the polymer matrix composites for the front frame and the uh, oh. bypass casing, and and the and the and the and the, and the, and the um, uh, external flaps of the system. But mind you, the engine is a system which handles foreign object damage, and therefore these polymer matrix composites for the French struts need to be reassessed, and we should have a viable design and manufacturing technology. We are not done well in metal matrix composites. For example, if you have titanium as a matrix, can we introduce silicon carbide um, as a reinforcement, either fibers or particulates? And this gives you a major temperature and uh, weight advantage and life advantage, but we have not done much. Our TRL levels is only three as far as this is concerned. And even uh, ceramic matrix composites, which are there at the back end of the, of the engine, where the thrust vector nozzles, are, uh, the, the, the engine nozzles are there. These flaps, these uh, converging and diverging flaps, as well as the, 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 the NGVs, the vanes, and the combustor liners, they're all going to be made of uh, silicon carbide, silicon carbide, ceramic matrix composites. And today, let me assure you that without these uh, three types of composites, we can't do an engine, a contemporary engine, uh, uh, for, for an application like the AMCA, AMCA. And, uh, and we don't understand, the reason for that is we don't understand the failure mechanisms of these metal, um, ceramic matrix composites. And uh, we don't know how to join them together. The joining technology between two ceramic CMC parts or CMC to a metallic part is not understood. And the, we are having design codes today, which are more empirical than actually data-based, it's very scientific. And if you want to do an optimization, we need a lot of, lot of data to be generated. We need to understand the failure modes mechanisms uh, and also, uh, for example, the way they behave when load is applied at different temperature. And we must be aware that the fracture toughness of the ceramic matrix composite is quite low. It's about, uh, 15, uh, it's about five to 15, as compared to 15 to 150 of metallic materials. So this is something which we must uh, keep in mind. And there is an urgent need to overcome this big gap in CMC technology, the ceramic matrix composites technology. We need to have a design methodology, uh, established manufacturing processes, joining technology, and we need to understand failure modes and material properties to be generated to make the designer comfortable with his design options. And then uh, it is also today possible to look at, uh, look at metallic materials, for example, high temperature uh, materials like Inconel and Udemet, uh, IN 708 uh, and Udemet 720 are the materials for, for the turbine disk. And if you look at turbine, typical turbine disk, I'm sure those guys who are uh, working in propulsion technology will understand. I, mean, I, don't, I don't need to look at this. The rim is very hot because the combustor exit uh, temperature impinges on this blade directly mounted on this tree. In spite of the stress concentrations there, the stresses there are quite low, 400 MPF typically, for example, uh, whereas the temperatures could be as high as 600 degrees centigrade, or it could even be 700, 720 degrees centigrade, depending on the type of combustor that we have. Whereas the bow, and therefore it is very creep critical. 
because high temperature and long duration of exposure makes the rim very creep critical. Creep deformation takes place there. Whereas the bore, which is the center part of the desk, the hub of the desk, has a very high temperature and stresses, 800 MPM, maybe 900, depending on the type of uh, loads that we have, depending on the material. But the, the temperature, redeeming factor is temperature is quite low, 400 degrees centigrade. So the temperature is low, but stresses are high. And therefore, this area becomes fatigue critical, fatigue critical. So you have a desk which is fatigue critical at the, at the bore and creep critical at the rim. And therefore, whichever is weaker at the end of that period of time, we throw the disk out. Uh, and therefore, we lose a lot, a lot of um, uh, benefits of the of the desk uh, much earlier than what we should be doing. And therefore, there is a possibility today. So let's take the same desk and put it into a, uh, into, a, into, a, into a heat treatment furnace, so resistance heating heat treatment furnace, and have fixtures to keep the uh, temperature in the center of the uh, disk, the bore of the disk high, and on, on, on the outside, you heat the rim. But once it is stabilized, you pull that thing out and you cool the rim very fast, keeping the disc at the center, the temperature at the center of the disc at the same. Uh, we don't allow it to cool down. And when you, when, you, when you finish the heat treatment process, you will see astonishingly, the rim has got a very high uh, grain size, maybe 50, 45 micron thick, uh, big size, whereas the bore is thin, a very small grain size, which is good because um, uh, the high grain size of the rim gives you good creep properties and the, the very fine grain at the bore becomes uh, very good in terms of fatigue properties. And you expect about 20 to 30% increase in the life of the part. You don't have to throw it out as soon as one of them is limited, is reached. You make them reach at almost the same time and 30% augmentation in the life of the thing is possible. And what I said was the process which are uh, resistance heating furnace, a lot of fixtures. We did a, a, a very a, a quick uh, analysis and some uh, simulation of using induction heating systems. Uh, there, there are no fixture or nothing. It's held in space. And you have induction coils uh, of different power rating. And the gaps between the disk and the induction coils are changed. And it's so programmed to give you what is really required for a good uh, optimized disk for example, if you did uh, an experiment or cut up and looked at the microstructure, uh, which is fortified at the rim and about five or six at the, at the bore, we can get the same thing through the simplified induction heating uh, process. You can see it is, it is, it is um, uh, similar, similar in, if not exactly the same. So there is a possibility uh, of getting this through simpler induction heating processes, but uh, there are some residual stresses which creep in. And therefore, we must uh, develop technologies for creep fatigue life optimization of turbine disk. Mind you, the turbine disk is most expensive in the whole engine. Uh, it could be several crores, uh, depending on the complexity. And therefore, we extend the life of this part through this simple heat treatment process, which is good. Um, the heat treatment process may, uh, makes use of the differential grain size heat treatment. And then it has to be done for both inconel materials, thermonite and udiment. Now, look, looking at the uh, life of disks, we go to the front end of the engine, which is the compressor and the fan. The blades are inserted into the disk slots, and these are very high stress concentration factors. And this makes the disk very, very thick, uh, very big. Whereas if you, uh, there are early fatigue failures here, which can be avoided by making the blades integral with the disk. They're called IBR, the integrally bladed rotors, or blisks. And this, of course, can be machined today uh, with the Francis milling machine in one go. Um, but, but then a very, when the sh shapes are very complex, uh, there could be a limitation. Today, we are talking about employing uh, using what is called the linear friction welding process, where the two parts are made to press against each other. And there is a gentle high frequency movement and creating local stresses go up and local friction go up and temps to go up and it fuses the parts together. And you get ultimately this product, which is one part. If there are 80 blades and one desk, you get the 81 parts typically in a, in a conventional design, but here I got only one, one part, which is an integral part. You can see the aerofoils are milled, and then this part is uh, attached to this desk through linear friction welding process. And bingo, you have a single part, single blisk, uh, which is good. But we are now going from bliss, uh, which is uh, very advantageous to 
uh, uh, what is called blinks. We'll come to that later. Do we don't have a simulation possibility? We don't know how to uh, design the parts for friction welding, non-linear friction welding. You must know how much uh, material is lost, what is the temperature, what is the heat affected zone, and how to reduce this uh, stresses through good heat treatment process. So this is something which you must do. We are very bad at it. We are not started in a big way. And therefore, our TRL level should be improved to do that. I mentioned about bling. What is bling? If you look at uh, the conventional design, independent blades and discs, which, was, uh, which is going to be replaced by what I said as IBR, where the blades are integral with the rim and the size, the shape of this becomes smaller. And you get a, at least 30% reduction in, uh, in the weight of the part. But today we are going to talk about a bling, the bladed ring where there is no web or a, a, a hub like this. It's only one small ring of titanium for here like this, and the blades are in, in position. But the, it cannot do a very high speed uh, uh, performance. And therefore you strengthen that with uh, the, uh, the silicon carbon, any, any ceramic uh, material, the silicon carbon um, uh, here which is going to be fused. And this is the technology. This is something where we don't know how, how to insert this ring inside titanium matrix and fuse them together through maybe a diffusion bonding process or maybe an equivalent process. And this is something which we must really uh, be concentrated on. And tomorrow, when we want a thrust to weight ratio of 20, it's not going to be possible without the help of these sort of uh, gadgets like blinks. So today's uh, requirement, uh, today's focus should therefore be on linear friction welding process, heat treatment process associated, and bonding of ceramic rings in titanium matrix to achieve what are called blinks. And this is the, the, the present technology and the future technology as well. And therefore, um, uh, we, will, we will go to the next part of the manufacturing process. I'm sorry, are you give me a minute, I'll just... Sorry about that. Uh, so then the, there are uh, coatings uh, which are important. If you look at the engine, uh, it's a plethora of coatings, uh, hundreds of them coating all over. We don't notice them, but they're doing all sorts of uh, functions for each, at each location. And one important thing is the coatings which are there on blades. If you typically look at a compressor or the fan, uh, the blades are made of titanium because we need uh, low weight um, uh, parts. And similarly, the casings are also made of titanium today. And if you look at the temperature in the compressor area, it could be anywhere in between 300 to 600. And the pressure in the, in the, in the compressor area is about three and a half to maybe 25. And so the, 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 if there is a, a, a problem with the growth of the blades, a malfunctioning of the spool, there could be a blade, blade rub, blade to uh, casing rub, which will result in titanium being, uh, uh, being, uh, being uh, released and this gets ionized and there is an imminent explosive um, fire and you must lose the whole engine and perhaps the aircraft. So we need to be looking at preventing titanium, titanium rub by having a blade tip coating. It looks very silly, but it's a, such a thin blade. The tip of that is so thin. You must be able to coat uh, the zirconium, the zirconia on this and also coating on the inside of the casing. So the titanium is prevented from rubbing against each other and we prevent uh, the possibility of titanium fire. You can see what really happens within a few seconds if the dead titanium rub, the whole casing is burnt out. We are lucky if the casing burnt out, it didn't explode and it can happen if you don't do it properly. So today the context is uh, we must develop zirconia coating on the blade tips. This is a technology. We've been trying this very hard, but we need to develop technology and certify it and test them and certify them. And that's the important thing. There's another coating, we're talking about coatings, which are important for the, the uh, engine system. And that is uh, to prevent ice forming on the, uh, on the surface of the, uh, frontal surface of the engine. Uh, when you're flying at a particular altitude and a particular uh, Mach number, and the local condition, the, the, the dispersion of water, the humidity in the, in the system uh, will result in a very quick buildup of ice, which will affect the performance of the engine because the surface is going to be rough. But worst case is the buildup of ice like this might result in the ice being dislodged 
and it will enter the engine and it's going to be a, a huge foreign object damage and you will lose the engine itself. So there are a necessity, there is a necessity today to have uh, coatings, but we are trying to do this with um, uh, locally electric heating with power drawn from the battery of the aircraft. And also uh, we, we some, use the compressed air uh, to uh, heat the system whenever you encounter uh, ice in conditions. And this is done today manually or through very, uh, very uh, rough, very, uh, shall we say, uh, digital yes or no type of controls. Um, but that can be avoided. Total wastage uh, can be avoided and uncertainty can be avoided by having what we call as a hydrophobic coatings, hydrophobic coatings on the surface, which are vulnerable to icing. And it, it very similar to, for example, the, the lotus leaves on, on which water doesn't uh, stay and it gets washed into. And this uh, can prevent a lot of, and the weight of the engine can come down. The control system can be simpler by having a reliable hydrophobic uh, coatings, dependable hydrophobic coatings and paints. And there are methods already available, but they're not very effective. We need to improve upon the durability and the reliability of the system. We we'll look at a few structural technology challenges and we are designing today the engine on what is called a safe life philosophy. We test the parts, we test the material, and we know what is the safest uh, uh, temperature, safest uh, stress and stress excursions that will result in a damage to the component. And we know that number. And beyond that number, all the parts which are uh, very expensive manufactured from the same batch shall have to be removed and inspected. And if even one of them has failed, a, a 0.8 mm crack has developed in any location in the part, the whole bunch, say for example, you have manufactured 200 discs uh, in the same batch, all 200, all the 200, um, uh, 200 um, uh, components have to be thrown out, which is uh, simply a stupid thing to do. It's not very cost effective. Each one of them may be a couple of crores, depending on the complexity. And therefore, today we are launching we are talking about what is called damage tolerant design, which is fracture mechanics based. We should understand how the cracks propagate, even if the crack is developed, how they propagate, what is the rate at which and the direction in which the cracks grow is very deterministic. Whereas the safe life method uh, of uh, looking at the life of the, uh, of the disc based on low cycle fatigue design criteria is more statistical lower bound. And therefore we tend to gain a lot of advantage, cost advantage, and the life cycle cost of the system goes up tremendously. But the, the catch is we should understand the materials, we should understand the components, and we should understand the behavior of the component with reference to the existing or already developed cracks or uh, defects in the system. It could be cracks in the bore, it could be corner cracks, or uh, defects sitting dormant inside, and they grow. And the, the way they grow depends on the temperature, the, the cycles of loading, and the, 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 maybe there are some tracks which are close to each other. They're a compounding effect. So we should understand the whole fracture mechanics behavior of the system. And therefore, to enable damage tolerant design methodology, we should develop full, complete fracture and crack propagation data for the entire set of uh, engine machine cycle parameters and materials and for all materials, for example, it could be titanium, it could be internal, it could be uranium, I and mean, could, it could even be some ceramic composites. And, and it, we should, it's not enough if you do the material evaluation, we should develop component test data to component test program, which is sadly missing. Associated with the fatigue failure uh, or the safe life is what we today ignore as the um, fretting fatigue, fretting wear. And therefore, what is fretting? I'm sure most of you understand that, but the, the parts which are there, for example, like a blade and the dowel root sitting in the, in the desk, undergo cyclic uh, loading due to temperature excursion. And there is a, there's also a vibratory, vibratory, uh, vibratory uh, load superimposed. Uh, you, please pardon me, uh, that, that, that system is howling. I will ignore it for some time. Now then, um, this, uh, superimposed uh, low cycle fatigue and high cycle fatigue load on the contact points here introduces very high flank stress, uh, very high flank stress, the hurt stresses here. And this is bad news because the surfaces are actually uh, rubbing against, uh, gently rubbing, uh, they're in sliding velocity and very high contact stress, hurt stress there. And this results 
in local fatigue failure, fitting fatigue failure initiated, and then it goes into a full-scale low cycle fatigue or high cycle fatigue mode of failure. And we don't understand fatigue very properly because it involves perfection of friction, temperature, uh, and the sliding velocity and so on. We ignore that because of ignorance, we have a fudge factor or ignorance factor. We are now designing these parts, these locations here on uh, empirical empiricism and uh, experience-based numbers. And the idea today is if you have a design stress, stress here, which is less than, 40% of the yield stress at that point, and, uh, at the temperature, we are supposed to be safe and avoid fretting fatigue. But this is not true. In spite of all these things, there are fretting failures are, uh, uh, there, and very difficult in complex cases. For example, the spline joints in a, in a shaft, the, the flange joints, which are very complex uh, bolted joints, they all undergo fretting fatigue. And therefore, we need to put in a lot of, lot of effort in looking at the simulation. Can we simulate these, um, uh, these, these factors in a, in, a, in a typical, for example, analysis mode? Can you predict at what point in time, given the coefficient of friction, going with sliding velocity and the type of load that's coming on, uh, can we predict where, the onset of uh, fritting wear or fritting fatigue track initiation? Today, we don't have the facility and you can see at the right, top there, the TRL, the technology readiness level for this is only two. But there are efforts going on elsewhere, and this is something which we need to be concentrating on. So we have design methodology exclusively for fretting fatigue, which we have ignored all the while, uh, apart from the empirical uh, design method methods, we need to be uh, concentrating on. And fretting simulation capability we have to augment. And there are um, testing methods, there are certification standards for this. We need to develop those things for, for this. And of course, the additive manufacturing is the buzzword this today. And it's a real, it's a real, a real situation. We have very big opportunities. There are serious limitations as well. If you have to go from uh, reducing thrust to weight ratio of increasing thrust to weight ratio from existing 7.5 to 8 to 15 or 20, we need to reduce the number of parts. If we have to integrate a few parts and build them into as one part. And this is possible today. Uh, to uh, the entire thing can be done through additive manufacturing. But it's foolish to really take recourse to this additive manufacturing without understanding, definitely not the rotor parts to start with, but at least in the other non-rotating parts, can we categorize uh, those which can be taken up for um, additive manufacturing to reduce the weight, to reduce the integrity, and make the assembly disassembly faster. Mind you, the uh, additive manufacturing technology is also being used very effectively for repair. Uh, and MRO activities of the parts. And therefore, we must identify the parts which are very uh, susceptible and e uh, easily amenable to additive manufacturing, but we need to uh, characterize, perfectly characterize materials, machinery, and the skill of the personnel and the methodology, the process parameter. There are umpteen ways the uh, additive manufacturer part can be built, the build style, the, 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 the power rate, the power setting for the lasers and so on. So all these things should be uh, certified. And we have a lot of mechanical properties and physical properties uh, that needs to be built to be able to safely put this additive manufacture part in an engine. It's one thing to put in a, a pipeline in, in a typical uh, automobile uh, manifold, but it's very different for, by, uh, for, for putting this uh, additive manufacture parts in an engine environment. So therefore the identification of parts to be brought under additive manufacturing regime uh, we need to do a lot of characterization and data generation for different build styles and different materials and so on. And of course, this I'll skip this, uh, I will make a mention. Uh, internal flows is a major, major criteria. Uh, it's about 25% of the whole engine activity is dependent on how good your internal flow estimates and how the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the temperature prediction based on uh, conjugate heat transfer. And if you look at the way the engine, uh, this is not an engine industrial gas turbine, which uh, sort of uh, keeps running at the same speed for a very, very long time. And therefore, if you really do a good uh, estimate of the, the gaps, the gaps between rotating parts and the static parts, you can have, even a while takeoff, a pinch point where there's a possibility of a rope. 
And similarly, when you do a lot of throttle excursion, there are possibilities of rub, but more importantly, there are possibilities of gap widening, which affects the performance of the engine, which affects the efficiency of the parts. And there could even be some catastrophic failure. You must have heard about this oil loss into the bearing housing and the bearing housing catching fire. So all sorts of things can happen. Now we must have a good uh, capability uh, to predict the internal flows, but more importantly, we must invest time and effort in sealing technology. The, uh, there are seals, very many types of seals, but what is today uh, happening are the the, the brush seals, which, which is an important thing. Now, having said about this, uh, uh, the, the efficiency of the, uh, the, the gaps, uh, the estimate of the gaps between, there are a lot of issues involved with creep and fatigue life. Today, we are talking about uh, temperatures which are beyond 1900K, and therefore the temp temperature of the combustor liner the temperature of the blades is going to be very, very high. We need to have a very cool, good cooling uh, mechanism to reduce the temperature to maybe 1100 degree K, uh, 1100 degree centigrade. And we have materials which, which are not capable of going beyond that. So we have equaxed uh, high temperature materials, um, basically nickel based and uh, cobalt based materials. And, but then we have uh, different uh, grain structures. I'm sure I'm repeating what you people might be would be knowing definitely the, lead, the directionally solidified systems, uh, and of course we have single crystal blades. Obviously, the creep behavior of these three different types of blade structure is different. And today we have the comfort of using single crystal blades uh, to increase uh, the creep resistance of the material of the blades of the components uh, beyond uh, what, what is comfortable to you. But how to predict the creep fatigue interaction at those temperatures uh, the, and when you, the loads are cycled, when the stresses are cycled, we have uh, quite a bit uh, different types of uh, behavior. Some of them are isotropic hardening, kinematic hardening, I won't go into the details, but they basically behave as viscoplastic material. Visco, uh, there's a viscoelastic or plastic behavior. And all this needs to be integrated to be able to predict creep fatigue interacted damage and there are very many models available today. And we have to put them all into uh, very closely and be able to predict the onset of, uh, of uh, uh, damage to the part, to uh, turbine blade or turbine vein. And today, our major area of concern should be to put the algorithm in place, which will absorb these material behavior and the damage mechanisms. And that needs to be the priority of one as far as the lifing or the es estimate of damage and the life of the engine parts. And therefore the development of uh, so-called Chabot model, for example, as one, one example for viscoplastic behavior, damage accumulation mechanisms and uh, to en enable creep fatigue life assessment. And there are several uh, artificial intelligence. I will not go into the details today because we are short of time, we already have 15 minutes left. And therefore we'll go to a quick a foreign object damage, apart from creep and fatigue, we have the impact uh, the, 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 the engine can, in, in, in the course of a flight, um, a low level flight, for example, birds can get sucked in, uh, ice can, ice slabs, ice cubes can get in, sand and water can get in. But the impact of a bird, 0.8 kg bird hitting the engine front uh, in, a, in, a, in a typical takeoff mode at about 150 meters per second means 15 tons of additional thud in a few milliseconds. And the whole thing gets transferred to the mounting points, the bearings, and the engine K and the static structure. And we don't want that integrity to be lost. We also have a transient thrust loss because there is an aerodynamic disturbance because of the debris of the bird, which gets us chewed into, uh, into a, a spiral inside the engine within a few fraction of a second. And the blades also get deformed. And then this can result in a total engine surge and a flame out. We have a problem because the requirement is that if engine uh, were to be hit by blade, say one kg or 0.8 kg bird, we want the system not to disintegrate. But at the same time, if the thrust falls, it shall not fall below 85%. And it should also recover within uh, five seconds to at least 85%. And therefore, these are very stringent requirements for the integrity of the engine and the safety of the engine and the aircraft. So, but this is dependent on our ability to understand the high strain rate uh, behavior of the material. They are not the same as what we get from a simple tension, tension test. And that's not a very low strain rate. 
High strain rate could be as high as 2,000 to 5,000 strains per second. And the behavior of this material, of the titanium, for example, at the front of the engine, is so much dependent on the strain rate. And therefore, we need to understand the strain rate and the behavior of the bird itself, the bird material and the ice material. Today, we have a fair and good understanding of the bird material, which is hydrodynamic. It is solid, semi-solid at low speeds, but at speeds of impact, about 150 meters per second, for example, it behaves like water. It's hydrodynamic. There is no shear stress inside the particles of the, um, of the bird or the ice, and therefore it behaves like a hydrodynamic. So we use uh, the existing uh, codes uh, using SPS technology, for example, it could be Lagrangian or Eulerian, but there are several methods of doing it. We understand the bird material, but the material for the ice we don't have a good model. And we need to do a lot of testing before we say that this ice cube will give you this sort of damage to the part uh, is something which is doing, done experimentally today. So we need to be spending a lot of time in, in assessing the, 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 quality, the, the quality of the, uh, the, the quality of the, uh, the model, uh, mathematical model of the ice, ice, ice material. So you can see that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the question, therefore, associated with that is you, you design a part to withstand, uh, to withstand uh, the impact of the bird or the ice, but can you not avoid birds from the airport? Uh, we are now trying to do, use the drones to carry uh, lasers, to carry, uh, uh, to carry, for example, chemicals and to spray them uh, outside the, uh, the airport bubble, uh, a safe distance, and to avoid uh, a, a possible bird menace into the airport. And there are several technologies. The challenge is we, somebody uh, should take up this as a project for uh, sanitizing airports and reduce the menace of birds. So the development of ice material modeling, modification of the Johnson Cook parameters for this, and high strain rate behavior of this material is a basic necessity. And we can also use um, uh, the anti-icing, uh, instead of allowing the ice to build up on the parts and get them sucked into the engine if it becomes too big, we, it is possible uh, to have an uh, onboard system which will uh, predict the, the layer of ice which is forming. And as soon as it goes to, say, half a millimeter, uh, it, there are det the sensors we detect it. And we can use the actuator, smart actuator and smart sensors to uh, shake that the small little layer of ice and then so protect the whole aircraft or the engine uh, from being uh, disabled by uh, formation of thick blocks of ice around this. So we have, a, we can take the course, to, um, uh, artificial intelligence, the smart sensors and technologies for this. And then today we are talking about I'll skip some of these things. Today we are talking about um, health monitoring. Health monitoring of the engine is important today. We must be able to predict what is the life that's left out of the engine after 2000 hours of operation, uh, which part has got damaged too much. And today, is it safe to run for another thousand hours is a question. And for this, we have systems which, uh, which with sensors on the engine, which feedback and the algorithm, the, the signal goes to the algorithm and we are able to find out because we know the material, we know the tree fatigue and impact behavior. And therefore we can predict the life that is available, life that's been spent. And this is happening uh, for a very long time. Today, we understand this, this, this system very well. Our technology readiness level in this particular area is quite high, but we need a lot of sensors to get in into the engine system if you want to do an advanced contemporary uh, fifth generation aircraft. We need sensors which can look at vibration, which can look at um, the, uh, the temperature and, uh, and, the, and the strains on the blades. We are talking about thin film sensors, which are sensors which are built as a part of the blade itself. They're not external sensors which are struck on the blades, but they're built in into the engine system and then the component system. And we also have to develop high-speed telemetry and of course, the, uh, a brief, brief, brief description of the thin film. We've been trying this for a very, very long time. And I'm sure with the help of uh, agencies like IIT, IIT Chennai and several other academic institutes, we'll be able to pull our resources and be able to develop these thin film sensors without which it will be very difficult for us to look at the health monitoring of the engine. 
we should also be able to have systems which will look at warn us about the number of particles which are likely to get in. Can we relate it to the erosion characteristics and so on? And we have today a, com a reasonable comfort level in looking at the turbine blade temperatures from optical sensors placed outside. They are non-invasive. But can that be used for vibration measurement? Can, can it be related to the, 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 the so-called radial and circumferential pattern factor? And this is the question. And all this put together, we should be able to build uh, engine life uh, help and usage monitoring. And that is today going on in a, in a diagnostics-based uh, tool. We, we look at what is the data that's coming in, we use the data, milk the data, and put it into system and say, look, this engine, this part, is now in, 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 in at the edge, edge of its uh, life. But uh, today we must have a prognostics based health management system, which is without which we have no engine of the future. So this is something which we must develop and the development of thin film sensors, non-invasive optical temperature sensors, prognostics based life and health monitoring system is a must, is a, 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 an unavoidable thing. So this is something which I wanted to tell. Another five minutes. I'll try to finish as much as I can, and I don't mind stopping uh, at 11 o'clock like that, and we, we can take a call on that. Now, we, we have learned from the civilian application, we have plenty of um, turbo props which are required. We have uh, done a lot of work on propellers for helicopters, but we don't have a dedicated group. We don't have technology in the country to look at ab initio development of propellers of different types, and manufacture them and operate them and repair them. MRO for propellers uh, are not there uh, in the sufficient quantity and our TRL is quite low. If you look at the estimate that, that's been done, we are looking at a huge number of turboprops all over the country uh, in terms of civilian, in terms of even defense applications for propellers are required. And today we have seen uh, how elsewhere these turbo props are making a big draw in terms of technology and engine systems. And they are, these propellers are not only for our turbo props and uh, uh, for defense application, but also for uh, seaplanes. Seaplanes are basically, though we are, we are using today gas turbines for seaplanes, we are also using propellers for uh, the, the amphibians and our crafts. So there's huge potential, but we need, therefore, uh, technology based to be de developed in terms of basic design manufacture. Then the, today we are talking about manufacturing blades and propellers out of, out of composite materials, out of um, uh, lightweight material with leading edge protection for erosion and so on. Therefore, there are, there are a lot of issues. I'll skip this because of time, uh, but we are now talking about uh, use of smart materials inside the engine. And the smart materials today are limited by temperature. But can we make use of uh, smart materials which are slightly higher temperature and they can be used conveniently, comfortably all over the engine uh, to, to do geometry control, to increase the efficiency of the system, flow control seals, and picking up vibration and noise and so on. This is a, a strategy about 10 years old, but we have not done any progress on this issue. And we are now today talking about more electric or almost all electric engine, where the accessories are driven by, uh, by motors, electric motors, and not through uh, gear driven systems, which need a lot of lubrication, oil, oil sump, heat exchangers, and so on. So if you have motor driven, electric motor driven accessories, uh, and also a generator, which can give you enough energy for powering the aircraft, it will be a wonderful thing to happen. And mind you, we also have magnetic bearings, which, are, uh, which will throw away the need for uh, lubrication of the bearings, oil-less uh, bearings for the engine system. And this is truly the fifth generation system in aircraft. And already you have seen, I'm sure most of you would have seen this, uh, there is a Rolls-Royce initiative. We, have, we are having a, 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 an aircraft uh, which is electric driven, which means the propellers are driven by the electric motors and all other control surfaces are generated uh, uh, based on generation done, done up. Now today we are talking about future generation engine system. There are a lot of um, aerodynamically variable cycle systems, which are, which are very, very important to have in the future. And I'm sure agencies like IIT Madras, uh, which is celebrating RSD today, uh, should be able to look at CIGAP and I'm sure the lot work is going on, but there are a lot of aerodynamic concepts, uh, future engines, variable cycle, uh, turbofans, uh, big nozzle ejectors and so on. So that's possible to do today. 
And we have um, a map, which is uh, the first initiative of Rolls Royce, which set up um, a lot of technology centers, uh, uh, Rolls Royce technology centers in universities all over Europe and the US. And this was a model which has been fairly successful, and this has, of course, has expanded. And I'm sure IIT Madras also enjoys the company of Rolls Royce through another technology center here for a very short, uh, focused area. But we need to have similar thing for uh, Indian context. We have a center of excellence on gas turbines. I'm sure IIT Chennai, IIT Madras, and IIT Bombay are partners in this. We had uh, what is called. We have a three going on program. I mean, programs are going on. Gas turbine advanced materials GT map, which of course is centered out of ISC, like law. And gas turbine enabling technology, we ran mm -hmm. two or three programs, uh, two programs in fact, uh, from uh, DRW GTRE. And there are several smaller, though very very small fraction of activity under Air and DB, which is not a very good sign. And we uh, we need to therefore. Uh, set up a lot of gas turbine technical centers, uh, one of which is already uh, operational at managing address. We need to expand the scale of operation. This is only symbolic. We will not reach where we want to unless this has gone many, for many, many times more, uh, more, more we have to do. And therefore, we look at uh, summarily uh, for fifth generation fighter engines and small gas turbines are the in thing. We, we have a big, big potential, a need for it huge technology gap exists between what is required and what is really available today. The TRLs have a huge gap and we need to uh, plug this as much as possible. A, des a, a design and development of a new engine in five years, seven years is a daydream unless we reduce this gap. This is something which is fundamental. We are all doing a very, very big mistake in not having infrastructure, uh, technology-based develop quickly. And need, therefore we need to launch multi-level R&D programs there are good opportunities, there are associated challenges and huge risks. And therefore we all need to put our hands together and see how this technology gaps can be. It's not enough if you fund an engine program. You need to fund basic infrastructure development programs, which can be 10 times more. And this is something which is, we, we made a mistake and we continue doing it. So more number of technology centers at academic institutes like we have today uh, should be uh, in, initiated. And we need to have a very comprehensive technology plugin uh, initiatives we, uh, started early, at least parallel, if not um, uh, preemptively. We need to do if you have to really do what is required for future fifth generation, sixth generation engines. So this is my experience. I, I, I pardon. I mean, I beg your pardon for rushing this through because I just wanted to convey um, our experience in every. Um, uh, quick manner within an hour. It's very difficult to do that, but I'm sure you will appreciate and uh, you'll understand what I wanted to have. And with this, I end my this presentation. I took a little more time than what I should. Mm -hmm. And I thank again, once again, um, the um, Dean um, and Academic Research, uh, 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 Dean IIT Madras in particular, in general, and of course the team which, which uh, helped me to uh, facilitate this discussion on the technology challenges in advanced aircraft engines. And of course, a, a special thanks to um, Dr. Gupta and of course, uh, Dr. Tanurajan for enabling this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is Tanurajan. Uh, yeah. so thank you so much, sir, uh, for, your, for your acceptance uh, for our RSD 21 edition and uh, for our celebration, uh, Research Scholars Day. Yeah. And uh, you have provided a lot variety of uh, technologies which is available in India and uh, as well as in global for the aero engine fraternity and um, the uh, high speed aircrafts and uh, aero engines and jet engines. Right. And uh, many of our uh, students, research scholars, uh, yeah. have put in uh, many questions on uh, yeah. the YouTube channel. And uh, uh, one of one or two questions I would like to put in before close the session. Yeah. Uh, one is FOD is the one of the enemy for the engines. Uh, so right. to control uh, uh, the, that part, uh, which is the technology is available in our countries sir, uh, that you can slightly put on. Right. Uh, well, actually, uh, there is um, 
the requirement, uh, there's a stringent requirement for bird strike requirements for air engines. And the requirement is that we should absorb 13 small, if you take a, a G404 or a cover engine type of engine, uh, 13 small engines are small birds of, of 110 grams and two medium sized birds, 0.8 kilograms and one, uh, two, two kilogram, 1.8 kilogram bird should be sucked into the engine, should be allowed to get into the engine and demonstrate that the engine will simply not disintegrate. It will not structurally disintegrate. It will uh, pr provide thrust for a short while and not conk out immediately. But for small gas, small birds, it shall not have structural integrity problem. It will continue with reduced thrust of about 85%. This is the requirement. So this is basically, and the technology that we have today is the ability to simulate uh, the impact of birds. Bird, as I said, is a small, uh, is, is a hydrodynamic material, including feathers and everything put together. They behave like, at those speeds, like, uh, like um, uh, hydrodynamic uh, material and fluid. Uh, at those, temp uh, those uh, speeds. And uh, the ability to simulate the impact of these uh, uh, um, birds on rotating and static uh, uh, parts has been well understood. And we have uh, simulated using Dieter and uh, 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 the, the ANSYS um, uh, software. We are able to predict this. And today we also have facility in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the laboratories in India uh, to look at uh, for testing with static parts and rotating parts in static condition. And we also have a facility in the system in the country uh, where you can spin the fan, for example, and fire birds, uh, all the types of birds, medium, large, and small size. In fact, we have uh, ability to fire small birds in clusters into the engine and demonstrate that structurally the behavior of the, of the blades and the nose cone uh, is not going to be so bad that it will result in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a or shall we say, in a disaster, a, a shutdown of the engine. And that because we are able to relate the distorted blades with the aerodynamic performance of the fan and the fan behavior is related to the performance of the whole engine. So we are able to do that today. And in fact, we have been doing this test for uh, even some OEMs like, uh, for example, Honeywell, we did do that. The only thing that we don't have is testing the whole engine with these bird guns uh, which we uh, intend to do elsewhere. So the technology wise, we have the ability to simulate, ability to predict uh, the, the damage, ability to predict the aerodynamic performance, and also carry out the tests in the country, in the, in the labs in, in the country uh, at the component level. But at the engine level, we need to be dependent on the systems abroad. So this is the technology as far as the bird is, bird, it is concerned. We also have the same ability to do uh, slab, ice slab and ice cubes and ice spheres, and also sand and water ingestion. And so this is uh, easily done uh, from simulation, but we need to demonstrate for certification this ability of the engine to withstand bird, ice, or sand, water at least four different types of bird. Of the question is, there is a big controversy about this. Uh, the engine in the, in the LCA, for example, it sits at the back and there are uh, side intakes, which are S curved. And therefore the, 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 the debate, I mean, this is something which is technically important thing for people to understand. When you have a two kg or one kg, 1.8 kg bird going, it first hits the intake wall and obviously it will disintegrate and go at an angle to the engine it won't go uh, like in a winged um, engine uh, in the terms of the aircraft. The bird goes direct onto the aircraft engine. But here, it's going through the, the fuselage, in a, through the intake. And the debate is, what is the maximum size and the velocity of the size chunk uh, which goes into the engine? That needs to be assessed. So this debate is going on. So we don't have a good answer. But the worst case scenario is to assume that the whole thing goes straight into the engine, which is worst case scenario. I think they are going to overkill. And therefore the analysis that's going on is, what is the probabilistic uh, velocity, the size and the shape of the bird which goes into the engine and at what angle it enters? It won't be axial to the engine. Because as I mentioned, I showed you the clip or the, the, the slide, where the engine sits at the back and two side uh, S-curve, S-intakes go and 
to supply air to the engine. So the engine will not get uh, two kg or 1.8 kg burn direct at the same velocity, takeoff velocity. It will be reduced mass of non-descript uh, shape and at not the same angle. So the whole these things are being simulated through um, through the, the software, the ANSYS mm -hmm. software, um, and the, the, uh, the Dytron uh, software. And this is uh, something which is, uh, uh, is required to be decided before we uh, put the engine for certification. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And, uh, and there are a lot of variety of questions, uh, which uh, we will uh, connect with you by mail, sir. Our researchers uh, yeah. and uh, paternity and aero engines and uh, aero society people. So, right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I, 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 I must apologize. I must apologize. For, first of all, I rushed the whole thing through. But uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'd be very glad to look at, the, uh, to, to look at all the questions and uh, make a suitable response to those things. And I, I'm free to uh, be uh, to be associated with any one of the uh, students or uh, the research scholars or any faculty member for a further dialogue on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much once again for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Good day. Uh, bye bye. We'll move over to the next section. Uh, we'll hand over uh, for the next section. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good noon to one and all. I welcome you to RSD 2021. RSD or Research Scholars Day is an annual research festival of IIT Madras. We aim to bring together ingenious minds while encouraging free exchange of ideas and research interests by organizing lectures by eminent speakers, workshops, research expos, and wider range of competitions. After the wonderful day one session of RSD 2021 yesterday, we welcome you back to day two of our fest. It gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome our speaker, Dr. John Phillips, to another exciting lecture session of RSD. Thank you for joining with us, sir. Dr. John, Dr. John Phillips is working as a scientist at Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research and also professor at Homi Baba National Institute. He leads the Smart Material Section and Corrosion Science and Technology Division of Metallurgy and Materials Group. Sir obtained his PhD from IIT Madras and did his postdoc at CRPP CNRS, France, and University of Hull, UK. Sir has received many notable awards and recognitions, including Science and Technology Excellence Award in 2006, INS Medal in 2007, Distinguished Faculty Award of Homi Baba National Institute in 2015, and the list goes. Currently, he is listed in the world's top 2% scientist list by Stanford University, US. Today, he is here with us to speak on smart nanomaterials and their application. Over to you, sir. Very good morning to one and all. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the RSD team and the IIT Madras for having me as a speaker today. It's an honor and privilege to be invited by the Alma Mater. I would also like to congratulate the RSD team for organizing such a fabulous uh, event by bringing in experts from diverse disciplines and I'm sure it's a bu buffet for the participants and uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this. So without wasting much time I will move on to my lecture. Uh, I will share my PPT. Is that okay? You are able to see the PPT? Yeah. Yes, sir. Audio is fine? Audio is fine? Yes, yeah, sir. It is fine, sir. sir uh, we are right, right. Hearing some background noise. Uh, is it possible if you use the microphone? You, you are getting background noise? Yes, sir. What about now? Uh, yes, sir. It's better. Arnab? Uh, it's better. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's better? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the title of my talk today is Smart Nanomaterials and Their Applications. The first question is what are smart nanomaterials? In the previous speaker talked about smart materials and uh, smart technologies. Uh, and uh, all of you must be familiar with the nanomaterials and nanotechnology. You know that uh, the materials with the dimension ranging from 1 to 100 nanometer, which is called nanoscale, are called nanomaterials. And uh, what are smart nanomaterials? We always get inspiration from nature. We are trying to think what nature has been doing for millions of years. So I start my example with an example. Uh, I start uh, showing an example from nature to explain what are smart materials. All of you must have seen this plant. It is called touch me not or botanical name of this plant is Mimosa pudica. What is special about this plant? Leaves fold inward and it reopens after a while. It's not only really touching, sometimes uh, you shake the plant and in the afternoons you see that this plant leaves remain closed. This is a mechanism of defense from predators to evaporate water vapor from the leaf. So what is special in this case, the plant is able to sense various stimuli. What I refer to stimuli is general touch or vibration or the temperature and they are able to respond to these stimuli. There are materials around us, for example, the piezoelectric materials. When you stress it, it produces a voltage or vice versa. You are also familiar with the shape memory alloys where the materials can change its shape and remember it. And when the stimuli is removed, in this particular case, what you are seeing is it is heated, it is bent. And when the heat is removed, it is again back to the original shape. We also have chromogenic materials which changes its color. For example, the photochromatic glasses that we use. With the sunlight, the transparency of this glass is changing. And the polymer chemistry, chemists and engineers are familiar with the response stimuli polymers. These are the polymers that can change the conformation or the transparency. It can go from a transparent liquid to truth and dark opaque, depending upon the conformation or the coiling of the polymers in the solution. So this behavior you can observe when you change the pH, when you change temperature or the ionic strength, these materials are also come under the category of smart material. Then again, there are some materials which can respond to a magnetic field and change their properties. For example, the magnetorheological fluids, which are used as dampers or vibration arrest, arresting applications. You also have materials that can respond to electric field and change their properties in a significant manner. So in all these cases, you have a stimuli or multiple stimuli and then change in the properties. This stimuli can be environmental, it can be chemical, it can be thermal, mechanical, electrical or magnetic stimulus. With this stimulus, the properties that can be changed in these materials are the transparency of the color of the material, the size of the material, the shape of the material or conformation in the case of polymeric materials you have seen, the volume of the material can be changed, viscosity, thermal or electrical conductivity and so on. So materials that can in a controllable and reversible manner and change some of their properties, physiochemical properties 
are called smart materials. They are also called stimulate responsive material or some people call it intelligent materials. So none of these materials you see any nano features or nano elements. These are uh, traditional materials. So the nano materials exhibiting similar response or responsible behavior are called smart nano materials. This talk is all about two such materials. Sir. I will show you the materials. We have been working on such materials, working with such materials for a very long time, almost two decades. And a uh, lot of research students have worked very hard and, uh, you know, obtained their degree. And also we have a lot of inventions on these two materials. These materials are prepared in our lab and I will be talking about some of the results that we have in from our lab. So the first material that you see here is a glass Excuse fluid. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. To, sorry to interrupt, sir. There's a small bandwidth issue. Could you please uh, switch off your video and click because it's right. suffering. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks Yeah. Is it better now? Is it better now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Are you able to see the slide now? Yes, sir. We're able to see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So, containing some nanoparticles. The black liquid that you see. It is at the bottom of the vial, but uh, when it is placed between the pole pieces of an electromagnet, you can see that the liquid is drawn towards the pole piece remotely by controlling the magnetic field strength. So the fluid is responding to magnetic field and changing its properties. And the fluid you see is without magnetic field. That's the natural color of the fluid. It's an emulsion containing these nanograins of iron oxide particles. And when a magnetic field is applied, you can see the color of the fluid is changing. It's, it's not only with the remote magnetic field. See, if you put a toy magnet at the bottom of the vial, you can invert them and the liquid will be able to hold its weight like the one that you see here in this picture. And also, you will be able to generate all kinds of colors from this fluid by varying the magnetic field in a controlled manner. So, this is a fluid containing iron oxide nanoparticles and the size of the particle is around 10 nanometer. This is what I am going to do. So now you can see a video here. So it flows like any other fluid but I put a magnet at the bottom. Now you can see this movie. I am able to invert the vial. The fluid retains and uh, holding its weight and when you remove the magnetic field again the particles are disposed in the fluid it's a perfectly reversible process so this fluid is uh, popularly known as ferrofluid or magnetic nanofluid in these days so so this fluid you see that it is responding to a stimulus which is the magnetic field and uh, it is almost like a liquid magnet with the liquid and magnetic properties. That is because of the suspended nanograins of magnetic nanoparticles. So typically the size of the dispersed particle is less than 50 nanometers. The reason is that these particles when you want to suspend in a fluid, they have to remain suspended. 
As you all know, this sedimentation velocity depends on the density mismatch and the size of the particle. Obviously, you can choose a highly viscous medium to delay the sedimentation of particle. That is what it is done in the case of magnetorheological fluids. If you have micron sized particles, so they use very highly viscous oils to keep these particles suspended. And obviously, they also use rheological modifier. They are ferromagnetic materials. In this case, they are super paramagnetic materials. I will talk about them. It's not only particles, these particles are to be functionalized with a layer of surfactant molecules to prevent aggregation. The nanoparticles are highly reactive. You know that a lot of atoms reside at the surface and as a result they are very reactive. They have a tendency to aggregate. This is one of the problems you face when you synthesize nanoparticles, the aggregation. If you want to prevent of nanoparticles, you have to provide a sort of sheath on the nanoparticles so that it may not be reactive, it may not react or it may not come into contact. So you can have a sort of electrostatic or steric stabilization it is called to exert a strong repulsive forces between the particles when they come closer at nanoscales. So this is what you need. You need a layer of surfactant around that you can see in this uh, high resolution TM. You can see the amorphous contrast. That is because of the layer of surfactant or polymeric layer which is on the surface of this nanoparticle. This is called capping or functionalization. You can have different types of uh, particles in this kind of magnetic fluid. It can be magnetite, Fe304, gamma Fe23, or cobalt, nickel, ferrites, uh, that is mixed ferrite. And you can also dispose these uh, particles in, uh, in different fluids. Uh, it can be disposed in water. Uh, non aqueous fluids like oil and uh, as I told you size restriction comes from the fact that the particles to remain suspended and they have to be stable against a strong dipolar interaction and aggregation. So to show you an example of or the importance of surface capping in stabilization of this kind of colloidal system, I have another movie here. So in the first movie, you saw particles and surfactant molecule. And the particle size is around 10 nanometers. If it is not properly functionalized, what happens to this fluid? That is what you see in this movie. So it is the size of the particle is exactly the same. The particles are the same, that is the iron oxide. Only difference is that the capping is not proper, the functionalization is not proper. Now you see the difference. The liquid is separated from these particles. Whereas in the other case, the liquid is not separating from the particles. So what mechanical energy to stabilize such uh, particles? Even then you provide mechanical agitation, it may get dispersed in the fluid but uh, when you apply a strong magnetic field then again they will cluster because they are like tiny magnets. So this is a unique material that has both magnetic and liquid properties and you have seen in the movie the location of the fluid can be remotely controlled or the particles or the fluid has an ability to conform to any geometry and these fluids exhibit interesting properties, optical properties, thermal properties, microstructure, viscosity. And the size of these materials are comparable to bioentities. So you find a lot of biomedical applications for this material. And iron oxide nanoparticles are FDA approved material. And it is being used in MRI contrast 
targeted drug delivery and presently it is being tested for cancer treatment and also it can be used for protein detection dna separation all these concepts have been demonstrated by various researchers now you see a second fluid that's the emulsion you see how this fluid is changing the the fluid is changed these are structural colors it is not the pigmented color that you see in paints and other displays you can see it is a reversible process when i increase the magnetic field it is kept inside a solenoid coil and i am slowly increasing the magnetic field when i increase the magnetic field you can see the color of the fluid is changing so this is the kind of structural colors that you see in in butterflies in the case of some of the um, birds they exhibit structural colors because of the nano structures they will be able to reflect one particular wavelength this is what you see the kind of colors in soft films because the thickness of the film is nano scale and it can reflect on particular wavelength when the bracket condition is satisfied the second fluid which is showing color which is slightly bigger size but uh, we make it by using oil globules inside the oil globules we put this 10 nanometer size particle lot of these particles so these particles are magnetically polarizable and the particle size is so small the thermal energy is sufficient enough to keep this particle suspended in the liquid that is what you see in this movie you see the the brownian movement of these droplets which can be observed under an optical microscope that is the beauty of the system the length scale is accessible like other colloidal system with optical microscope and also the dynamics is very slow as compared to molecular or atomic system this is the beauty of colloidal system this is a colloidal suspension but the size is very small 10 nanometer or less now you see the the microscopic behavior of the emulsion droplets when i apply a small magnetic field the direction so you see the structures are moving and still the structures are you know they are moving in the liquid and the structure is growing you can see the structures are going and aligning in on that direction and the aspect ratio of the structures are increasing so you see the order disorder transition can be manifested and you can easily control the interparticle spacing within the fluid that's the beauty of the system and the beauty of the system is the you can tune the interaction using a magnetic field. So, what happens? It can induce a magnetic moment which is proportional to the applied magnetic field. That is what you see in this equation. And the magnetic interaction energy, again, you can tune it with uh, a magnetic field. And the factor, the dimensionless factor which is used to explain the order disorder transition is coupling constant which is the ratio of the magnetic to the thermal energy so when this ratio is less than on you see brownian motion of the particle that's what you saw in the in the microscopic picture when the field is very small but lambda is greater than on you will be able to see this kind of tip to tip aggregation because of the dipolar interaction strong attractive interaction between the magnetic grains and if you go to very strong field you can see a thickening of the structure that is happening because of the lateral coalescence of these droplets so that's what you have seen the aspect ratio is increasing and at some point you can see 
the size of the droplet because of this kind of lat later, lateral aggregation. So you have attractive interaction between the particles in the chain and the repulsive interaction between the chains. That's what it is. But if you go to very high field, you can overcome the barrier and bring down coilus. That's what it is happening. So it is a wonderful system. You have already seen in the microscopy. Wonderful system to probe order disorder transition, which you cannot study in atomic system by a uh, using light microscopy. Obviously, you can do it with the neutron and uh, you know X-ray um, scattering techniques. Uh, but uh, in this kind of system, the length scales are comparable to the wavelength of light used. As a result, you can use light microscopy, light scattering techniques. I will also show you how these systems can be used to probe intermolecular forces. What I am talking about is the pico-newton or sub-pico-newton forces acting between fine nanoparticles in a solution, which can be probed and manifested by using this kind of magnetically polarized. Now, suppose you imagine that you have a polymeric material or surfactant which is used in stabilizing colloidal systems and you need to know how they are interacting and what is the kind of interaction between the particles in colloidal system. This can be studied using this kind of system. You can also study the polymer surfactant complexation. This is again very, very important when it comes to practical application, industrial formulation, which can be manifested by looking at the scattering and intermolecular forces. I'll touch upon this, uh, all this aspect in the next uh, 10 to 20 minutes. Now look at uh, this, the structure of transition, how it can manifest. You send an, a laser beam through this sample, you see the spot transmitted light intensity is disappearing and reappearing something and then you would be able to see a ring like structure. It takes little longer time. So I am increasing the magnetic field and laser beam is transmitted through this liquid and you see the intensity of the transmitted light is decreasing and then you see a pattern which is emerging. A circular pattern which is emerging and this was the original spot. Originally the light intensity, the entire light was scattered. It is passing through the sample. Now with a very strong field you see a spot, a, a spot is there around this spot. You can see a ring like structure. Why this is happening? This was quite puzzling. Why this is happening? When you increase the magnetic field through a fluid, nanofluid, you are seeing intensity reduction followed by a ring-like structure and you know this ring-like pattern disappears when you switch off the magnetic field. So the working on this problem was Judai. And uh, he wanted to understand what is happening. He changed the angle of incidence and looked at the kind of pattern which is emerging from this sample. And he realized that this is the scattering from the nanostructures that are formed in the fluid when the magnetic field is increased. To confirm this, we have taken a needle, a millimeter sized needle and allowed this light to scatter from the surface when it is the angle of incidence was very small close to zero we could see a ring like pattern which is emerging this we could see from an optical fiber of 100 nanometer uh, 100 micron and uh, in all these cases what happens is the pattern is changing with uh, the angle of incidence. See here, 20 degree, 45 and 90 see a straight line. Exactly the same thing you see when you change the angle of incidence with respect to the applied magnetic field strength in the case of magnetic field. So what is happening in this case is the scattering yeah. Sir, I'm sorry to disturb, sir. Actually, a audio is breaking in between. So, 
can we disconnect you and connect you back yeah, yeah. okay Re really sorry sir for uh, oh. interrupting in okay. between okay. sir okay <laughs> yeah sir so i will stop sharing uh yes sir or i can connect my is it because of my audio um, yeah audio is breaking in between so so um, should i use a microphone and uh, maybe i did set uh, separate uh, yeah let me try that uh, is it sorry, better sorry sir uh, we couldn't hear you okay audio is better now yeah it is okay but it's kind of breaking in between it is breaking in between so what is to be done yeah it is okay now i guess it is okay okay so i can use my headset okay i was using the laptop mic yeah now now if yeah. you have if you have a problem you just let me know yeah sure sir okay so what you see here is the scattering from the nanostructures which are formed the structures are evolving in the magnetic field that's what you see here the transmitted intensity which is decreasing and then it increases beyond some magnetic field these are the critical fields that are required for the change of form in the entire volume and then you see a kind of separate all these things can be manifested beautifully from the scattered light intensity or diffraction pattern you can even get the information about the the diameter of the structures that are formed and you can find from the critical field the transitions or the field at which the separating transitions are occurring all these things have been done and there are three theses on this topic and i wouldn't be able to talk about all these things we have looked at uh, the effect of applied field strength particle size dispersion properties on scattering the beauty of the system is that uh, you know the particle size is very small as compared to the incident laser light that is the length of light and the primary particle size is around 10 nanometers so you are in the my region and then when you increase the magnetic field you try to form chains with the aspect ratio varying from 10 nanometers to several hundreds of nanometers to micron and even millimeters you can reach so that's the beauty of the system so all these studies have been done and we have obtained a good amount of insight into the structures that are formed in the system and the kind of transitions that are taking place in magnetic magnetic fluids and so on now one of the problems that industries are facing today is the short shelf life of products what i'm referring to is the syrups food and taste making stuff the pharmaceutical products paints creams polishes agricultural sprays and so on now this you see typically this is what it happens if you keep it for a longer time these are dispersions either salts or emulsions multi-component systems where you have oil droplets in water or particles disposed in a fluid with some additives or stabilizer either they will cream it or sediment depending upon the density of these dispersed phases when it comes to nanofluid it's again a very hot topic today the the destabilization or phase separation of this particle is a big issue that's the issue we face with all kinds of creams and you know uh, stuff that we use in cosmetics as well as food industries so again this is a field which is uh, which is uh, you know familiar with uh, chemists and chemical engineers you know that uh, the intermolecular forces acting between the colloidal particle decides the stability it decides the aggregation phenomena and phase behavior and this is what it can happen it can cream it or it can sediment depending upon the density mismatch so what is desired here is very strong repulsive interaction between the particles 
if the interaction is very strong and the net force that is the sum of the repulsive interaction essentially it comes from the charges at the interface of this particle or the the kind of stabilizing moieties that you sometimes can be polymer where the interaction forces are steric and uh, obviously in all kinds of system you can see the wonderful interaction at very small in the particle spacing Typically, if you take a 200 nanometer size emulsion droplet, the Van der Waals interaction or Van der Waals force is effective when the separation between these particles are less than 10 nanometers. So, what you need to worry is the long range repulsive forces. If it is not very strong, what can happen is the particles will be able to cross this barrier. This is the sum of these forces. The barrier height is high, then it's better and uh, particles will not be able to cross this barrier and reach the primary minimum. If it is reaching the primary minimum, you end up in a scenario like this, particles are flocculated or aggregated. If it is in the primary minimum, it's not a major problem. You can, you can provide some mechanical and get them back. So, these are the different techniques that are used to stabilize the system. You can use uh, electrostatic steric or electrosteric stabilization by using surfactants or charges to stabilize this particle in this case. And in this case, you have uh, steric interaction by uncharged polymer or neutral polymers. You can also use di-block polymers like the one which is shown here, which will have a, a hydrophobic and hydrophilic part which one can anchor to the surface and the other can protrude in the solution. This is one way of stabilizing and uh, you can also use polyelectrolyte or neutral polymers with the surfactant where you will have uh, electrosteric interaction between them. Now the problem is how do you probe this interaction? One of the elegant techniques which is developed in 70s is the surface force apparatus where you can probe the interaction forces between two microscopic surfaces, for example two mica surfaces, where you can control the spacing within nanometers within an extra level, the most recent one you can control and look at the interaction forces. The simple Hooke's law is applied here to get the force that are measured. So this is a beautiful facility when it comes to macroscopic surfaces. And the beauty is uh, you can also functionalize the surfaces with the macromolecules and see how they interact and how the forces vary as a function of distance. You see, it is from 150 nanometers down to a nanometer. You can bring them and get the, the forces. You can study the hydrophobic and hydrophilic interaction. That's what it is demonstrated. And uh, the steric interaction. All these things are done between 70 and 90. It has a lot of relevance with respect to stability of system, lubrication, you can wear and tribology, this system is used. Another technique that can use to prompt interaction forces down to 10 raised to minus 9 is the atomic force. It's again complex but it's a simple system. The tip size can be of the order of few nanometers and you probe the forces between a macroscopic surface, a molecularly smooth surface is required. This is another requirement when it comes to, you know, the forces down to nanoscale. And here again, you can control the spacing and obtain the interaction forces. But in none of these cases, you can probe the forces between the colloidal particles which so, how do you measure the forces as a function of distance? You have seen that the force is always a function of distance and at some distance there is repulsive and uh, you know at very short in the particle spacing it is attracted. And this is to be measured as a function of distance and you have no way you can do that in the case of a conventional colloid system. So, here the liquid 
or the magnetic emulsion which I have shown showing different colors is very very useful to prop such uh, interaction. All you need to do is if you are working with an emulsion you have to incorporate some nano grains inside so it becomes magnetically polarizable and this particular case what we have done is the diameter is 200 nanometer and the grain size is around 10 nanometers you put a lot of grains inside and make this magnetically polarizable as you all know these colloids and emulsions are thermodynamically unstable system but you can make them kinetically stable by using some kind of stabilizers and use surface active species to stabilize them and as you have seen in the video you know initially they are random and there is no net magnetization the dipoles which are randomly oriented within the droplets they are super paramagnetic and when you apply magnetic field you can control the magnetic interactions as you have seen the magnetic interaction you can tune that means you can control the inter-particle spacing if you are able to control the inter-particle spacing it is very easy to measure the force as a function of distance in this system because this I can skip because when it forms an undimensional array what is happening the net force is balanced what is the net force I am talking about the forces due to repulsion and the forces due to attraction forces due to repulsion on the kind of stabilizing moieties that you use it can be electrostatic it can be steric or electrostatic depending upon the surfactant molecule or polymer or polymer surfactant that you use and the attractive contribution at very small in the particle distance is originating from the one walls forces and the long range attractive interaction which you can control is the magnetic interaction which you can you can compute for an infinitely long chains using this expression and the magnetic magnetic moment is a function of the applied magnetic field that also you have the information and you can compute the van der Waals interaction by using these equations you will be able to get them the interaction force the net interaction forces now the problem that you face in colloidal system is the interparticle spacing again you have a solution with the magnetically polarizable emulsion this video is the black peak this is the black peak you you see in crystals with the x-rays X-ray scattering is because the interparticle spacing or the lattice spacing falls in angstrom. So you have to use an X-ray to get diffraction that or the scattering. So in this case, what what is done is the droplet size is of the order of 200 nanometers. So you have a length scale which is comparable to the visible wavelength. So when you apply very strong magnetic field you see a black peak at lower wavelength and when you increase the magnetic field when you decrease the magnetic field the distance between the particles within the chain is decreasing that is what you are seeing here in a video I'm just slowly reducing the magnetic field you see the black peak is shifting and this is measured at a constant angle so you see the interparticle spacing within the chain is decreasing and at some point the force is not sufficient enough to keep these particles within the chain and then it becomes totally disordered so you don't see any crack peak in the system so you see how you can tune the magnetic interaction and obtain the ordering in the system and we have used this concept to study the forces between surfactant stabilized system we have studied the forces between sterically stabilized system. here the beauty is that if you have a polymeric system and polymer is used to stabilize these particles what can happen is the decay length becomes comparable to the radius of correlation of the polymer that means you will be able to tell what is the molecular weight or the radius of gyration of polymer by fitting the force parameters force data experimental data so you see here the force is 
0.1 piconewton to terrace to minus 11 newton. the kind of forces acting in it. And uh, obviously all these things are validated with other experiment and theoretically. And so this is a very well established technique to prop interaction forces at nanoscale. And we have also shown long ago that uh, it can also be used to prop the polymer surfactant interaction. It's a very complex phenomena which cannot be probed by any other technique except uh, small angle neutron scattering. It's an indirect technique. And uh, you know, you have to go to cryo TM experiment. All this information you can draw by looking at the interaction forces. That's what we have shown here the kind of interaction that leads to different kinds of structures and interaction forces. And we could match our experimental finding with the cryo TM experiment. That's what you see in this case. The polymer surfactant interaction can lead to huge enhancement in stability of colloid that's what it is demonstrated in this paper and these fluids can also be used for sensing applications the technique is very simple when it comes to detection of analytes what we need is sensitivity and selectivity obviously and the simplicity of the technique and it should be cost effect what we have demonstrated here is you know, you create an array of these particles. This can be done very easily with a, with a magnetic field. And the magnetic field strength required in this case is not very high. It's of the order of 80 or 90 volts. This can be generated very easily with a toy magnet also. So when you create this kind of ordering, you have a black peak. And now if you introduce surfactant, alcohol or other molecules, into the system what happens is the the electrostatic interaction or the conformation of polymer if you use a polymer to stabilize this emulsion droplets then the inner particle spacing this spacing is changing by delta lambda so that can be manifested spectroscopically all you need is a spectrograph a pocket size spectrograph can do all the jobs and if you convert this shift delta lambda you calibrate it and you would be able to see what the concentration of ions is but again you have a question you have an issue which is the specificity obviously you have to use molecules that are specific to a cation so that you will be able to get selectivity also this is what we are working on this is work done by a student uh, Mahendran and uh, he has done a lot of work uh, to look at uh, the sensitivity of this uh, these nano emulsions for detection of different cations and he could achieve uh, different levels of sensitivity by using different functional moieties. So one of the issues here is uh, achieving 100% selectivity. When you have mixed ions, how do you detect? How do you say that it's uh, you, you have silver and calcium 2 plus ions? How do you say that what's the concentration? This is quite challenging. So we have to use specific moieties which will uh, the ions a specific ion will go and bind to that moieties that is what it is required it can be done and we have also shown that it can be used for glucose sensing this is again work of uh, uh, Mahendran and uh, you can also as I told you the conformational changes that are happening at the interface of a surface can be manifested this is already demonstrated by Israel actually and many other groups using surface force apparatus. But the surface force apparatus is a very, very difficult experiment to work with. And uh, you know, you take days and uh, you know, you never know when you get a good result. It's a very complicated experiment, but it's a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful device to probe the intermolecular. And uh, no other experiment and uh, technique can match the kind of sensitivity you can get with the surface person. But this is a simple technique, the magnetic emulsion and we call it a chaining technique where if the polymers are absorbed depending upon the, the conformational changes happening, for example, this case, it is a temperature sensitive polymer.
And what happens when you change the temperature? That's what it is shown here. So we can easily say that uh, this is the transition which is happening at 34 and it is collapsing. And initially it is stretch condition and it is collapsing. And this information can drop by looking at the, the Bragg peak changes. And it can also be used for detecting defects in the material, like what you see the kind of defects from x-ray you can image and get the, the the information about the defect that is what you see in this video you can see a specimen with a defect and a thin film of the sample is kept and you will be able to see the defects in the form of a color pattern that's what this is the region where the defect is present so by using modeling along with the color pattern it is able to quantify the kind of defects that is present a lot of work is done i don't have time so i just take two minutes more to to conclude and uh, i don't want to exceed my uh, time limit though i started at 12 15 i i will not delay your lunch <laughs> so i just want to go quickly and another area of interest using this magnetic uh, nanoparticle is uh, magnetic hypothermia it is an emerging alternate cancer therapeutic procedure it is in the advanced trial in europe and many other countries and i'm sure this would be a cancer therapy in five to ten years time or even less so the advantage here is you can target the tissues that you want, the cancer or tumor cells. And uh, it can be done uh, in a distal, uh, uh, through distal guidance and uh, speci tissue specificity is also possible to achieve. So this is the working principle. You have to find out the cancer cells and you have to inject uh, the desired amount of the nanofluid into the cells and you can apply a high frequency radiation okay it is like an mri system high frequency magnetic field you have to apply to uh, around 100 to 200 kilohertz is the frequency and depending upon the frequency of the applied magnetic field and the field strength you will be able to generate heating in the tissues and you can ablate the cells that's the working principle used in cancer therapy we are not working on cancer therapy but we are looking at uh, the heating efficiency of this nanoparticle and we are trying to make a biocompatible nanoparticles in our lab we have a setup in-house developed facility to look at the temperature changes that are happening in the in the ferrofluids or the magnetic fluids uh, and look at uh, the temperature changes in a remote manner using a thermal imaging camera that's what you see here with the increase in the magnetic uh, field and duration you will be able to see the center of this coil is getting heated up and that's the temperature which is which is shown here and uh, i already want phd a, a student has completed uh, uh, his uh, thesis in this field and uh, second one is completing a lot of work is done on the heating efficiency of this nanoparticle another application we are pursuing for the reactor is the dynamic sealant i think uh, dr ramajandran talked about uh, ball magnetic ball bearing magnetic ball bearing combined with the uh, ferrofluid sealant uh, is uh, is an innovative idea and uh, this kind of sealant is used in many technologies it's a technology which is developed long ago in 70s or 80s by nasa and uh, some companies in us now this technology is used in many devices and we have uh, indigenously developed this technology and it's being used in our reactor uh, applications so another interesting application is uh, magnetic field guided I don't know if it's nanoparticles uh, with uh, specific coatings like dextrans, PG and all are FDA approved up to certain uh, uh, quantity. It can be used in inhaler. Mm, uh, you know, it can make an aerosol with the drug molecules so that uh, you can uh, you can uh, you know reduce the side effect associated with powerful. Uh, powerful drugs and you can get localization of 
the drug molecules to the region of interest. This is what it is demonstrated by a German group in the year 2007 and a lot of work is going on on magnetic field guided drug delivery. It's a very promising area and researchers who are interested in this field should pursue this and uh, because this is something one can do it uh, without uh, you know huge investment or technologies. And we have also shown that uh, this kind of fluids can be used for uh, heat transfer applications uh, and uh, this is what something a student has demonstrated uh, long ago that uh, you can achieve something like 300 percent of enhancement which is not possible with conventional uh, nanofluids. This is all because of the effective heat transfer through the nano chains of particles in the fluid. That's what it is done. Uh, almost two theses uh, uh, is is, uh, is done on this topic and uh, due to positive time I will not dwell upon and those who are interested in uh, papers on all these topics they can contact me. So I conclude I have taken five minutes more but uh, I think uh, uh, still uh, <laughs> you know that the time is uh, less than what is uh, what I thought uh, is and uh, I will summarize uh, uh, by saying that magnetic fluid is a wonderful model system to probe order disorder transitions and uh, you can probe weak forces between colloidal particles and uh, you know i have also shown you that uh, molecular conformation and changes can be manifested by looking at the changes that are happening in the system and this fluids uh, exhibit interesting optical thermal and rheological properties and they have uh, many applications uh, i've shown some of the application defect detection it's uh, it's uh, something we have invented in our lab we have also shown for the first time the analyte sensing i've shown some slides we have developed a dynamic sealing technology indigenously because it's a technology which exists but we have evolved the the formulations and we have developed the magnetic trap and tested it on component for dynamic sealing cancer therapy it's a promising um, applications of this nanomaterials and we are looking at uh, the heating efficiency of this nanoparticle probably at some point we have to collaborate with uh, uh, some institutions to take this forward and uh, oh, we are uh, working on this and uh, this is also a very good system for targeted drug delivery and uh, with this I conclude my, uh, my talk and I thank uh, the organizers once again for giving me an opportunity to present this work and I thank all my students and uh, whatever I presented is uh, the work of my students and some of the staff members and uh, I thank the collaborators and funding agencies and some of the images which I showed in the in the first part of my lecture comes from Google so I want to thank Google also for the images and thank you very much and, uh, and I will be happy to answer your questions I can delay my lunch no problem. yeah yeah hello hello Yeah, I've done. Hello. Uh, thank you, sir, for such an exciting and enriching session. Uh, sir, can we take up some questions? Uh, yeah, you? yeah, sure, sure. No yeah. problem. Okay. Was there further interruption? Or... Uh, in between but it was okay sir we were it was okay to, yeah, yeah i'm very i'm very sorry <laughs> because uh, bandwidth is an issue on holidays yeah yes sir yeah yeah right. that's okay. uh, yeah i can take all the questions no problem i'll be happy to answer yeah okay sir yeah So one question was, uh, how can we functionalize the surface of nanoparticles? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. 
uh, there are many ways for example we use uh, some kind of fatty acids uh, you know this uh, like oleic acid for example it binds to this iron oxide uh, through some specific uh, you know binding mechanism and you can also use uh, small molecules other molecules fatty acid molecule like uh, uh, or you can use uh, polymeric materials because these are a very very tiny particles so you cannot use uh, big molecules macromolecules as i told you and uh, shown you in one of the images uh, the 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 particle size is around 10 nanometer and the surface uh, the capping agent is around uh, one nanometer or so so you can choose uh, uh, it's not universal that in all kinds of particles you may be working with uh, gold or silver so there are thiol molecules and uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, available literature what kind of molecules you should uh, you should uh, aim to functionalize this molecule and if you know the mechanism of binding it is quite easy and then you have to ensure that a monolayer of surfactant which is uh, at the inverse of this uh, these nanoparticles that is very very essential for for all kinds of application if you don't have a proper functionalization the nano materials you prepare or nano fluids you develop will have no application obviously a lot of people work with uh, you know uh, unstable fluids and uh, you can get all kinds of results uh, and uh, but none of these cells will be reproduced by by reproducible by other people and this is one of the biggest problem the nanofluid community is facing now many results that are published are not reproducible that is because the nanofluids uh, behave so differently it is not only functionalization it is also the monodispersity and the quality of nanoparticles this is very very challenging when you prepare fluids or nanoparticles and uh, you know it should be fairly uniform if the size is varying from 10 nanometer with a spread up to 50 or 60 nanometer it's not a good system to work the polydispersity should be as minimum as possible that is what you need for practical application otherwise whatever i have discussed today the kind of applications i have shown for uh, the cancer therapy if you take it say you go beyond 20 nanometers say these are ferromagnetic materials so you will have a residual magnetization it's a problem this, that is exactly the same case with condom dots or uh, condom dots uh, for example you can see beautiful color band cap tuning can be achieved but when it comes to different sizes you know the band caps are different when you put a lot of things together what happens their behavior is different their properties are different so you will not get any consistent result the second problem is the aggregation of this particle this is to be prevented if the particles are aggregated and they are forming clusters again the behavior of nanofluids so it is a very very challenging area in general nanomaterials quality material functionalization and the monodisplay these are the three things one should focus on the good chemist can make it uh, there's no problem if you are a good chemist and you have to devote a lot of time and you will be able to achieve very good monodispersity and you can produce particles with a fairly monodispersed size that is what it is required for practical application so depending upon the system you're working you have to decide what kind of molecules you can attach to the particle i hope i have answered question yeah Yes, Rekha, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you. Yes, sir. Uh, Sri Ram. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. Sir, can you tell us the how uh, the growth of a uh, second generation solar cells with uh, nanotech? I mean, uh, how are uh, solar cells? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it is not connected to my work, uh, but I can tell you the nanotechnology is finding application in almost all field. And for example, the solar cells, uh, one technique which can be used is, you know, some of the flies are able to see even under darkness or very feeble light. For example, month, which is able to see. Why it is able to see? Now people have looked at the eye of a moon and they found that nano bombs are there. It's about 100 nanometer diameter. 
okay so what it gives is it is able to concentrate all the lights so that means the anti reflective properties so that kind of structures if you can you can make it on solar cells and the solar concentrators what can be done is you know you can make highly efficient and uh, people also use dye sensitized uh, solar cells and a lot of nano technology comes into picture when it comes to solar cells or solar and another problem that you face in solar cells is the you know dirt which is accumulating and it is bringing down the efficiency as uh, dr ramajandra also told me in our, our lab also we are working on super hydrophobicity it's again an inspiration from nature the lotus leaf you wonder how the lotus leaf is self cleaning its surface it doesn't wet the surface if there are dirt it can be cleaned very easily if you put water you don't have to apply it's the super hydrophobicity the contact angle greater than 150 degrees centigrade that is why the lotus is able to self clean it so when somebody looked at uh, the lo lotus microstructure under an ACM microscope they found something very interesting it has a hierarchical structure made with uh, nano and uh, micron scale features and uh, wax crystalloids which are about 10 nanometers which are all around these rough surfaces micro nano scale roughness which is called a hierarchical structure and now the engineering community is looking at developing super hydrophobic surface and we have success not only us everybody has success but the problem is the durability how long the surface is durable you can pattern the surface by laser you can deposit materials nanomaterials at the surface and make the surface super hydrophobic if that is super hydrophobic when it rains all the dust is cleaned and you don't have to use any cleaning agent and the surface always remain remain clean and this technology can be used in solar cells and you know in uh, a solar converter solar concentrate again the anti-reflective properties of materials can be used so nanotechnology is finding application in almost every domain for example you always wonder how gecko is able to move up and down on the walls again it has some nano features that's the reason why it is able to climb up and down and it can sit on the ceiling that is because this very strong monovals attraction it is able to generate between the surface and its toe which contains millions of nanoscale fibrous uh, hairs and that is that is the technology now the engineers are trying to mimic to create wall climbing robots which can work in hostile environment high temperature or in nuclear uh, reactors so nobody will be able to go inside because of the radiation you can send a robot which can climb like a gecko and that's the technology which is looked at so in solar cells and all this field you have some kind of nanotechnologies coming in all these cases you know you have some issues which are to be overcome and which will be overcome on day like any other technology you know when piezoelectricity was discovered in 1880 no application for that now you see piezoelectric sensors everywhere it is for the imaging for lighting diesel uh, engines uh, and uh, you know if you go to ultrasound scanning it is used uh, and uh, even your airbag is actuated by a piezoelectric sensor when there is an so thousands of applications and when you as a student when you invent your things you will find challenges this is the challenge most of the scientists have faced you invent something new and people don't accept it this is what michael faraday it happened when he demonstrated electricity to the visiting prime minister he asked electricity will it ever find any applications he told sir one day you will tax it this was the reply of michael faraday okay so so yeah i think uh, i've answered your question yeah sir uh, Arnab, i have one question yes sir uh, i come from mechanical engineering background so yeah conventional machining uh, so a new domain has opened up and we are using uh, nano particle uh, based coolants yes uh, the lubricants during the machining process yeah so we may apply it in the form of a jet or there can be some other form of a can you 
Uh, one of your audio is breaking. Can you just be louder? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, yeah. Am I audible now? Now it is okay. Yeah. Can you repeat? I couldn't hear because it was breaking your audio. Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Uh, sir, uh, during conventional machining, uh, yeah. there is one application of uh, nano uh, fluid. Lubricants. Uh, yeah. Yes, as lubricants or coolants. Yeah. So yes. So generally, we may apply it in the form of jet or some other form of application. Yeah. Can you please throw some light on, on the fluidic properties, uh, like when it is being applied as a jet, how will it behave? Yeah. See, uh, uh, this magnetic nanofluids which I have uh, discussed today is a very promising candidate for such application as a lubricant because if you have ferromagnetic component, because of the magnetism, it will be able to retain the thin layer of fluid will be a will be remaining in curved and other parts okay so this magnetic uh, lubricant is uh, is already sold by some of the company for engine and other other uh, other things and also in lubrication it is used uh, magnetic fluids and other uh, other fluids uh, the magnetic fluid uh, other than magnetic fluids if you consider uh, the nanoparticles, I know that some of the nanoparticles, I think uh, silicon carbide or some of the nanoparticles and nanofluids are used for lubrication for purpose during machining. Uh, but uh, you know, there again, you have an issue which is, uh, you know, the stability of this, uh, this suspensions. Uh, most of the suspension, unless you stabilize with an organic molecules, uh, you know, achieving very good stability or disposability is a problem. So in uh, machining time, when you use, uh, you know, uh, you, you, if the temperature is very high, the, the stabilizing moieties can get degraded and uh, you will have issues. So this is to be overcome. Uh, it can be done in principle by using electrostatic. You can charge the particles and uh, you can use it uh, as long as the ionic strength and uh, other solvent properties are controlled. And uh, that kind of fluids are used. Uh, but very um, critical issue with respect to all kinds of nanofluids for practical applications, the stability as I told you, the aggregation issues and uh, the long time stability. These are the issues to be addressed. But magnetic fluid is very, very useful thing for lubrication. A lot of work uh, is being done. We are not working on that. Yeah. Yes, Arnab. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other question? Sir, I guess we are yeah. running a bit late out of time. So, okay. uh, if there are more questions, can we just mail you, sir? So you yes, can... you can do that. And uh, if you want to ask, you can ask. Uh, I have no problem. I can spend a few more minutes. Otherwise, you can mail me. Yeah, yeah sir. We'll just mail yeah. you, sir. Okay. Okay. So, sir, thank you so much for coming uh, for the RSD. And it was actually tru truly enriching and inspiring session. And we are hoping to bring you back for other sessions, other programs organized by IIT Madras. So, thank, thank you. you so much, thank you. It's my pleasure and uh, all the very best for the uh, remaining events. Yes, thank sir. You. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you.
technology is the strongest force shaping our lives today. While everyone is familiar with consumer brands at the forefront of this reality, not many are aware of the enablers of this force of modernity working behind the scenes. Meet KLA. The technological powerhouse standing behind many of the tech breakthroughs of our time. Many of the electronic devices you touch are functional thanks to our innovative systems. These devices sing, move, and laugh because behind the scenes and buried within are the pieces and parts that anticipate your wishes and transform your commands into a flurry of electrical signals. Electron speed from sensors to chips to connectors deep within each chip, traveling on roads 10,000 times thinner than a human hair through a miniature technological landscape that is built by manipulating atoms with extraordinary precision. As it's being constructed, KLA systems traverse the landscape, finding the smallest imperfections and identifying atomic scale variations. And they carry out this mission of discovery for hundreds of manufacturing steps across the 15 billion transistors that can comprise just one chip. That's two times more transistors than the entire world's population. Our discovery drives electronics manufacturing perfection because when the parts and pieces are functional and reliable, the devices you use are better, faster, and most importantly, smarter, allowing you to discover the next medical breakthrough your next ride home, the next frontier, our future. We invite you to face the most complex problems known to mankind. Together, we can turn theory into reality and create devices that will transform the future. Join us today in advancing humanity tomorrow. KLA, keep looking ahead.
So I'm Thorsten uh, from PicoQuant. PicoQuant is based at the Technology Park in Berlin, Adlershof. Right now, I'm, si uh, I'm sitting at the, uh, in the third floor of my building, which is displayed on this slide. Yeah, what is QCore? Uh, it's our software for quantum correlation analysis. As you can see, it, on that slide, it's basically an acronym for that. And we developed this, this software in close collaboration with Oliver Benson from the Humboldt University and uh, Stefan Reitzenstein from the TU Berlin. This software is uh, focusing on optical quantum technology applications, mainly on uh, characterization of quantum emitters like single photon sources or uh, entangled uh, sources, photon pair sources. And it can also be used for uh, analysis regarding quantum key distributions. The software is not only uh, designed to do the analysis, it also is able to uh, to control the Pico Hub 300, the Hydro Hub 400, the Time Hub 260, Multi Hub 150. So basically, all of our uh, timing electronics that we put on the market. And this means at the end, you have one tool which can guide you through the whole measurement from the start, from the, uh, from the data acquisition, just uh, to the uh, to the data analysis at the end. This software is using a special uh, type of functionality of our timing electronics. It's a special mode of operation, which is called T2 mode. This is a time tagging mode, which I don't want, uh, uh, which I'm not going to show in detail in this uh, presentation because this would just simply take too long. 
Uh, if you have questions on that, if you don't know that yet, we can discuss that afterwards, or we can send you links to uh, the brochure where, where this is explained. The QCore software has two main parts of the functionality. Uh, one part is the coincidence correlation, which is focusing on uh, applications where you want to do a G2 type of measurements, just like anti-bunching, for example. And the other part is more dedicated for the analysis of general coincidences, meaning if you want to have some logical connection between your input channels, then this would be the way to, uh, to go then. In this presentation, I'm going to show the features of the software using already measured results taken from single photon, uh, uh, sorry, taken from uh, diamond nanocrystals, which have certain type of defects included. These defects are complexes of uh, nitrogen at uh, carbon sites and uh, vacancies in the lattice. These type of complexes are known to be, uh, uh, to show nice fluorescent if you excite them with, uh, with green lasers. We use a 532 nanometer laser for that and looked at the emission in the red. The lifetimes are not extremely short. Uh, typically you see lifetimes of a few 10 or nanoseconds. In this figure, you see uh, the spatial distribution of the fluorescence of that sample. We use the confocal microscope there. And typically you see dark regions there. This is, these are the regions where you don't have these uh, defects and the luminescence comes from certain spots of your samples. So if you want to do these kind of measurements, you have to focus the excitation to that specific spot. And if you look there, then you typically see the single photon emission, which can uh, be nicely analyzed with anti-bunching type of setups. And I will come to that later on. Uh, for these type of results that I showed, uh, we use our MicroTime 200. It's a confocal microscope system consisting of the microscope itself and uh, further optical instruments like excitation lasers and also um, a Henry Brown twist setup. This is a setup where you use two detectors you get the light from the sample, send it to a beam splitter. Part of the light goes to detector one and the other, uh, actually the one part is the reflected part and the transmitted part then goes to the detector two. And of course we need some time taking electronics for that. Here we use the Hydro Hub 400, but for the characterization of NV centers, you can also use our, uh, uh, our other timing electronics in the same way, you get similar quality of results. So now switch to the QCore software. What you see right now is the user interface of the software. It consists of uh, different parts and I would like to start at the, at the top left side. If you follow the mouse button, uh, so, uh, sorry, the mouse cursor, then you see this kind of folder structure. The QCore uses a certain type of uh, concept, which is called workspace concept. It's like a folder, a workspace is in principle, the, the uh, main folder of your measurements. In this case, the workspace is called samples. On the next level of the folder, you find the PTU files. These are the raw data that you can measure with the software. And on the, uh, on the lowest level, you have the analysis. This is the PicoQuant housekeeping tool that we uh, provide you. It uh, directly links all of your results, all of your analysis logically 
to the raw data already. So that will make it easy to you to uh, always know later on which kind of analysis had been uh, related to which uh, raw file. If you follow the mouse more to the center of the top, you find three tabs. It's test, measurement, and analysis. These three tabs guide you through the whole experiment, starting from uh, just uh, adjusting the sample, adjusting the, for example, the focus by uh, looking at the intensity changes. Uh, in this in this test uh, in this test tab, all of the data that you, uh, that the software gets from the timing electronics is processed on the fly no results are stored. So it, in principle, it works like an oscilloscope. You just see what happens at your sample, what happens at your setup. You can use that information to do all of the alignment of the sample. And then you directly see, for example, if there's an anti-bunching dip or not, if the intensity is high enough, if the intensity is stable. And when you reach that, you can go to the measurement tab. This measurement tool allows you to record the data, record the raw data, and also displays during the measurement uh, the, uh, the analysis that you want to do. So this is some kind of preview analysis. If you follow my mouse uh, to the right side of the top, there you have a selector where you can choose what kind of on-the-fly analysis you want to have. For example, you can also uh, you can have the anti-bunching calculation during the measurement. You can look at coincidence count rates, and you can also just display the, the overall count rate uh, at the detectors to uh, look if the if the experiment is stable. For example. Let's click on anti-bunching, for example. Maybe now it's a good time to zoom in a little bit. For anti-bunching, you look at two different channels that are correlated, and you can select these channels here. One is channel A, where you can choose if it's uh, the sync input, for example, if it's detector one, detector two. Depending on the instrument that is connected, you have different number of channels available for the uh, for this correlation. So for anti-bunching, you usually use detector one and detector two. You can also have some settings here that will give you, uh, 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 this settings give you the opportunity to define the window in which you uh, would like to look at during the measurement and also uh, to uh, define the size of the bins that are that will be displayed. It's not a final decision that you are doing here. If you keep the raw data, you can later on change that during the analysis, but I will also show that. If you look a little bit down to the bottom, also on the right side, you can split this window that is displayed right now, for example, to look at uh, up to four different types of analysis during the measurement. For example, if you're interested to look at the uh, anti-bunching behavior and on the time traces to uh, observe the intensity changes during the measurement, you can do that just here. There's also another point that I quickly want to show you. It's on the right side again, uh, sorry, on the left side again. Please follow the mouse. There's a button called discard TTTR data. You put that button in. If you are interested to uh, dismiss all of the raw data in order to save space on your disk, the, the raw data actually can become pretty large in size, especially if you have uh, lots of counts, each of the events that is registered by the electronics will generate a four byte time tag. And if you have 
billions of counts later on, then you will end up at giga, uh, gigabytes. So this could be an issue uh, in some situations. So here you have the possibility to, to discard the raw data and then only uh, all of the analysis that you uh, that you selected on the right side for the online calculation will be stored. We do not recommend in general to use that because the main strength of the QCore software is actually to have this flexibility in the data analysis later on. Okay, so let's come to the analysis. If you select your measured uh, raw data, the, these PTU files, for example, the CW shelved PTU file right now here, then you can select different type of analysis modes. For example, time trace calculation, TCSPC uh, calculation, which is some kind of start stop calculation relative to a sync input, anti-bunching, coincidence, and also there you have the possibility to use uh, your own scripts. This is uh, pretty sophisticated to uh, get into it. Uh, I won't show that right now. Basically, I'm going to focus on the anti-bunching analysis and also on the co uh, coincidence calculation. But let's start with the anti-bunching right now. At first, there will be some quick importation of all of the time tags. Uh, the time that it took right now was to calculate a, a multi-channel scaling curve, which you, which you can see on top. This is in principle uh, similar to the, uh, to the count rate display. It calculates a time trace of, uh, for the intensity out of the individual time tags. And now you can use that information to look either at uh, the whole measurement or just zoom in into a certain range of your measurement. Let's keep it complete right now to see all of it. Here for that specific measurement, you can already see that there had been intensity changes. Right at the beginning, apparently when the measurement was started, the focus was not ideal. So uh, the user who did this measurement seemed to try to uh, readjust the setup a little bit, get the quantum dot better into the focus in order to gain more light from this, uh, from this quantum dot. And that is what you can see here by rise of the intensity. Then later on, there was some part where the quantum dot uh, seemed to be not very stable something is strange happened here. And now before you can uh, start the anti-bunching calculation, you have the possibility to, to select the time window, which is uh, of interest for you. So ideally one would select a time window where the intensity was pretty stable and also high. That's what you do with these uh, red selectors. On the other end, you do not only have uh, these time selectors, you also have selectors on the Y direction, which means you can go to certain intensity ranges, which are of interest for you. This is especially useful if uh, you look at blinking quantum dots. For these kind of quantum dots, you would get the time trace where the intensity is jumping between two levels in principle. You have a level with a high uh, count rate and a level with a lower count rate, and it's just jumping back and forth all of the time. And by using these intensity selectors, you can just go, for example, to the, to the darker state and just take these time tags uh, in, into consideration when you're doing the anti-bunching calculation, uh, calculation, sorry. And also you can choose the, the bright states for these uh, kind of blinking quantum dots then. And then you can look at all of these states separately in your analysis. But now let's take this time window, 
where we have these uh, a pretty constant intensity. You can also change the time window for the calculation, change the number of sample po sampling points here, define some time offset between these channels. Then you can also choose if you want to uh, correlate detector A with B or B with A, or look at the uh, average between these two calculations. And then, oh, I forgot, you can also do the selections here. For example, you can co uh, correlate one detector with himself, with itself. This way you get an autocorrelation. The way it's checked right now, it's a cross correlation between these two detector channels. And then it takes a few seconds, depending on the number of, uh, of time text that you have there, it can take more time or less time. Here in this example, is there a few million of time texts within this window, and this will take a few seconds before it's ready. Should be finished in a moment. Ah, yeah, there it is. It's already completed. Right now, you see all of the three curves that have been checked on top. We can, for example, just focus on one of them, uh, which you can see right now. This is the cross correlation. Um, I think all of you or most of you will be aware how, uh, what that is, but I can quickly also explain what it is. On the uh, X axis right now, you see the lag time between clicks at the two detectors. And on the Y axis, you see the probability that uh, events or, or pairs of events have been detected with that specific lag time. And this is a uh, normalized uh, probability at the end. So this is equivalent to a cross correlation function or G2 function of the uh, time text that you measured. And it's very typical for, uh, for NV centers that you not only have this uh, dip at the center, but uh, especially if you uh, go to higher excitation, you can also get this bunching behavior. So th this dip is the anti-bunching and this uh, peak, this overlapping peak is the bunching behavior. Now, as uh, you already have the uh, raw data stored, you also have the possibility for example, to zoom in or out. So right now, this 200 nanoseconds have been selected already pretty well because I know the data already. Uh, I still would have also the opp opportunity the, uh, here to, for example, make the window smaller just to zoom in to, these, uh, to this anti-bunching dip. Okay, so now, Let's transfer all of the data to the fitting routine. Okay, here's the fitting.
Hi, can you hear me? Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi, Nathan. Hi, Kirti, how are you? I'm very good, how are you? Very well, very well, Kirti, thank you. Hi guys, uh, so Rohit here. Uh, we are live streaming right now onto YouTube. Uh, so we'll start at uh, two o'clock. Right. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, hi, Kitty. Hi, uh, Nitin. Hi, Sana. Thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, panel discussion on sustainable food and fashion from a research perspective. Uh, so uh, uh, before we get into the panel discussion, uh, I would want to thank each one of you for getting the time out to uh, be available here and uh, share your experiences with us. Uh, and uh, we will now present a short video from our sponsors, and then we will uh, go ahead with the panel discussion. Sure. I think there was some issues. So that was from our sponsors, and uh, thank you everyone who is watching us live on IITMA YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, Nitin, uh, Kirti, and Sana with us for the panel discussion on the sustainable food and fashion. Uh, I am your moderator. I am Rohit Junjunwala. I am the research affairs secretary at uh, IIT Madras, and I will be moderating this uh, panel discussion. So before we get into the panel discussion, I would uh, give you a brief introduction about each one of our speakers here. Uh, I will start with Nitin. So Nitin is the co-founder and chief tasting officer at uh, Coco Trade, and Coco Trade is the world's first uh, zero waste bean to bar uh, chocolate company. He is also he's done his man his uh, masters in retail management, and uh, he has worked previously with uh, Godrej uh, Nature's Basket, which is a premium uh, grocery chain, and he's also India's first uh, certified chocolate taster. So thank you, Nitin, for joining us today. Uh, our other finalist is uh, Keithi. So Keithi leads the Okai's efforts towards uh, empowerment and I'm reading it out here. So empowerment and protecting ancient craft. In 2015, she started with 350 women in Gujarat. And today Okai has impacted 24,000 women artisans across the country. Uh, she, uh, for 
in this period, Okhai's revenues uh, was improved or increased to 10 times. And uh, as a part of Tata administrative services, uh, she has worked across industries and six uh, of different Tata companies. Uh, Kirti was recently added uh, to the top list, to the list of top 130 women transforming India by Niti Ayo. So uh, Niti, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here and thank you for joining us. Uh, so our final finalist is Sana. Sana, uh, she is a fashion designer with expertise in sustainability and closed loop system. In 2014, Sana created her own technique of cutting called uh, Plena Flux and then subsequently launched her eponymous clothing line in 2018 to implement and execute her without a box concepts. An amalgamation of science and design, the two fundamentals that exist in all existence. Sana's Planner Flux is backed by years of research and development. At the age of 24, she published her research academically with a well-known scientific publishing house, Springer. Her clothing lines work to craft high fashion luxury garments as well as affordable upcycled clothing with features in distinguished media channels like WWD, Fashion United, Conscious Chatter, The Hindu and Grazi India. Uh, Sana is breaking myths associated with sustainable fashion in the global conversation. Uh, the Sana Sharma line of clothing is also a registered initiative, part of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals platform. So thank you for joining us uh, today, Sana. My pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we'll start with the panel discussion with a brief introduction about all of you guys' journey uh, about uh, developing a brand in uh, you know sustainable area. So uh, was it so uh, in brief two to three minutes if you can explain me your journey and was it a conscious choice for you guys to start a sustainable brand or did it just evolve over a period of time so uh sana can you start and then we will take up with kirti and then Nathan. sure uh so to answer your question actually i didn't begin my research as uh you know to, to like sort of solve sustainability issues within the industry i was looking to create innovative methods of making clothes because I was still in college. I was in my final year and I, I was just really bored of the way that we were making clothes. I just felt like we were doing them the same way since the medieval times. And I didn't want to just be another designer making clothes the same way. So my research started off as how, you know, what else can we do? How other, you know, what are the other ways that we can make garments? And while I was doing that research, I found out that there was this huge gap and there was this huge issue of you know unsustainable practices that were impacting our world in a very very strong way so from just looking at innovation now my research was at a path where i was looking at innovation for sustainability and that's how i created my own technique uh, which is based on a principle in math. It's a theory in math and science. It's called the Mobius strip. I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of it. Yeah. So yeah, it works on those principles and it's applied to the foundations of garment making and it helps to reduce uh, the consumption of fabric and it is also a zero waste technique. So typically in the fashion business, we have something like 12 to 15% of wastage, which is a huge amount. Uh, so this completely eliminates that and we have a zero waste system. So we also do, um, you know, we do recycling fabrics. We also use, uh, we do upcycling as well. So it's, a, it's now like more like a closed loop system and uh, it's an ongoing research. So for me, planar flux was like an initial step. And now we have a lot of things like we do something called human kinetics where we test the garments for, um, for human movement, right? We're making clothes for human beings. So it's not just gonna be on a mannequin. So can you move in it? Can you sit in it? Can you dance in it? So these are things that we test in a virtual environment and then physically as well uh, before the, the design is released. Thank you, Sana, for that. Uh, so Keithy, can you tell us uh, your experience with Okai and how has it evolved and your journey with it? Keithi, you're on mute right now. Great. So um, ever since I was a little girl, maybe around 13, I wanted to become a designer when I would grow up. My mother is a fashion designer as well. Um, I, she did her design when I was still in school. So I helped her with her homework and was homeschooled in fashion. Um, and so whatever she would do, I would understand the cuts and scenes and everything. 
but like all good Indian kids, when I grew up, I became a software engineer. Um, almost like basic education in our country, right? Um, I started working in tech for about four years. I was working there and I moved on to business and I was uh, on to a very corporate uh, path. And I think in 2015, uh, it so happened that Okai was not doing too well. I was like one of those, you know, nonprofit organizations that has some products, is trying to raise funds through selling those products, but the products are not good enough, um, which ends up not uh, creating a certain impact. So if in a social business, you're going to donate one lakh of rupees to 10 women, uh, you can either donate it to them and they are all going to get 10,000 rupees each, or you can create a whole sustainable fashion business and you can uh, pay designers and technology and raw materials and they are going to get 100 rupees each. So the idea was that we should create a social business that creates a lot more impact either in the short run or a slightly longer run for the women who generate or start their own businesses, right? So um, I traveled to the villages to look at it for a really short while. I'd volunteered almost to do a three month evaluation of the company. And when I traveled to the villages uh, and I saw um, what these women were making and what they were capable of, uh, I realized that this is what I wanted to do when I was 13 and I was finally getting the chance to do it. So I made a business plan, which was so similar to all my ideas when I was a kid. And now I was this adult presenting the same ideas to the board of Okai. And I think instantly everyone was like, why don't you take it up? And I had a very, uh, you know, ambitious corporate path. And for, I didn't even blink for a second. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And um, I think in the first one year, we grew by 50%. And every year we grew another 50 to 60%. Last year, we've grown by 60%. And now we are almost 10 times the revenue that we were five years ago. Uh, if you look at revenue terms, we will be the largest such organization in the country selling online right now. Uh, so from nothing to something is our story. And uh, it's just a full circle personally for me because that this is what I always wanted to do. And uh, it is a full circle for the organization because it has gone from um, just about 300 women to 24,000 women. And during the pandemic, uh, you know, we did not have to raise any funds for them to have a livelihood or food because they had savings for the last four years of working at Okai. Um, and not even a single person had to dig into their savings. So I think that is, uh, you know, what really keeps us going and motivated. Uh, sorry, we had a disruption there, but I think, uh, yeah. did you guys feel that disruption or was it just me? Uh, not me. All right, cool. So uh, thank you, Kirti, for that. It, it was a pleasure uh, understanding your uh, you know, experience with Okai and how you have built it up. Uh, Nitin, uh, can you just uh, now explain to us your journey with Coco Trade? And I understand it did not start what it is currently today. It has evolved a period of time. So can you just tell us your journey about that? So thanks. Thanks a lot, Rohit, first of all, for this opportunity. And it's it's absolute pleasure to be in the company of Kirti and Sana. Um, you know, obviously, uh, achieving a lot more than uh, we've probably achieved in the food space, but uh, it's very inspiring. I must start with that, you know. Um, but our journey has been uh, quite diverse. Uh, I, I find a lot of interest in talking about my story and I'll obviously keep it short to two minutes, though it's a very long one, because uh, like a lot of people in the chocolate industry world over, we do not have a chocolate background. Uh, in fact, we don't even have a culinary background. So for instance, I have uh, you know, I'm a, a business student. I've done my master's in retail business management from UK uh, and obviously has nothing to do with chocolate. But uh, the way it flowed into chocolate for us was uh, soon after the MS, uh, when I returned back to the country, which is 2005, uh, I got hired uh, by a consulting company, uh, which then got hired by Godridge, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Ardi Godridge himself uh, uh, for an initiative that they were starting off at that point of time. And I'm talking about... Uh, 2005, where organized retailing was not really spoken about too much. Um, the big corporates were talking about it in the boardrooms, but we had an opportunity uh, from Mr. Godridge to say, listen, um, 
while you conceive an idea about what should our roadmap be for the next 20 years in India, can you also have a team help us implement it? So we did a consulting project. We helped them implement the entire project. And uh, as a result of that, we have a, a store chain called Godridge Nature's Basket, which you know recently got sold out. But uh, that, I'm talking about 2005 and we were really setting it up. So in that process, uh, there was a little bit of a, a exposure towards fine chocolate. And the fact that you know, chocolate can be made in small scale and it need not be an industrial process or a bulk process. And there are huge differentiators that are possible. So one thing led to the other. We, we set up a couple of stores and then I moved away from the project because our project was limited to three stores opening. And um, then uh, I joined uh, uh, an IT company because uh, I believe that though I'm not a software engineer, there was a lot of contribution that has to be done from the business side. And a company called Cognizant, uh, you know, hired us and uh, I didn't know that I'm going to be living in the U.S. for the next three years when I got hired by them in India. Uh, so I uh, moved to the U.S. for three years and again, kept connected with chocolate very easily because, you know, traveling is easy there. Um, uh, a lot of uh, exposure to find foods exist. So in that process, kept connected. But I think the, the Eureka moment, right, for me was when I met, uh, when I came back to India and I decided I want to quit my corporate life and, and do something which I really want to do myself without really knowing what it was. Uh, I, I did a backpacking trip to Belgium for about uh, 20 days. And I met a gentleman who's now my mentor called Martin Christie uh, in the UK. And he was starting out a chocolate tasting course. Uh, so I realized, you know, uh, being in Cognizant, there was a lot of reverse engineering that happens in software. So I decided I want to follow the path and reverse engineer into chocolate. So the first thing was to obviously understand the final product, which I did. The course really helped a lot. Uh, and that happens to make me the first certified chocolate taster in the country. Uh, and I did this in 2014 in the UK. Um, and after which we developed our skills backwards uh, and we decided uh, we need to dive into understanding how chocolate is made at small scale. And then we now have a chocolate brand of our own. But answering your question, the chocolate brand did not start out being sustainable, but we take part in a... Um, chocolate show in Amsterdam every year. Annually, it happens in uh, uh, February, where in 2018, we realized that the need of the hour really, where everybody was talking in every panel discussion or a presentation was about sustainability in chocolate. So we said we have one year's time. In 2019, we got back to Chocoa and we presented to the world what the world's first zero waste and sustainable chocolate will look like. Uh, and of course, the one year has been a, a great effort where we've not used paper or plastic anywhere in the packaging uh, or in the production of chocolate. Um, and, and I think that that's how our journey, uh, you know, kind of detoured into becoming sustainable. But having said that, no regrets. I think we've, we've uh, been forced into the right direction. Thank you, Nitin, for that journey. Uh, so uh, I have the one question for Sana and then we'll throw it open the same question to the others. Uh, Sana, you're mentioning about the research and uh, based on your research and the Mobius trip, you have started a company, uh, you know, like your fashion designing and a lot of your, uh, a lot of your brand is uh, defined by your research, right, as such. So uh, how difficult is it to start a research based, uh, you know, enterprise or a startup and uh, what are the issues that you might face doing that? Um, I think when I started my research, I actually didn't have um, the business aspect of it you know, thought out. I was just doing my research to create something that I believed in and something that I was passionate to find an answer to. And when you do a research, there are there are usually, you know, you have multiple paths, multiple trajectories, multiple agendas to a research. Um, so you have one where you're proving an existing theory and another is a more innovation and development oriented research. So those are usually the ones that, that are a good fit for a business. So I knew that there was, um, there was a problem that I was solving with the work I was doing. And so that gave me you know, the impetus to work this out to, instead of just having it in the books as, as a research paper, it's not really gonna create an impact until I really put it out in the world. So I started understanding what was, uh, you know, what was the scope for this body of work that I had. And uh, I was at the same time being mentored by uh, a professor at the Royal College of Arts in London. And so that gave me a little bit of insight as to what is the worldview on this. 
and uh, to channel out how do you convert a research based concept into a business so there are broadly three things you should keep in mind the first being that is it solving a problem um the second is what is the scope of growth and by growth i don't mean the scale of your business i'm saying the scale of your concept how much can your concept grow is it something that you know you'll probably have today and it's just going to have a full stop at it or is it something that can you know go on to something else can push you on to a newer concept is there scope for growth within that concept itself and the third one would be is this commercially viable so if you if you are looking at a business it has to make business sense as well so for me the challenges were more about the business aspect of it because i didn't have a background in business so it became more of understanding what are you know studying the market so things that i didn't really think i would have to be doing i was doing them now and um, so yeah but you know you do understand that a lot of times people don't uh, aren't aware of what they want themselves until you actually put out a product for for them you know to solve that to solve that need so it was a lot of a lot of my research was also then directed towards understanding how do people react to a certain product so i did a bunch of uh, you know tests and exhibitions to figure out what is the pulse of the market and then i then i launched in a you know a larger bigger way um so yeah i mean i think it's important to start if you have an idea and if you have a concept that's so solid that it's then it is important to start off and then you will you will have to bring in um you know some sort of understanding it's a great it's a great thing to actually collaborate with someone who can guide you through that process of how to make it a business venture uh but yeah i think when i when i started i just had like this one thing in mind um it's a quote that i had read and i really think it makes uh you know a lot of impact so it's called you can edit a bad page but you can't edit a blank page so you got to start um so that's i would say that is that is the most important thing and the other thing that people usually don't talk about is your mindset uh being a researcher is very different from being a business person if you're a business owner you need to have a very different mindset um so i worked on something called subconscious reprogramming which i teach as well so this is completely to do with how do you train your train your mind to start thinking for success and these aren't things that you will really you know someone isn't going to come and tell you all this but you realize over time that it is so important to have that mindset i feel like most research based uh you know students people who are doing research researchers really don't have that mindset of i want to market this right we are very we are very like you know is this good enough right so i think that is very important to have that confidence and to reprogram your mind to think for um that scale of success as well right so so uh, kirti and nitin i understand that research has been part and parcel of your you know uh, your branding and marketing and we're running the company so uh, can you throw some light on you know how research has helped you in that aspect as well sure so the research that we are working with is actually thousands of years old right uh, craft uh, it's and there are 3000 over 3000 types of crafts in india and over 14000 sub categories of those crafts and everything is actually pretty well documented uh, by craft institutes that do a lot of research work including government bodies that do a lot of research work and craft documentation most of these are close to extinction because they've not been able to make a profitable business model out of that craft or it's dying because the patrons are no longer there because many years ago it was basically royalty that used to buy craft and now that we do not have that concept anymore and uh, the affluent people are buying uh, imported products the support that was there to something that was a lack worth of a shawl that was hand woven for a year is no longer present so the challenge we had was that you had these amazing pieces of research and history and uh, you had to make sure that there would be a sustainable uh, long term sort of market for it right 
And I think what we did, and maybe there is something to learn over there, is that we use design as our core um, skill to glamorize the product, right? Uh, something that was done only ever in red, blue, green, and yellow, which are the primary colors that artisans in rural India understand because they've never seen an onion pink. So we had to change all of that history to blend it with a very contemporary uh, outlook, silhouettes that would appeal to a modern audience, right? Um, so the first thing was definitely we had to glamorize all of that ancient uh, research that existed. Um, the second thing was to use it as a tool in marketing, right? Um, because when there are numbers and there, there is um, a novelty in a fact that you're sharing, uh, customers pay a lot of attention to it, right? So if there is bamboo fabric, that is something that's new to them. If they don't understand it and they don't understand what is the manufacturing process. And if you can add research numbers to how many liters of water it uses lesser than pure cotton, uh, you are backing your marketing with numbers. And that has a very powerful uh, impact on the customers. So I think that is something that has also helped us quite a lot. Um, when it comes to processes and embedding sustainability, uh, honestly, we tend to look for research uh, that has been done by others. Like, for example, we would at no point be somebody who is really fantastic at compostable packaging, right? So we looked at people who had done the research, planted uh, something in a package that had been used to deliver a product and then see if the tomatoes grow or not. Um, and so we obviously went with the company that uh, could provide us that kind of packaging. Um, but these are the ways in which we've used uh, research and sustainability. And I think it's an extremely powerful tool for a regular business, even if it's not based on research. Thank you. Uh, Nitin, you want to add your aspects to uh, the food aspect to this thing? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I must tell you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about uh, my background uh, while studying commerce and, uh, 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 sorry, just one. Sorry. Um, so, uh, I was saying, uh, just didn't want the phone to disturb us. Um, while, while doing commerce uh, in college, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not trying to... Uh, demean the education system, but research was just the least important aspect of, uh, you know, a commerce degree in India, uh, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, I was happy because I didn't have to do research because research always seemed like an uh, like a subject which, you know, uh, took a lot of pain, right, to, to even pass through. Uh, and I, I must be honest, I think there was a subject which I really struggled with in my third year. But I didn't know when I went to my MS course, research was all that I'm supposed to be doing, right? So that, that was a rude shock, a, a rude shock for me. And uh, I think a turning point also in my life because I realized that research only um, uh, can, can, can kind of drive innovation in many ways, right? That was the basis of any innovation, any progress that has to be made, whether it is business or not. Uh, and, and if I look at it now, everything that we do today, uh, and I'll take you through that chain in a bit, everything that we do today is data and research based. Uh, food and chocolate might seem simplistic, well, at the high level, maybe it is, but uh, if, if you want to move forward, if you want to go ahead, uh, the, the only way you can do that is if you dive deep into research and then data becomes very critical when you're diving deep into research, right? So for us at Cacao Trade, uh, we also run um, an institute where we teach people how to make chocolates. It's called Coco Shala and it's based in Chennai. Now, of course, we're online, but every day we're literally unlearning and learning something new. Uh, and, and the chocolate business itself is, is quite interesting because uh, what we end up doing is we work with farmers at the farm, at the cocoa farm. So there's research being done at the farm when it comes to post-harvesting, maintaining temperatures of every fermentation batch, maintaining drying temperatures, and then correlating each of them to find out what the impact of that is on flavor. And when that comes to us, then there's this whole science of roasting where you roast beans to get the best flavor out. Uh, again, there's a lot of research that goes into it. Uh, also, because we're dealing with an agricultural product, which, you know, changes from season to season, batch to batch, and, and those variations exist. Uh, and then we have to tie it up with the final flavor pairing, um, which has to be done at the end, you know, which is when you're making or processing the chocolate. So in the process, I think we have we've completely deep dived into research. And when I sit back, sometimes I'm like, 
listen are we a research company or are we chocolate company you know because uh, that's the kind of um, uh, discoveries we make every day uh, and i think it's never enough uh, fortunately for us we didn't come with a baggage so maybe that that is um, uh, you know something that is uh, working well for us but in the process we've also you know conceptualized and developed a model which is called the cocotrade product development model which we now deploy for our clients where we are looking at science in a way so flavor molecules that exist in cacao and this new flavor that you're supposed to be pairing it with what are the matches what are the things that don't match together and stuff so that that one um, part of it is kind of monetized you know other than making a product and selling a product um but otherwise i think uh, you know we are, we are now very close to calling ourselves a research company more than a chocolate company and we now feel that because you have the approach now chocolate is just uh you know just happens to be a product now we could apply this research and this approach to a lot of food products uh, and maybe achieve a little bit uh, uh you know success even there uh and, and i think the the most important part for us while marketing this research that we do is we tell people that listen uh, uh, as as a brand today we've saved 150 kgs of single use plastic from entering landfills you know to us that i think is our measure of success whether it's internally or whether it's talking to anybody else about it but i think all of that is only possible because it was research led and research oriented um and i think i can't speak uh, you know enough about how important those aspects are and how we've been benefited by that approach which i had no clue would would turn out this way when we started off right uh, so thank you nitin for that uh, i have a general question for anybody who wants to pick it up uh, uh, and you know as uh, sana mentioned that uh, being from a research and an academic background we don't always put on a management hat or a business hat and try to see from various perspectives but you guys have you know successfully uh, wore a lot of hats at the same time and have tried to run a business as you know grounded in research so how difficult has been to manage it like all of you have done different things about you know like different hats have you want so how difficult is it or uh, you know uh, where does the focus go when you're wearing one hat or another hat how do you merge these two together so uh, if somebody can you know put some light on that i could go if 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 i have a chance to talk before yeah, the yeah. go ahead go ahead nitin yeah so um you know I, this word difficult right to me scares me because that's how i used to approach things when we started out and i and i reached nowhere to be very honest um if if we think anything is difficult it ends up being difficult you know unfortunately that's how it works for us so we have a very casual approach towards any large problem um and i think when i say casual approach i mean uh, an approach which is not which is not kind of stressing you out you know so we say listen there's a problem uh, of course there's a problem and that has to be solved so let's look at uh, it in a in a very different way but lead it by research lead it by data you know if you're approaching it by data i think there is no problem that is difficult to solve and then then that's only a mental uh, state of mind you know because things get so clear with some research that you've done and with some data that leads you to some conclusions that no problem is difficult that, that's what we've seen and you know 5 years ago i would not have spoken the way i'm doing now uh, and i think it's just a personal experience you know that's why i can say that with so much of conviction so i, I think nothing is difficult uh, if you don't want it to be. okay thank you sana you wanted to say something Yes so a lot of times we get carried away in the process of researching something right where you don't realize you know how much is enough where do i put a break on this and actually start to convert this into a product which i can then put out in a mark in the market right so i follow something called a divergent to convergent approach which is very helpful for anyone who is listening in this is a great tool that you can use So when you start up on a concept, whatever it is that you are researching on, have a completely divergent approach, where you are researching every possible aspect of it. From what you have, you do you do something called a mind map, right? So you do a lot of various uh, permutations and combinations, test out all of that, and then start converging into the things that you know okay are sitting well right now in this frame. and freeze in on that and hit a hit a full stop for that moment you know like for that phase you need to stop there and then you need to start working on product development after that uh after you have done that once you have a product once you've tested it once it's out and all of that it's now time to jump to the next thing so there's something that we call jumping to the next curve so before what you have made becomes obsolete in the market you need to start working on the next better idea 
so that's that's where you need to sort of compartmentalize what you need to do at what point of time in that uh, you know in that frame of what you're making um so yeah that's just a helpful tip that i had to share uh, and another good thing is that i'm a designer uh, i did 4 years of fashion design and uh, i'm a i'm a ba honors i didn't study any further i just kept researching i don't think uh, education is i don't need a degree to do what i want to do i don't believe in that um so what i did was i took a concept in physics i still i still study physics for fun and um, i know that i may not have the kind of knowledge that you know iitians have obviously but no one you know around me ever thought that you know let's merge physics to fashion right i mean it's just people think that what have they got to do with each other and that's so that's so wrong everything in our world is interconnected so research can can do those wonders they can it can connect those dots and it can create something new so what i would suggest is start looking at interdisciplinary concepts because they are so fun to research that's where the fun comes in so yeah i mean i i really encourage anyone who's trying to do something different it's it's a really it really makes good business sense as well to be doing that because you're catering to two different or three four different um you know um uh, subjects or areas of um study so yeah that makes a lot of business sense as well so rohit to the part of your question about wearing many hats i think i, I want to answer that bit because that makes uh that may be valuable to some people listening in so uh when the company is small you end up doing a lot of everything you're doing the marketing you're in the photographs you're also taking the photographs it's almost everything um but now as uh, okay is much larger uh what really helps me divide my time is to schedule it across the year across the month and across the week um so having a theme for a month like for example uh, april is raw materials for us right so we will plan our raw material for the entire year and that means that team has my undivided attention um and i know that i don't have to sell i don't have to market too much uh, i'm not even doing many panels this month uh so we only focus on fabric uh when it comes to weekdays uh we know that monday is long term strategy and revising and course correcting that strategy and uh, we know that tuesday is again uh, artisan groups right so focus on the artisans and question everything on the, on that so uh friday is customers right so we listen in and we talk about our customers when you set the themes and uh, structure your calendar according to your business themes it may sound really small and trivial but many companies don't do this very well largest companies i worked with don't do this very well and that tends to divert the leadership uh, attention in many different places and this just puts in a method to the madness and helps you have equal time and wear each hat interesting thank you for the insight keethi uh, so my next question also is directed to keethi but uh, we will open it up to the other panelists as well uh, so keethi as you said you know uh, you are using a uh, research as a tool for marketing and everything uh, but also what uh, the general perspective is you know that research is not visible you know it is in the background but the end thing is what you see but the research that goes behind it is not something that is uh, you know pretty evident uh, how do you uh, you know uh, does that make the entire thing worth the effort to produce the last thing or do you like integrate research or something in the products itself uh, which you know which you can share right so uh, i'll take an example of indigo uh, it's a natural dye and it is used to dye blue colored fabric um there is a lot of a ton of research on different types of indigos and different techniques of printing using it, using indigo so when we are at a design stage we are obviously using all of that research when we go into a garment stage uh, uh, we're probably it's the textile bit of research is on the back burner but when we go on to selling it um when we do the shoots and how we name the collection and how we write the product descriptions these are small things that use that content again 
um, something as simple as posting an Instagram story and making sure that right next to your indigo dress is the tank of indigo. And you should be able to tell people that this tank has been alive for a hundred years. And that that pot of indigo has passed down from generation after generation in a city called Jaipur and where they are placed and how they uh, brought this indigo from a village close by. Um, I think those stories um, will share the research in a very different format and storytelling in marketing is way too powerful and visuals are way too powerful. If I just wrote this content and did not share images, people will probably not consume it. So it's also very important to make sure that all of that research has a visual element to it and a human element to it. It doesn't require me to tell anyone the artisan's story while I'm talking about indigo, but they will pay attention to that story and also consume the indigo uh, research. Right, uh, so uh, any of the other panelists, Nitin, Sana, you want to add your uh, opinions to this thing? Yeah, so I completely agree with, you know, what Kirti has been talking about, because that's a huge part of what we do as well. So every, every tag that goes out carries the name of the maker, because in, in the fashion business, it's a lot of glamour and a lot less about the process. So informing people about that process acts as both a marketing, uh, you know, really good marketing strategy, but you're also really doing good, right? You're giving uh, due credit to the people who are involved. So that makes for a great uh, marketing strategy. As well, Another thing that I wanted to point out is that you can be really smart about how you're telling your story. So when you do have a research in hand, you can, you can magnify that and you can break it up into a lot of pieces where you can name each of them as individual concepts as well. So with planar flux, we had one aspect of it where the design itself was zero waste. And the other aspect was that we were now testing this for human kinetics. We were doing a bunch of other things. Now we have something with, that we're working on, which is a JIT manufacturing system, which is a just-in-time manufacturing system, right? So these are things that were offshoots of that original concept and they become really great stories on their own as well. So we, we named our research and development wing HI, it's called human intelligence. Okay, and the reason it's called HI is also because the main cut that we make on a fab on the fabric is in the shape of an H and I. So you can use you can use what you already have, and you can spin it up in a really you know fascinating, interesting way to tell a story that that gets the person you know curious that I want to know more about this. So marketing is all about how much of that curiosity can you create, and how much can you keep them engaged to keep coming back to you. So, you know, our experience over the last few years has been people don't buy products, you know, they buy stories before they buy the product. So for us, um, though we've not been hugely successful in um, showcasing our stories, uh, you know, the way Sana or, or Kiti has been, has been talking about, and I think that's an area for improvement for us, but what we are convinced about is that definitely people buy, uh, you know, stories before the product. Now, maybe the resale doesn't happen uh, or the guy doesn't come back uh, for the next time, but uh, for, for most brands to survive, the first sale is very critical, right? So the storytelling has to be uh, an integral part of the entire uh, uh, equation. Uh, and one of the earlier things Sana had mentioned, uh, I think uh, one or two conversations earlier was um, uh, in different words maybe, but what it meant uh, to us and something we believe in is supply drives demand. You know, and sometimes you have a great story, it's fantastic, uh, you know, it, it works. But the fact is just because the product now exists in front of the customer, uh, he's going to buy it. So I think we have to bring both together. And uh, when it comes to what we've done a little bit about, uh, you know, researching and then tailoring a story based on the, the insights that we got from the research is we've just recently come up with a, a Madras collection and a Spice collection. Uh, the Madras collection, Sana has been a part of as well. Uh, where we realize that people, when they buy chocolates, which are very, which is a very impulsive product, also need more reasons to choose your product over the other. You know, price not always uh, is the driver. In traditional marketing sense, you know, maybe price is always very critical. But uh, in in the business we are in, price is not always the driver. Uh, there are other things that you have to associate, and all of that came out of research. 
uh, and i think putting that research into marketing uh, you know has been the way and i think it will be the way for most corporates or startups as they go along so uh, rohit if i may add to this uh, conversation i think there is a point to note that these two are very good researchers who are good marketers right and a lot of people watching this may also feel that if if they have a great research piece or a product and they're not able to take it to market i think a great way is to find a marketing co-founder because uh, if they are convinced of your research uh, that team will be a match made in heaven um, i think uh, and they are always looking out for such opportunities and it's so difficult to find uh, two people who would have complementary skills uh, but this would mean a lot if they can find one right that that absolutely makes a lot of sense kirti uh, so that is what brings me to my next question uh, uh, and you know we'll start with kirti you said that you know your april month is raw material month and then you have designed it that way so uh, i am coming to the point of supply chain uh, in the supply chain you know uh, uh, for you it might be where, what kind of a raw material uh, for you know nitin it might be what kind of a cocoa beans and stuff and you know sana it might be where to get the source of the fabrics uh, how how do you is there any research involved in that and if it is there you know how how does it streamline with the process of uh, the final product and how important is it for that thing so it may seem so simple to make a dress right but there is so much research that goes on to selecting a fabric for a certain type of dress you know uh, there's literally a science behind it um and every single seam every single weave uh your garment is going to fall completely differently right and uh, people who work in this field are experts of it you know including master jis who are like pros at really understanding every single seam that we don't even understand um so definitely i think it starts at textile uh everything starts at textile for us uh but sometimes it can start at a garment level and then you look for the textile for it or you design the textile for that particular fabric um of course you're going to make sure that uh in the supply chain uh there are many other nicks and nacks that go into the garment and you know as we try to build sustainability in those things as well so for example we just stopped using plastic buttons and we started using coconut buttons or metal buttons or we're trying to avoid zips because they are plastic or we're trying to avoid elastic because that's plastic and that prevents you from actually recycling your um, product and there is no other alternative so uh, you cannot buy plastic free undergarments in india because it has to have plastic and there are so many people who are trying to find a solution to this problem and there isn't one so if anybody wants to research this it's a huge huge scope for a market that's there and for a solution that doesn't exist once we of course cross uh, you know the construction and the sampling stage uh, production itself requires you to understand uh, you know really how you should produce it should it be a um, you know a, a line or should it be one garment per person because there are certain garments if they are made fully by one person they will turn out a lot better but there are some daily wear garments you know pants and shirts for example men's shirts men's shirts turn out very well because there is a, a tailoring unit that has specialization one person is very good at making the collar and the other person is really good at uh, putting the buttons but that doesn't work for ties or that doesn't work for pants or that doesn't work for a different kind of garment um so there is immense amount of knowledge i wouldn't even call it research i think it's just knowledge in the industry um that's there but the main research that is being done is actually embedding technology in fashion which is far from there because there are far few people even looking at it seriously uh like sana said people are still using the same techniques that were used hundreds of years ago to still make garments and i think that uh, particular gap is there in our supply chain there are no softwares to manage your inventory i'm telling you the largest organizations are still using excel sheets at having 5000 skus when you have 5000 products i have seen companies still using excel sheets 
because it's a complicated process. If it's just data, you will not understand. You need to have the photograph. Some, some uh, solutions will give you very good visual tools, and some will give you very good uh, Excel uh, formats, and you cannot club the two. So designers are still using uh, uh, you know, normal PowerPoint presentations and Excel sheets to manage their business. It's that limited. Uh, and so hence, I think there are uh, huge amounts of gaps while there are certain researches on e commerce front. Uh, I think there has been a lot of work that has been done by the giants, and hence, uh, you know, something as simple as making sure that CODs are not returned from the door or uh, your packaging can be reused or your especially your internal business packaging can be reused. I think these are processes that. Uh, on the e-com front are quite advanced, especially understanding consu consumer data. Mintra, for example, does not have designers anymore because they know that red is selling really well and v-neck is selling really well. So they just make a red v-neck t-shirt and that's it. And they make like crores of crores of rupees just by making that t-shirt. So there are many companies that are actually uh, only studying consumer data and behavior and designing according to that. We do a lot of that as well because we study our own data very actively and uh, design for the customer rather than designing for ourselves. Um, but um, I think it does uh, limit the, the, the possibilities of uh, design. Uh, Sana, you want to go ahead and then we'll come to Nitin? Yes, of course. So I think what's different in you know, the, the kind of processes that Okai has is, and what I do is basically to do with the process of design. So in so what Okai follows is what the traditional norms are, okay? And they work fantastically well, which is why Okai is doing so well as well. Now, what I do is a very risk, risky affair because I don't design the product, I design the process. So I don't even know when I'm making a new when I'm making a new piece or I'm researching something and I'm developing a new um, piece as such. So every planar flux garment is an original. There's no such thing in the world before. So how do you create an original piece? How do you keep creating original pieces, right? So that's where the challenge is for me. How much time can I devote to just that process of developing newer products uh, and managing the business aspect as well? So what we do is. In a typical design uh, firm, you have uh, you know designers who will create sketches or uh, you know tech packs is what we call them about what is what's your silhouette going to look like, and then you either already have your textile ready, or you then you know get a source of textile that's perfectly going to match that design. So they know the end product before it's even going to be made. With my methods. I don't know what the end product is when I'm creating something new. So I design sort of the foundations or the patterns as we call it. And so it's more like, um, it's more like magic. If it comes out, it comes out really great. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I think the challenge for me has always been that, that how do you create a successful piece every time? So when you are designing the foundation, so let me put it in a perspective that you can understand. So let's say, you know, like in architecture, you have blueprints, right? You have, you have basically the blueprints of the building. Um, so typical design processes in fashion will design the outer look of the building, not the blueprint, okay? I design the blueprints. Okay, so I'm designing a new process every time that a, new, a new product is made. So from there, we move on to, okay, now we have this product and now how do we get the right fabric for it? So we don't create our own materials, we source them. And it has been a big challenge to, you know, because we are not making things at a mass production scale. So sourcing fabrics is a very, very big roadblock for us because we don't want to source tons and tons of material. Um, you know, so, so it becomes quite difficult to especially source sustainable options. Um, but yeah, we have, you know, found uh, partners now and uh, we're getting like GRS, which is global recycled standard materials. We're getting a lot of uh, GOTS cotton, things like that. So there, there is, it's more like, you know, when you are in that box of 
this is my constraint and I need to work with it. You kind of come up with innovative ways to figure it out as well. So as much as it is hard and it is tough, it's also, you know, you know, in your, in your back, in the back of your mind, you know, that I'm going to figure this out in a really um, interesting way. So for, for most part of any business, which is research-based, it is going to be about how feasible is it to convert it into a product? Okay. And how am I going to source the raw material, everything, you know, the entire supply chain coming together is what becomes a big challenge. So it is more of a hit and trial. You've got to keep working at it to figure it out. And it's a really good, it's a really good thing to co-create. So if you don't, if you're not doing it just by yourself, if you have someone that you're doing it with, who's handling a certain part of, of the work, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, Nitin, you want to add your perspective to this? Yeah. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, research, I think forms a basis of, of a lot of what we do also, but we are in a very interesting uh, supply chain, uh, uh, you know, scenario where, uh, the beginning of the chain, which is at the farm for us with, with the cocoa farmers, has very little research done. So the amount of the inordinate amount of time we spend on doing that research, which also is seasonal, uh, uh, you know, and, and for now, for just for information, now is cocoa season. So uh, the four or five months of, of this time of the year is a lot of research being done at that stage. And then when the beans are ready to make chocolate, you know, through the year, uh, that part research is already kind of established because chocolate making as a science has been researched for several years. So uh, we, are, we are in a situation where the first half needs a lot of research, but the mid portion of our processing, you know, uh, we rely on a lot of research that has already been done. Uh, and there's very little scope to improve there because a lot has been done already. But the final part, which is ensuring that the consumer gets the product in the right shape, you know, and at the, at the right uh, 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 face of, of the of the purchase is where again a lot of research needs to happen so we focusing on the two sides two ends of the research uh, where we work with farmers um, again very very rewarding uh, but there have been challenges like you know how do you get uh, hardware to couple with firmware and software to work together and you monitoring things remotely uh, this year has been phenomenal for us uh, i'm on this call where we, we, i'm in chennai where there is the farms in uh, you know, Andhra and uh, Karnataka, for instance, uh, have OTT-based, IoT-based uh, uh, devices uh, installed. And I'm, be, I'm able to monitor stuff from here. So a lot of research there was a challenge until now, but I think this year has been a, a quantum leap for us, um, where we're able to outsource a little bit of that technology at the farm to the farmer, so that we can just look at the data and make some decisions from here remotely. Um, the interesting part is the final part where uh, not just making the product sustainable, but also the, the physical supply chain of reaching the product to the customer uh, had to be researched. And that's our goal for this season. In fact, as we talk again, uh, because we are here in our home base, we're able to do that research. Uh, we've actually coincidentally tied up with a company uh, which has been incubated by IIT Madras uh, that helps us insulating uh, you know, our, our, our chocolates before it reaches. So they have expertise in various um, uh, other products like medicines, critical care medicines and stuff, but uh, and even life-saving medicines, but chocolate is a little different game to their, for them. So the way uh, we are working it out is we have sensors installed inside the boxes and we recreate a blue dart shipment, for example, right? And we use that data, which we are monitoring constantly live real-time basis to see how the moisture and the temperature inside the box has uh, reacted you know to the situation while it's being delivered to the uh, to the customer so i think uh, challenges are perhaps there but one learning which i feel and i've seen little amount of success with that approach is that we shouldn't expect research to to solve a problem overnight and this is a little bit of uh, uh, you know both sana and keethi talking as well where it is a process and research itself shouldn't be looked at as a, as a magic wand to solve all your problems and what we realized in the last five years is most times uh, for us, research tells us what not to do rather than what to do. You know, and that's very valuable. That's very valuable because you're saving uh, amazing amount of very, very precious time, effort and money by not doing certain things which might not get you anywhere. Uh, and then focusing on, you know, things that uh, probably are going to be more useful. Uh, but um, research, again, when you marry it with business, you always have to choose, right? Saying, 
are you a research company are you a company that's out there to make money and uh, make use of the research so somewhere i think uh, the challenge is overall uh, how to marry both and make sure that you're profitable as a business going forward but uh, in, in i mean obviously a very interesting phase yeah so uh, that brings to my last question and i i'll throw this to sana and then we'll open it up to the others uh when you go for funding for any company right uh, it is more like the vision of the company right uh, when when you are projecting your vision as a sustainable and a brand and a research oriented brand do you say that you know i am a research company or do you say that you know i am a sustainable company or do you say that you know i am a new age company like what how do you get the funding for these sort of a company and what are the challenges you would face when you go for uh, you know funding a research based uh, company firstly i think every you know we've seen we are three different business owners here and we all have research as an intrinsic part and i feel like every every business out there does research whether they know it consciously or not they are doing research you have to base your next product on something right so you already have research you are doing it you may not be aware of it so what we do is we project ourselves as an innovation led company which is creating innovation with high sustainability index so that encompasses all these aspects that we already want to talk about and i think there is this huge um misconception with uh with research which is uh, you need to have a lot of money to do it uh i don't think that's true i didn't do it that way uh my research right now is at a stage where i will be taking it for funding for like you know investors but i didn't start that way i didn't need, you can decide what kind of research you need to do okay so i feel like you can have 10000 rupees or you can have 10 million okay so that's completely up to how do you want to structure it what is it that you want to make so i created a technique of design and i really didn't need any external support to do that i just needed a pair of scissors and uh, fabric so it's a, it can be as simple as that you can make it as simple as that test out everything before you are actually going to a level of um, getting external funding so i wouldn't I, i would say that till you have done enough research on the possibilities of this going wrong keep it to yourself keep it something that you are funding yourself and it makes your business more robust and more polished before you can put it out there so another thing that like like i mentioned in you know in the bio that you were reading out also i always say that there are two things in the world that are the universal truth these two things exist in all existence that's design and science right so this is in everything all around us in in the dna structures in you know the way that larger uh, smaller masses orbit larger masses everything right but in our world there is a third concept and that's money so it's a very important part of uh, whatever research you're doing needs to make monetary sense um so now i'll give you a very simple example of the of a challenge because we were having that conversation earlier the pandemic was a huge challenge right and as a research based brand as, as people who are making innovative garments you already know that you are catering to a niche okay and now when you're hit with something like a pandemic you have you have no um you know your fabrics aren't going to come in there's no supply right you don't have obviously you're not going to be able to cater to orders as well and what do you do in a phase like that right so i didn't want to just shut down my business because you know that that's not what i was here for so i came up with that with this concept of upcycling it's zero zero raw material cost for me because people donated their sarees so we took sarees that people had and were not using they were in perfectly good shape but were just not being used so think of you know grandmothers and uh, you know mothers who who been have who been collecting and having these beautiful sarees and they're just lying in a trunk so we started sourcing them and we had zero raw material cost because it was a sari and we and we didn't want to invest in the whole system of creating patterns for these garments because that's that's another investment that goes in that's a lot of uh, brain work that goes into it so we came up with this really artistic way of doing it where i would do this myself i still do so i turn on a piece of music that i feel relates to that sari 
and I cut without any drawing on the on the garment. There's nothing. It's just the scissor and the fabric that are having their conversation, and I'm just the enabler. And it may seem really random, but there is no such thing as randomness, is what I have discovered through this process. They we had such beautiful garments coming out of these pieces, and we had once things opened up, we had so much demand for these products. We had people from San Francisco buying them, and it was so exciting to see that you know it's getting a new life. Firstly, and you just crafted something out of someone's you know something that was lying in someone's trunk, just unused. So research can also you know your your concepts can also be innovative based on the circumstances that you're in and that several times pushes you to do things that you probably never thought you would yeah so uh kithi uh, can we go ahead next uh, and add on to that question is you know uh, having a parent uh, support uh, having a parent corporate supporting or something how does that make it a different thing or you know has uh, being in the top 130 uh, women uh, Uh, has that helped in the funding part, or you know, any marketing part, or stuff like that? So uh, I'll start with uh, saying that when you decide to get an investor for your business, it's like hiring a boss, and um, you you know what kind of person you want, right? Um, and I think that's such a critical part of your that person is going to become a critical part of your life and your business, and their vision is going to be a critical part of your business. um it's really important to match ethos right what is your vision and ethos because honestly as of now there is plenty of uh, funding in the market right because everyone has realized um how well investors have done in the last few years and everyone wants to invest in startups as opposed to investing in the stock market so uh in that scenario you do have a choice you do have uh, the ability to select a investor who is very aligned with you and your company's ethos now having said that okha is a non profit organization which means that uh it can attract csr funds right so either corporate funds or uh, somebody who is a um, you know a impact investor who is not looking for a return on investment but is really looking at impact numbers so here they don't care about what product you make as long as the artisans make a certain amount of money every year and the number of artisans you impact right that's the ethos of a impact investor or a csr of a corporate right uh now of course a large part of the responsibility is taken care of if you have somebody who is uh, promised to be with you for a long run right and uh, you don't have to go out there in the market every single 6 months and look for investors and a large part of it is also taken care of if you have if you're a customer funded organization which okhai tended to be right because from day one we were selling like hot cakes uh, so our regular business is taken care of from that part right and if we do need to set up something new for the future we will require extern external investment so that balance is also really important that at least your ops is running and it's going to run through your cash flow and how your cash flow can also be structured is very important right what kind of working capital is required in your business how fast is your turnover because the faster that is uh, the lesser external investment you are going to require and as far i mean as far as everyone is concerned i think people are very clear they do it when they uh, are really ready for that market and they need extra funds to change either consumer behavior in those cases you have to like an uber would have not been able to change the way we actually use uh, cabs had there not been uh an external investment or a zomato or a swiggy these companies had to change consumer behaviors uh and that requires immense amount of marketing so uh i think that's really broadly what i want to say uh is that uh you can look at all of these five six elements to decide who you want and if you can find someone long term 
uh, that is very meaningful and always be on the lookout. You know, uh, you may meet someone who you may not invest in you right now, but, uh, you know, they'll observe you for a few years and three years down the line, maybe they are the person to invest. Uh, so, Nitin? Right. So, um, you know, I, I must start with saying I'm normally uh, a very and an eternally positive person, right? But uh, when it comes to investment uh, and my experiences, uh, especially in the Indian market, and I must say, unfortunately, we're in India having this conversation and doing our business. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different um, scenario here because an investor, of course, brings in money. That's the first thing he needs to bring in to be even, even qualify, being qualified as an investor, right? So he brings in money, but he doesn't bring anything else usually, uh, which could uh, uh, help your business move to the next level. Um, Akirti just mentioned, you know, uh, wait and find the right person kind of thing. But what happens is, uh, and, and you call it um, a boss, right? It's almost like hiring a, bo a boss, but I look at it slightly differently. I say it's almost like a marriage, you know? So you have to live through that relationship with, um, a, you know, one obviously dominating over the other in this case. Uh, but in a country like India, what we've seen is there is no specific fund that would focus its monies uh, and I'm happy to be proved wrong, uh, that would be focusing its monies on investing only in research-based organizations. There, there is no dedicated fund. Now, every investor, you know, might, might have some investments, but, but that focus dedication is not there. And, and, and until that happens, uh, businesses that are research-based will never be valued. And the basic principle of research is you go by number. I mean, the basic principle of investment is you go by numbers, right? So if it's a research-based organization, what are those numbers? You can show impact areas. You can you can have case studies, use cases to to prove a lot of things. But eventually, the one crore that gets invested needs to become five crores for the investor, right? Now that is going to be a challenge, um, uh, as Keithy said, and uh, even Sana and myself, we are all in the consumer-facing business. Fortunately, where there is a funding that happens by the consumer, it becomes slightly easier. Life becomes easier when that is the case. But otherwise, I think in this space. Um, Funding is, is even today, I would say, a problem in India. And I don't look at too many things as problems, to be honest. Uh, but I think I am forced to call this a problem, you know, because it's a chicken and egg. And I don't think uh, if we were having this conversation in San Francisco, it would have been very different. Because you have people betting on technology, betting on the future, betting on research-based businesses quite a lot uh, uh, more easily, I guess, over there than, than it happens here. So here it's very difficult to convince an investor saying, listen, I'm research based. I have certain things to prove to you, but listen, I need your money so that, uh, you know, with my existing business, I'm going to make it 5x. I think, I think it's very difficult as of today. And I hope somebody is listening to this, um, you know, who could change things. But certainly for me, I'm at the receiving end, uh, you know, at this stage. And I might sound very negative or slightly negative uh, uh, as far as this topic is concerned. So, uh, so that was all the questions I had uh, prepared for the panelists. I have only one last thing to ask you. And uh, if possible, we can take a few questions from the audience as well. Uh, so the final thing is, uh, where do you see this sustainability and this research oriented, uh, you know, the ent entire uh, businesses going in the future? Like, do you think uh, it is like a marketing gimmick right now because everybody is talking about climate change and it will go on to something else later on, or is it something that, you know, uh, is there to stay? And how is your brand or company is going to be there in the next five years? I don't mind taking this first because it's, it's kind of fresh in my mind. Okay. So, so I don't think it's a fad. Uh, you know, normally it's a fad if it is some few businesses or brands coming up and, and showing or supplying something to the market. And then maybe it's being driven by that trend, you know, where they're putting in marketing monies and advertising monies to influence consumers. But I think sustainability and, and more, so, more so because of the pandemic, I think, has found the right voices. Now, imagine small things like the prime minister talking about sustainability and the need to be either Atmanirbhar or being local about vocal. You know, all of that has a, has a thread to sustainability also. You know, you want to be Atmanirbhar because it's more sustainable. You want to be vocal about local because that drives sustainability to, to an extent. So I think when the, when the voices come from that level, it's more than a fad. Uh, and we've seen it in our business that, you know, um, consumers are becoming aware. 
so it's now not a situation where businesses are spending marketing money and trying to create a demand that demand is is being uh, kind of uh, kind of um, how do i put it i mean consumers are warming up to the fact that they need to look further it can't be pretty looking packaging all the time you know i would still perhaps make more than half my decision based on a pretty looking packaging on a shelf but there are enough consumers now to make serious sense in business who look beyond that you know and i think pandemic has driven it so maybe a silver lining to the pandemic is that but um, more than just the pandemic it's the right voices at the right time uh, which I, i think is is making sure that it's not a fad anymore so when you talk sustainability to an audience they're not laughing about it you know five years down the line uh, five years before they, before today they were laughing about it when you said you want to create a brand that is sustainable want to save plastic like why are you doing this you know what is the need the investor would ask you what is the business need to do because the consumer doesn't want it so why are you creating the supply you know so but today i think things have changed pandemic the prime minister you could credit so many things the fact is i don't think it's it's go it's it's a fad and i think it's there to stay so we have enough a reason to think we'll be in this business for more than a few decades uh do other panelists want to take anything up with this thing so do you want to go 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 you, you go ahead yeah. okay um so when uh, sustainability started becoming mainstream um and a lot of small businesses very easily adapted to it because it almost seemed natural um to them especially because they were small businesses it's easier large companies and i mean billion dollar companies uh, also realized that sustainability on their strategy decks was the number one trend um so what started to happen was that everyone started to create very quick solutions to sustainability in the large organizations which very evidently started looking like greenwashing and so right now what we have is a whole lot of small organizations very sustainable very honest uh some large initiatives which are very honest and some large organizations which are uh heavily involved in greenwashing and trying to imitate what the small organizations are doing um but i do see hope that this is uh, almost like a first run by those large organizations and many of them will be able to in the due course of time change their supply chain to actually become sustainable um and what they are marketing to be actually true so i do see that this will become the way of doing business um it honestly was the way of doing business uh it just uh, we lost track trying to be uh, profitable and i think lost track of the planet but uh, it is going to be the way people do business in future as far as oka is concerned i think uh, definitely our um, first promise is to the artisans and uh, we want to impact a lack of artisans uh, in the next few years um, less than 3 years maybe um and we want to make sure that we do it sustainably which means that it doesn't come at the cost of uh, the planet sana you want to go ahead yeah. yes um so to pick up on you know where keeti left um in our world today i would say sustainability has been catching up initially as a trend because it's it's now become fashionable it's in vogue okay i started my research 6 years ago i'm 27 today i was 21 when i started doing this work and i had no clue what sustainability was uh so now i'm armed with that knowledge so i understand what what it truly means but i also understand that there are way too many challenges and that's because of the way that our world is structured and that has a lot to do with um with the affordability of sustainable goods okay so a lot of people i have been on a lot of panels and a lot of conversations and a lot of people ask me this question but i can't afford it you know what do i do so i have to be unsustainable because i can't afford sustainable products and that is the bitter truth it is a lot expensive to create those garments because of how much thought and how much um, you know how much effort goes into them 
but also because the way that these textiles are procured, farmed, all of that is going to be a lot more expensive, right? So what is the, how are we going to solve this problem? Um, there's a book that I would suggest everyone to read. It's called Oxygen Manifesto. It's by an Indian IAS officer, Atulia Mishra. So read that book because that, book's, that book answers this so brilliantly. It's, it's majorly about how we need to overhaul our taxation policies, legislature, because till we do that, this is this is sweet talk that we can keep having, but it's not really going to change anything at a big, massive level in the in the long run. Because you're still going to have organizations like H and M, which is a fast fashion brand, which is going to keep claiming that it's getting sustainable, while they are absolutely not. Um, so another thing that I do want to point out is um, is basically to do with why. Why are sustainable? Why this whole conversation of sustainability right now? It has, it is catching up just as, um, I mean, it's not going to die out. But if we don't have enough people asking those questions and asking not about, uh, you know, just that why is this sustainable? So I think it's a, it's a really sad thing that we need to put on our tags things like this was made fairly and ethically. I think that's really sad. Why should anything need to be tagged that? Isn't it understood that it should be made fairly and honestly, right? It, I think that we need to start having labels for this was not made ethically. That will change the system. I feel like that should that should become a policy. We, we need to put this out in legislature and policy that if you're not making it a certain way, you need to put it out there for the consumer to know. Um, I think that no one wants to buy something and carry guilt with them. And that will change the way that we purchase. Instead of just having something that says it's, it's made really well, you need to have things saying that, no, this was not made really well. Do you still want to buy this? So uh, thank you, uh, all the panelists. Uh, those were the questions from my side. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. We will try to wrap it up by 3.30. Uh, the questions are general in nature, so anybody who wants to take it up can take it. Uh, so first question was, uh, when we say sustainability, everybody connects it with, you know, carbon footprints and stuff like that. So uh, when you're doing a lot of this research, do you keep a track of how much of a carbon footprint have you reduced or, you know, uh, or do you keep a track, you know, like this is the saving that I've had from a carbon footprint point of view. Uh, the second question which we have is related to this thing. Uh, it is the impact on the society, like when you're having a sustainable supply chain. So how have you, how has that sustainability impacted the, you know, the increase in the uh, revenue for all the women in the village or in the, you know, the cocoa production? Uh, do you, do you check those uh, statistics or do you check those numbers and see whether your sustainability actually has impacted at the multiple level? Thing? So I would be happy to take any, um, any, any panelists. Okay, so sustainability as a concept seems very like, you know, overwhelming that there's too much going on in this. Um, so it's basically just consciousness. You know, are you conscious about what you're doing? Whether you are purchasing or whether you're manufacturing, are you conscious about what you're doing? Are you aware that this is having an impact elsewhere too? Uh, and I think any good business is when you can ask yourself this question that am I able to positively impact someone that I don't even know yet? Can I impact a stranger somewhere else in a, in a really positive way through my business? Okay, so that's a good, that's, that's one step closer to where you need to be. So within sustainability as a concept, we have four, uh, you can break it down into four parts. You have social, you have environmental, you have cultural and you have commercial. So only when all four of these tie down together, you have a truly sustainable model. Uh, so it, can, it doesn't mean that you need to start off with all of them. You can have one aspect uh, and just completely work on that till you can gather enough uh, expertise and knowledge to venture out into building the others into your business as well. Uh, so in terms of you know things like the impact that we have done, so we try to, cover all these aspects within the business. So we work with NGOs as well. So I teach at uh, NGOs, I teach women sewing and um, you know, so that they can get jobs. 
And um, so we also have, we also do something called an annual sustainability report, which as a small brand, we, we don't see other people doing. And I know that it may not seem like, you know, does it make really a big impact, but to us it does. So we, ha I mean, our previous report, we had 88% of our entire collection was zero waste. So that's a huge number to have as a zero waste uh, thing. And the impact of that is magnanimous. Um, so we are doing those things where we are putting down. So for every design that is made, the waste is calculated. And we have like a cutoff that you cannot have. A, we, we within the system do not have a waste beyond five to six percent. That's that's the maximum. And 88 percent of it has no wastage at all. So that's that gives us you know some motivation that okay now we need to inch in closer to 100 so it's important to have those stats in place and to to know where you're headed um so and we are doing that and i think that okai and uh, nitin both they are doing that as well from what i gather so um you know carbon footprint specifically on that um I don't think there are services that uh, will very easily or in an inexpensive manner allow small businesses to calculate their carbon footprint. Uh, please let me know if there is, uh, because I haven't found one. So what we try and do is we try to go to the most extreme goal. Uh, because honestly, if you're not, if you're going to do a zero waste goal, then you're going to be at, okay, 90% waste or 95% waste, right? Um, but at least your goal is absolute and extreme and all your processes are going to be designed to have an ambition that would be zero waste, right? Um, when you look at, say, for example, transporting goods between all our locations, right? Now we have three offices, two warehouses, one, uh, one workshop. Now things move between these offices and between designers and artisans. Um, what we simply did was all the bags that were going uh, from all these locations, instead of using cardboard boxes, we converted them into suitcases with a zip, which we made out of waste as well. Uh, now, these suitcases are being moved from one place to another, and hence we do not need any more uh, packaging again and again, right? They last us almost uh, more than a year. Uh, so, point being that we know that here we've reduced our carbon footprint. It's definitely not increased in this case. We've, of course, you will account for the weight of the suitcase and you will, uh, you will account for all of those things as common sense. Now, um, I think as far as looking at people aspect, that data is available at a very granular level because you're paying everybody in their bank accounts. Um, and as long as you're not issuing out any cash, every business will have this data in a very, very refined manner to be able to analyze and to be able to transparently share. Uh, so many times on our Instagram page, people will ask us, so how much did the artisan make for this product? And we are able to open our files and share the exact value for that particular product with our, uh, with our customers. And that ends up actually giving them the confidence to purchase that product. So while you have the data, how transparent are you willing to be with that data is also very important. Um, and I think these are some ways in which we are able to track and ensure that we are honest to those goals. Just wanted to answer, uh, Kirti, there, is, there are organizations that, um, that build softwares for life cycle impacts. Yeah. Uh, and to anyone who's watching this, we don't have really, I, I mean, I haven't known of anyone in India doing this for at least the fashion business so i know of companies abroad and we have it as something on our list to have uh within in, you know incorporated within our company but it's expensive and uh, so it needs a lot of planning uh, which is why we are stalling it you know deferring it a little bit uh, so yeah if there's anyone who's interested in this there is a lot of scope for building something that is, uh, you know, economic and uh, can calculate life cycle impact for products. Yeah, so uh, Rohit, my perspective, uh, you know, we, uh, as, as uh, Kirti and uh, Sana mentioned, and I completely agree that it's difficult and expensive to calculate uh, uh, the carbon footprint or the carbon uh, impact 
uh, that your business or your efforts have. So what we've done is, uh, but, but we had to measure, right? Unless you measure, you're not motivated. Unless you measure, you don't have a goal. Unless you measure, you don't move forward. So for us, it's been um, uh, rather simplistic. We've said, okay, uh, how much, how many kgs of single-use plastic can you save for the customer, right? To us, that of course can always be extrapolated to carbon saving and all of that, but we don't go into that detail yet because we know if we achieve this, we would anyways be achieving, uh, you know, uh, carbon positivity or neutrality or, you know, at least uh, 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 some, some way we would achieve uh, a lot of uh, brownie points there. But for us, uh, measuring that impact of single-use plastic, I think has helped us in more, than, more ways than one. It has helped us internally because we say, how do we calculate our sales? Not by the number of chocolate bars we've sold or not by the number of kgs we've processed. It's simply by the number of uh, single-use plastic kilos that we have saved for the planet, right? Also, at the uh, absolutely uh, farm level, uh, we pay more than fair trade prices. Now, in the, in the food industry, fair trade, uh, especially overseas, is considered a very big thing. And for us, it's quite a bit of a joke because we anyways pay more than 50% of what fair trade prices are you know, to the farmer. So for, for us, uh, a lot of these metrics don't fit in naturally. Uh, so we end up making our own uh, metrics, but eventually I think the goal is to ensure that uh, we end up being carbon positive, uh, uh, which will anyways happen if you follow these internal me metrics. And I think now uh, the, the customer is also kind of um, eager to know, you know, maybe I, I don't say he demands yet, uh, maybe in a year that will change, but right now he's very eager to know what is the impact that you've made. Uh, and as Kirti said, if you can document it and share it, it would be great. And I think that was one of our projects before the pandemic happened. We said on our chocolate wrapper, what more can you put in? You know, so you mentioned this is all that you've done on the chocolate wrapper. So the customer doesn't even have to visit a website or anything of that sort or reach out to us on Instagram to you know, find out what we've done. So the least we've done is we put a uh, kind of a live counter on our website to say, these are the number of, uh, you know, plastic, uh, single use plastic kgs that we've saved for you. But I think that's just the beginning and uh, we need to do more clearly. And, and it has immense marketing value, by the way. So uh, just, just not internal drive. It's also a drive for the customer to choose you maybe over another product and then demand this from others, which could probably change a lot of things going forward. That's my perspective. So, thank you, uh, Kirti, Nitin, and Sana for all the insights that you have shared. Uh, like that is all the time we have today. But you know, we would be happy to carry on the conversation offline, if uh, you know any of you are free or in Chennai. Uh, but for the time being, in case you have any closing remarks or you want to share something uh, finally uh, with the audience, uh, we will ask the audience to please give their feedback and. Uh, you can reach out to any one of them on their websites or in the, you know, if they want to ask any personal questions to them, uh, you can reach out to us. We will share it with them and get you the responses. Uh, so uh, anything for the final things that you would like to say in the short one minute or something? Sorry, I was on mute. So I just have one request from the audience and from anybody as a consumer when they look at sustainability. Uh, don't be so bothered about, um, you know, what, what all the organization has done. You know, just look within yourself and say, listen, is this on the face of it at least more sustainable than any other practice that you do or product that you buy? And I think that's a great start because you'll realize any organization, whether it's mine or anybody else's, uh, is doing a lot perhaps, but is not doing enough anyways, always, right? So there are cases where we are trying to be positive, carbon positive and all of that on one side, but on the other side, there are certain things that is beyond our control uh, and that shouldn't be a reason for you not to patronize sustainable products. Uh, that, that's just my request from, from consumers. So uh, Sana, Keithi, anybody wants to go ahead? But do you have any closing remarks? Yes. Um, so I, I just wanted to share something that um, I had watched in a movie and uh, it just made abundant uh, you know, sense to me. So this is from The Wall, the Wall Street. It's uh, Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen. And uh, Douglas is you know, talking to Sheen and he tells him that you know, you'll never be like me because you want to fly first class and I want the plane. So what I want to say to you know, the students, uh, you know, researchers out there, 
uh, that's the mindset you need to have. Okay, dream for the biggest, and you know, don't put a cap on that. Don't put a, uh, don't put yourself um, in a box. Uh, be wild and crazy, and it'll happen. You know, things manifest. The more you say it, the more it'll manifest. And for anyone who's interested in uh, collaborations with uh, you know with respect to design, I am more than happy to you know hop on board. So yes. Thank you, Sana. Kirti. Huh. Well, uh, what a great session. Uh, interesting conversations, and I'm sure Sana and Nitin. I think we're gonna talk a lot offline. Um, so happy to meet you guys, and for all the people on. Uh, the panel here and listening in uh i think you know people always try and gauge is this a good business idea should i even do it um i think i've come to the conclusion that there is really no bad idea it's really how you do it and how much heart you put into it um so really go for it and uh, we're all here our stories are here and our learnings are here for you uh in in any way that we can help you uh we would be so happy to do that thank you thank you all the panelists uh, so uh that was the end of the session for the panel discussion and uh, we would now be uh, we will be looking forward to uh, participating with you guys at five o'clock today evening with a speech with uh, ganga tharan sir uh till then we'll be running some videos uh, for your uh, uh, for your entertainment and hopefully we'll see you back at five o'clock thank you very much Thank you, panelists, again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.
go to higher excitation, you can also get this bunching behavior. So the, this dip is the anti-bunching and this uh, peak, this overlapping peak is the bunching behavior. Now, as uh, you already have the uh, raw data stored, you also have the possibility, for example, to zoom in or out. So right now, this 200 nanoseconds have been selected already pretty well because I know the data already. Uh, I still would have also the opp opportunity the, uh, here to, for example, make the window smaller just to zoom in to, these, uh, to this anti-bunching dip. Okay, so now let's transfer all of the data to the fitting routine. Okay, here's the fitting window, the fitting module. On the top, uh, on, on the left top, you have the possibility to choose between different uh, fitting uh, models. Uh, for these kind of measurements, the best model is uh, continuous wave with shelving states. You can learn more about the fitting models uh, that are used just by clicking help. And then a new window will pop up which explains or, or which shows the uh, fitting function that has been used. It gives you feedback on the fit uh, on the um, fitting models by referring to the literatures, which you can also use for citations in your publications, and it also describes the parameters here. There's also a full width half maximum parameter included, which does not show up in the uh, fitting model above. It's basically because we do not directly use this model for the fit but we uh, convolve this function with a Gaussian function in order to take the broadening, um, the broadening by the detector into account. Detectors usually have a certain uh, timing jitter introduced to your measurement, and this leads to, uh, to a broadening on the time axis. And this is included in the fitting model at the end. Okay. Now let's go to the box with the fitting parameters. Full width half maximum is included here. Uh, the, you have the uh, also other parameters. Tau one and tau two are the uh, are the correlation time constants for the anti-bunching and for the bunching. A, B, and the BKGR parameters are all different uh, different kinds of background parameters. And T0 is a, a shift of the, of the uh, anti-bunching position relative to the lag time position. So ideally it should be at zero, but if there are some optical uh, delays, different, uh, different optical delays in your setup, then you can uh, take that into account here. Then there are also some other buttons here. You have the possibility, for example, to define parameter ranges. For example, background parameters should be uh, positive. So it, the lowest value should be zero. The highest can be open. It's the same for A and B. And also for the uh, lifetime parameters, it should be in the same way, whereas the T0 parameter can be positive or negative. On the, on the right side in this window, you have the possibility to uh, define which parameters should be used for the fitting and which should be kept fixed. The full width half maximum, for example, is something that one can determine beforehand. Uh, for these detectors that have been used here, you will get a, a timing uncertainty of 0.4 nanoseconds. I will keep that fixed. And all of the other parameters can be left open. Then let's start with the fitting. Ideally, one should start with an initial fit of the data, which will help you to see if the uh, fitting routine works already pretty well, if 
the, the fitting curve, which is shown in white here, is uh, doing the right things. And that seems to be the case. And if that's done, just fit it. On the bottom, you also see another curve. This curve uh, is showing the residuals, which is actually the difference between the uh, between the uh, measured or the calculated uh, data and the fitted curve. Ideally, this should show some random noise um, between. Uh, it, it should be a random noise around zero. And it looks already pretty well in this example. You can also export all of the uh, calculated data and also the fitting function to ASCII if you want to use it for, uh, for other tools, for example, to use your own fitting models with other software or if you uh, want to plot it in a different way with other plotting software, then you're free to go with that. Then you just can, you can, uh, then you just extract all the raw data, or sorry, the, the calculated data and use that in any way you want. Maybe you've seen it already, there are plus minus uh, values also shown here. These are the uncertainties of the uh, of the fitting parameters coming out of the fit, and here's also a point where our software has a big strength because uh, usually um, fitting routines do not take into account that the fitting parameters can be correlated. Usually, this correlation is neglected which ends up into error bars that are smaller than they really should be. In this software, however, there's a very advanced analysis of the uh, error bars by doing some numerical calculations uh, via bootstrapping. This is uh, what you can do at the bottom of the window. Here you see the errors, number of shots, probability level. What this, boot, uh, what this bootstrapping analysis is doing actually is that it takes a subset out of your data. It's a randomized subset and uses this, sub, uh, this subset for the data fitting. And then due to uh, randomizing that, you will uh, get some Stat, uh, statistical fluctuation of your fitting parameters later on. And if you define a probability level of 68% here, then the error bars that are calculated by this method will be uh, resembling the situation where, um, where the number of shots that fulfill this, uh, uh, fulfill this range are exactly what you would expect for, for error bars that correspond to, to the standard deviation. So here you can directly link the error bars to the standard deviation of your data. So let's have an example. Let's use, uh, let's use 100 shots. Keep the probability at the levels that you would expect for the standard deviation. And then we are just calculating the error. It also takes a few seconds there to do the fitting. And if you look here on top, you will see that the uh, error bar slightly changed. They became a little bit larger now. This is actually due to the correlation of the parameters. I also would like to uh, show you what, what that actually means. Uh, how, um, how the param uh, parameters are correlated. You can get there by going to the right of the screen. If you follow my mouse, there's a button called uh, error correlation plot. 
if you click that, then a new window will open where you have the uh, possibility to check, uh, uh, to choose a pair of parameters. Let's use the tau one, sorry, the tau one and the tau two parameters, which are actually the two lifetime constants uh, that you extract out of the fit. And then you get the cloud. So according to our understanding, at the end, this will give you more reliable uh, error bars, uh, which is especially helpful if you want to compare different results and see if there are significant changes between fitting parameters or not. Okay, so that's the anti-bunching analysis. Actually, there's not only the anti-bunching uh, with continuous wave excitation, you can also do pulsed excitation and do the fitting for that. Just let's have an example right here. There the anti-bunching curves look differently. For pulse excitation, you will see the, uh, you will see individual pulses in your correlation plot and the pulse at lag time zero will have uh, less counts, which is due to the, uh, to the single photon emission. And also there, you find uh, the fitting model there, also the info on the fitting model and the paper to that in the same way. And also the error analysis and error handling, the fitting, it's all done in the same way. Okay, so that's, that's basically the anti-bunching part. The next minutes I would like to use for showing also the coincidence part. So let's get back to the raw data. Right now I'm just taking the same raw data that I also used for the anti-bunching analysis and now use that info to uh, analyze it in a completely different way. So that's the, that's the coincidence counting part of the software right now. In that part, uh, we implemented a way where you can do the coincidence calculation in a completely different way and in a completely more versatile way. So this uh, actually works in the same way or in a similar way as the, uh, at the, uh, as the multi-channel scaling part that I showed earlier on. So what you can see there are time traces, but for these time traces in the coincidence parts, we are using filters and these filters can be defined by the customer. For that filter or for that coincidence filtering, you have the selectors which are shown here. And now maybe it's also a good idea to zoom in a little bit so that I can explain it in 
more details right now. As you can see it here, you have different rows and different columns that you can use. Each of the columns are standing for a, for a defined input of your device. So there are four marker inputs, and for the Hydro Hub that have been used here, there's a synchronization input and four detector inputs. Some of the inputs are grayed out at the moment, which means that uh, these inputs have not been used for the measurement. And that means I cannot check them. So one easy example right now is to click at uh, two detectors in one row. Having multiple boxes checked in one row means that they are combined via an OR operation. So this way, you uh, have the coincidence settings in a way that either one uh, of the detectors or both are allowed to have clicks. That is your coincidence definition. In principle, this would be the sum of the clicks of the two detectors at the end. If you check the uh, channels in different rows, then you have the end operation between these channels. This is uh, right now, what you can see here, this is the, uh, the coincidence definition. So in that situation, both detectors have to be clicked in order to be uh, considered in the analysis there. You also have the chance to uh, mark the, uh, the row as red. This way, the detector checked here is considered as not, or it's an end not operation between these two rows right now. And this would be an anti-correlation or anti-coincidence uh, between these two inputs. Here you also have the chance to make it uh, as complicated as you want. You get feedback as you, right see, uh, as you see it right now here get feedback on uh, on the selected combination via this tooltip info or via this mathematical uh, display directly below the coincidence uh, window. And then if you define that, just click on calculate. And then it also takes a few seconds and you see the uh, filtered time trace on the display. Now here it is. As it's the same data that I showed before, you may uh, recognize it. We started at low count rates. Uh, there. Then later on, there had been some readjustment and then the, the count rates increased and it's the same way for the coincidences. I forgot to mention that you also have the possibilities to define the, the time window of the, uh, of the coincidence definition. If you make it larger, then more events are considered as a coincidence. Okay, so that's the coincidence correlation part. If you want to learn more about that, there's also the possibility to, uh, to open the, the uh, context help that directs you uh, to the coincidence edit, which I just showed you. And then using that is uh, described in more details than what I showed. And it also shows you uh, in more details what is really considered as a coincidence. So actually for the, for the not operation, I forgot to mention uh, for the not operation, uh, the defined time window is used to look before and after the uh, detected uh, photon. If there is an event on that uh, forbidden channel, whereas for the, uh, for the other detections, it is just looking after the, uh, um, after the detected photon. And the algorithm is working in a way that all of the events at the select channels 
are uh, looked through, starting from the first uh, channel, then uh, the, the algorithm looks if the if the defined coincidence uh, is fulfilled or not. And then if it is fulfilled, then it uh, counts that as one. Also here you have the possibilities to uh, to export the uh, the coincidence time traces. You also have the possibility to export the time tags of the uh, of the coincidences into ASCII files. Okay, so that's the software. Let's go back to the talk. Yeah, right now you have the possibility to ask. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Torsten. So um, there is a couple of questions that we received. Um, so the first question from uh, Georg Arnold, how is the normalization exactly performed? What determines the time that is set to a value of one in the normalization? Um, that is something that is, uh, that is described in the help file. Um, maybe it's easiest if I just send you the uh, the info on that uh, via email. It's a uh, mathematical algorithm behind it, which uh, is doing the normalization. So ideally, if you do the anti-bunching uh, normalization, this will lead to a situation where the uh, left and the right limits will go to the value of one. This is what is also expected in a, a correlation function. However, there can be situations, especially if you do some selection of your uh, of your time text. For example, if you look at bright states and dark states separately, then this will uh, this has to deviate from one, and is it actually also does in the software. Okay, Torsten, thanks. There's two or three more questions. Before that, um, if you have further questions, please use the chat function. Um, um, we do have, I think, three more questions in the line, but please continue to use the chat function. So the second question is, can you also use the end condition to get the same data as for the T3 mode? What is the advantage of using the T3 mode compared to the T2 where all clicks are reported? Okay, so this software only uses T2. The end function um, actually is uh, writing the coincidences just by, uh, by the info of the first detected event. And you get the time tag of this first detected event. The T3 mode, however, works differently. For the T3 mode, you get the info on the last detected event relative uh, to the uh, to the time to the elapsed time from the uh, from the start. So what you get in the T3 mode is the number of elapsed sync uh, sync pulses relative to the start of the measurement and the info on the start stop time. That is something that you do not get just by the coincidence analysis. So here, the coincidence analysis is just looking at the coincidence itself. And okay. may, maybe yeah. it's, uh, it's a good idea to discuss that further on in order to uh, check if that's fitting, uh, fitting the experiment or if there are maybe other approaches how uh, this kind of experiment can be fulfilled. Okay, there's two more questions. Is it possible to analyze in QCOA software anti-bunching data obtained with pulsed lasers? Yeah, exactly. The, uh, this can be done. I try to show it in the software. Maybe I was too quick on that. I will go back to that again. So um, we have this raw data file, pulse PTU. This raw data uh, file was uh, was obtained by using a pulse laser. 
And that's uh, why the correlation plot is looking differently here. Yeah, in this way, you do not have this, you do not see this bunching behavior in combination with, with the anti-bunching, but instead of that, you would see the individual pulses, whereas the pulse at lag time zero is just smaller than the others. Okay, and the last question that we have received so far, um, does the S channel in the software indicate the channel zero in the Pico Hub 300? Um, the, the S channel actually is shown here as S because uh, it's the name how it's, it's the way how it's described on the front panel of the Hydra Hub. The software is recognizing uh, the device that is connected uh, to, to the computer or it is reading out the uh, device information out of the raw data file. And this way it adapts to the labels that you have on your device. So for example, if you have the Pico up there, yeah, then you will see uh, channel zero and channel one instead of uh, sync one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Atmosphere is an infinite source of water. Rain comes from air and it sustains life on earth. If water can be generated from air, like rain, it will be a fertile. Team IIT Madras welcomes you for the evaluation of its air-to-water generator for the first round of Water Abundance X-Prize competition. Designed and developed in India, it demonstrates the translation of lab-scale research to a solution, addressing a global problem effortlessly. At this point in time, the best of water harvesting machines have an efficiency of 220 watt hours per liter in favorable ambient conditions of 30 degrees centigrade and 80% relative humidity. Under the same ambience, our machine delivers water at an efficiency of 269 watt hours per liter. However, when an annual comparison is drawn for a city such as New Delhi in India, where unfavorable climate is present for most time of the year. The globally best machine consumes nearly 506 watt hours on average to make a liter of water, while our machine consumes only 361 watt hours for the same volume. If it is possible to bring down this number to 250 watt hours per liter or below, atmospheric water generators will become useful to people. Here, we will show you an effort which has got us an annual performance of 361 watt hours per liter which works at extreme hot and dry conditions as well. Condensation of moist air below its dew point over the evaporators has been achieved with refrigeration systems of varying cooling capacities. Nature offers an insight into how humidity can be harvested efficiently. Periodic bumps over a beetle's back, silky knots in a spider web, or the spines of a cactus. These have led to an understanding of how a surface can be engineered to harvest humidity efficiently. This has enabled us to create randomly oriented hierarchical micro nanostructures over the surface of an evaporator to offer an enhanced rate of condensation and consequently more water collection to an extent of 35% more water for the same amount of power consumed. Another advancement by us has enabled localization of these hierarchical nanostructures by employing a hydrophobic coating, thereby introducing local wettability gradients that would facilitate the droplets to fall down at much smaller sizes. The machine has a pre-humidifier module that improves its performance in hot and dry climatic conditions and enables it to operate up to temperatures as high 
as 46 degrees centigrade. This module also offers better heat management on the condenser side. Silent and efficient DC fans for evaporator and condenser with fuzzy logic ambient temperature and humidity based variable speed controls along with a super efficient compressor helps to further reduce the power consumption. In New Delhi for instance where temperature varies roughly from 7 degrees to 45 degrees Celsius with RH ranging from 10% to 80% across the year. Our 400 liter machine is capable of delivering water at an annualized average of 224 liters per day while the best AWG machine running under similar conditions is expected to produce only 179 liters of water per day. Since Delhi's climate covers the entire range of weather conditions in which AWGs operate globally we propose a global solution that holds the potential to deliver water across the world at the most affordable price with 25% higher water output and 29% lesser power consumption in comparison to the existing best commercial machines based on humidity condensation alone. The cost of water from this machine is approximately 4 cents per litre averaged over the year. For global benefit and to meet the X price requirements, we look forward to build a 2000 liters per day machine that produces water at a cost below 2 cents per liter under the expected conditions by further modifying the design and creating better water harvesting structures over the surface of the evaporator and with enhanced heat recovery. Our calculations suggest that the design improvements can get us currently to 3 cents per liter. With this institutional effort, we hope to serve mankind through clean water.
incident is NITK's annual cultural festival. It is regarded as South India's second biggest festival. Team Eye Care is under Team Incident, which undertakes social and environmental activities. So as a part of our eye care uh, environment initiative, uh, we went around the beaches of NITK and we collected the waste plastics lying around there. These collected plastics become our input for our uh, desktop size in-house built plastic recycling unit. Collected waste portals are added into the crusher and is crushed and is further added into the injection molding machine. product which, were, which can be easily manufactured and something which everyone would buy and love. One of the several ideas we got was the keychain. Electrical heater is aligned to the mold and then the plastic is injected.
Hello everyone, my name is Josh and I am going to teach you Ohm's law. It's a very simple and a very useful law. It was found by the man called George Simon Ohm. That's not three different people, that is one guy. and. He discovered the law in 1825. That is a really old law then, right? So, why is it important? What is so useful about it? Why are we talking about it some roughly 200 years afterwards? So, the Ohm's law is a really nice and elegant relation between two quantities. One quantity is called... voltage which is represented by the symbol V and another quantity is called current which is represented by the symbol I. So in order to understand the Ohm's law we should first get an idea of what is current and what is voltage. So let us look at current first and we have current as basically the flow of charge. It is how much flow of charge is occurring in how much time. So we can have it in two ways. One we could have a positive charge which is going in one direction or we could have also a negative charge which is going in the opposite direction. And these two are the same thing, right? Positive going towards the right is the same thing as negative going towards the left. So in both cases, we say that current is going to the right. That is, we always take the positive direction, positive charges direction to be the direction of the current. So we understand that if a charge were going in a direction we have current. So we understand current. Current is a fairly intuitive thing to know. But how do we also talk about voltage? And what voltage means? So when we talk about voltage, we talk about the difference in potential between two points. Let us not go into what we mean by potential, but let us look at two points. Let's call one point P, which is here. And there is another point N, which is here. And let us say that the voltage of P, the potential at P, which I'll call VP, is greater than Vn. 
that is the potential at n right so what happens is that if i placed a charge here a positive charge it is going to go to the lower potential place and this is how positive charge is if you take a positive charge and you keep it at a place and it finds a connection to a lower potential place it will just drop off and go off to that lower potential place but what happens is this if i placed a battery in this region so instead of this empty space i am going to place a battery and now the battery's positive terminal which is what we are calling p is at a higher potential than the negative terminal so expectedly if i put a charge here it should be able to go down but it can't and this is because a battery is such that inside the battery there are chemical forces which push positive charge upwards so if i place a negative positive charge here a battery is going to kick it up and take it there so your positive charge because of the battery it can't go from a higher potential to that is a p to n but we had seen earlier that our positive charge would like to do this so if we connected the positive terminal to the negative terminal by means of a wire right what will happen your positive charge will now start going through this wire and reach the negative term and we have already talked about how the battery once you get a positive charge to negative terminal will kick it up to the positive terminal through chemical forces inside and once your charge reaches here again it is again going to go around and come down this is a lot like what you would expect in a water pump so what happens in a water pump is you have water flowing down on a slope surface suppose so this water is flowing 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 and it is reaching here and since this is the same height i can make it move like this and now suppose again i'm going to call this point n and this point p but what i am placing here is a pump and what this pump does is it takes this water from this region and it conveys this water up this is what a pump does right it takes water from the ground floor and takes it to a higher place and now once the water is here it is again going to fall down the slope and then again going to reach this point because it's on the same horizontal level and the pump is again going to pull this water up and bring it here which is what we are kind of seeing even in the voltage case right here the charge is like water and the battery is like a pump and in this case the voltage then 
इज लाइक हाइट द मोर द हाइट द मोर द वॉटर विल वॉन्ट टू फॉल डाउन द मोर वर्क नीड्स टू बी डन इन ऑर्डर टू पुल दिस वॉटर फ्रॉम द ग्राउंड लेवल टू द टॉप लेवल दैट मीन्स इन दिस केस द मोर वर्क नीड्स टू बी डन टू पुल द पॉजिटिव चार्ज फ्रॉम द नेगेटिव टर्मिनल टू द पॉजिटिव टर्मिनल एंड दैट वर्क दैट इज रिक्वायर्ड टू पुल द चार्ज इज वॉट वी कॉल वोल्टेज सो आई होप यू अंडरस्टूड वॉट वोल्टेज इज यू ऑल्सो अंडरस्टूड वॉट करेंट इज and now we have to come to the question of what did ohm discover at the end of it all what is the relation between these two quantities and that relation what ohm discovered is this the voltage is proportional to the current and what does that mean that means if the voltage were to increase the current would also increase those many times if the voltage were to become twice the current would also become twice if the voltage were to become half the current would also become half so when v is proportional to i i can resolve this proportionality i can make this an equation and write it as v is equal to i into some constant this is some number which relates v and i and what is this number in an electrical circuit is this is what we call the resistance of wire so in the circuit if i have to redraw the circuit now this looks quite ugly so let us go to a new circuit diagram and i am going to represent the battery with this symbol and i am going to place a resistance like this and now we have current flowing from the positive terminal to the negative terminal it goes around goes around goes around goes around goes around and then it comes to the negative terminal and here we have the resistance r and the difference in potential here is the v so v is equal to ir right so what i want you to understand is if now v is fixed that is our battery is fixed and i am increasing r then our i should decrease clearly right because i will become v by r so more the resistance of the wire lesser the current in the circuit let us now look at this as a simulation now here in this simulation we see that this is the battery and if you can look at this you see that this is the positive terminal and this is the negative terminal of the battery if we went closer we see this is the resistance of the wire this white plank is not a realistic thing the white plank is just there for our convenience of understanding how charge flows so right now there is no voltage the battery is at zero voltage and if i increased this i start seeing the charge is flowing right we have the charge going from the positive to the negative terminal and we have seen that the height has increased let us again increase the voltage further on and we see that the height is increased this height is just an analogy so that you can remember the water analogy here you can see that the positive charge is flowing as though it is water from a height right it is falling through the slope and going around and the battery is pushing it from 
below to a lot. So it's going in here and the battery is pushing it up and the charge is turning around and coming this way. Right? But this is not what really happens. What really happens is electrons move. It isn't the positive charge. So what really happens is this. The negative charge goes from the negative terminal around, goes up the resistance, turns and comes to the positive terminal and the battery pushes this negative charge down to the negative terminal. So this is what really happens. And if you look at the resistance, this is made to now look like the, it is now made to look like the slope along which the water is rolling down. Whereas the battery is seen as the pump which is taking this water up the height. And when you look at it in terms of the electrons, we see that it is happening in the opposite direction. In both cases, the current is taken to be going from the positive terminal to the negative terminal along the resistance. Now, let us verify what happens with the current. The voltage is right now 13 volts. And if we went to the resistance, we will see it is 5. I could increase the resistance to say, let us say make it 13 as well. And now this current, what is the value? 1 amp. We see that the current is 1 ampere. And this is exactly what we expect because current is V by R according to Ohm's law. Now suppose we change this to something else. Let us say I made it 7 volt. And then let us say I also made the resistance to 14 ohm, in which case the current is 0.5 amp as is expected because we have 7 by 14, which is half. So, with this simulation, we could see that the current actually changes according to the ohms law. If I change this further till 28 because the voltage is 7 volt and the resistance is 28 ohm we see that the current is 0.25 amp.
गुड इवनिंग सर आई थिंक योर वॉइस इज लिटिल लो सर वी आर अनेबल टू हियर यू प्रॉपर्ली आर एबल टू हियर मी नाउ Uh, yes sir now it's clear yes sir good evening sir yes we will start by 5 uh, exactly yeah. are you Adi sharing any, any screen sir ah uh, yeah i am sharing a screen yes uh, i'll also log in through one more system okay sure sir sure sir. i will give a different name so that you can admit me but i need to be as a only a use i mean uh, attendee yes sir Uh, sir we will be running the sponsors we will be running the sponsors after that we will be start sure. yes yeah, so okay go ahead go ahead yes sir thank you
Tender Rajan, sir, you can go ahead now, sir. You can go ahead now, sir. Yes. So, uh, shall we go ahead, sir? Hello, sir. So, sir, uh, uh, sir, sir, shall we go ahead? So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we welcome you all to another interesting session of uh, Research Scholars Day 2021. RST 2021 has started with a wide range of uh, events from lecture series to interactive talks and workshop to com competitions. It aims to bring together people from different research backgrounds and uh, engage uh, exchange of ideas and research interests. I am very pleased and honored to introduce our speaker for this session, Dr. K. V. Gangadharan, sir. Thank you for joining with us, sir. Uh, Dr. K. V. Gangadharan, sir, is professor in mechanical engineering and director for the Center for System Design, president of the Institute of Innovation Council, National Institute of Technology, Canada, India. He has IIT Madras in the year of 2001. In the area of uh, railroad vehicle dynamics, and uh, me from my native region, 1992. BTEC in mechanical engineering from Calicut University in 1989. His area of interest are the system design, vibration and its control, smart materials and its applications, and so structural health monitoring and product design. He is also actively involved and engaged in creating learning material for experimental learning for basic concepts in engineering. He has a teaching and ex research experience of 27 years and industrial experience of one year. He is actively in, engaged in industrial uh, consultancy and sponsored project uh, and has more than 120 research publications on his study. He is also filed seven patents or in the area of medical devices and free in smart medical applications. Also, active HIM amateur radio with the um, call sign of BU 280 in charge of amateur radio faculty in NIT's NIT Oracle. The student title uh, talk is in the experimental learning a basic steps towards research and online approach. Now I'd like to invite Professor K.V. Gangadharan sir to deliver his interactive talk. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there was some disruption and disturbance in the audio. Uh, so I would request you to uh, switch the video and uh, audio on. I, I need to be able to. With a bit of uh, disturbance in the audio. I hope uh, you are able to hear my audio now, okay? Uh, yes, sir, your audio is okay. So, yeah. which isn't a uh, good evening to everyone. And it's a happy occasion for an alumni of IIT Madras to come back and even though in the virtual mode to talk to the research scholars and others, those who are listening online as well as on Zoom. So, let me just uh, start with my presentation. Uh, hope you are able to see my presentation screen there. Yes, sir. It's good. I also have my uh, side, uh, another system wherein I can see what others are seeing. So, very present good, uh, good evening from on behalf of National Institute of Technology, Kanadaga Suratkal, uh, which gives me my bread and butter. So we are an institute uh, on the seaside and very environmentally conscious. Uh, we hope to have a carbon neutral campus in the, due time, uh, the course of time. Today, I thought of giving you a very, very light talk on experiential learning, a basic step towards research and online, an online approach. So I'm sure that morning, I also listened to some of the uh, talks. Uh, I know research scholars are expecting quite intensive math oriented uh, talks. Whereas I thought in the evening, I'll make it light and 
make sure that we get something out of this live talk and we look at the way in which we look at our research. So that's the intention. So we are looking at experiential learning. So thank you, ATM uh, RSD team, inviting uh, me and uh, me to showcase what NATK is doing in this domain. So that way, uh, on behalf of NATK and NATK Center for System Design team, we are quite thankful to the team who invited us, the research scholars, they team invited us. This is what the abstract I gave. I said, knowing more and more about less and less is what research is all about. Of course, it is debatable. And how do we make this more experiential is the question which we are going to ask. To take you to that, I need some base on which I need to start with. I'm sure you are all familiar with the year being notated as BC and AD. And I'm also sure that you know, presently we are being notated as before COVID and presently we are going through during COVID and hopefully the green arrow comes close and that is going to be after COVID. And we have changed a lot. With whatever minimum resources available, when we were logged in, our home, we still continue to teach, learn, and do research. Did we really change is the question. Let us look at, did we evolve? We have evolved. So we have evolved from an ape to similar looking creature here. Fortunately, it's a man. I forgot to clothe him. But we have evolved. And the question is, are we coming back to the same shape and size? If you look at transportation, I'm sure all of you recognize the evolution. Communication, it's quite evident. I'm sure many of these devices are not known to the millennium kids. And looking at the, num the kind of phones, the phone, if it, break, if it uh, falls on the tiles, the tile breaks. And the latest Apple phone, if it falls, of course, the wires heart breaks. So we have changed. And 1T to 1G to 5G, we have changed even though we remember 2G for a different reason. And computation also, we, computing has already evolved, but something which has given us some physics background, look at the picture. Hope you are able to recollect something which you learned in physics very clearly. The mass conservation, the devices become thinner and thinner, the person who operates have become fatter and fatter. And we have all the connected devices, OD area network, land, after land, we have van, then also van, BS, body area network. So we have devices connected around the body now. Did we change? Is this change for F to A or reverse? You can put your own arrows, whichever you like, whether you want to say from Facebook to the ape or ape to Facebook. So when we look at every change, you can see the picture where people have to be guided to cross the road. Believe me, they are not blind, but they are glued to their five inch screen and they don't see the beauty around. They are so much glued to the five inch screen where they believe the entire cosmos is. And we have changed our signboards. Whether it is reality or augmented reality or virtual reality, we are the same. We keep peeping out and seeing what is really happening. Did our classroom change? I'm sure you will recognize this. They did not have a color picture, color photography in the beginning. Hence, it looks black and white. Otherwise, you can see it is the same. And we teachers knew how to keep you quiet by making the force or showing the fist. And we are so good in evaluating each one be it a flying one or crawling one or a swimming one, everyone, we have been giving same kind of test, whether it is a social science research or it's an research in engineering or in pure maths, we say we need two SCI index, SCI journal paper, and that's it. Nothing else is going to satisfy me to say that you have done the research. So climbing the tree is the ultimate to say that this the same way we evaluate results. And each individual and the topic and the domain 
could be quite different the fish in the water or the crow in the and the air or the monkey which can climb every one you understand this as the topic and the research scholar we evaluate in a very very similar way and we claim that is a fair method of evaluating is what we are doing it we can again debate is it really helping us or troubling us and we also make fun of the creature who could not climb the tree and say that it is useless and we we also know nothing is useless everything is used less now from here let us take an example of a common statement and see whether we find there is such potential remember the topic which you are looking at how do we get an experiential learning to aid our research that's a topic wherein i will just get you one or two unstructured problem statement see whether we are able to get something out of it to see uh, i am giving you simple statements because uh, it's an heterogeneous group hence i don't want to put any specific scientific things as an unstructured problem statement let me just choose one statement from 19 1990 africa i'm sure you are you are able to understand uh, the symbol which is given there one of the predominant issue was aids and there was only one way to contain it by spreading uh, the information what to do and what not to do in south african countries and the only mode that could get the communication across was the village radios radios in the village and obviously people from uh, western world philanthropists came and distributed radio to every house okay and they also made sure that transmission is in the local language and also they made sure that they have sufficient entertainment program along with that information about what to do and what not to do in to avoid spreading aids are also informed after 3 months they uh, the people came to verify whether their donation was effective or not and to their utter surprise they saw that nobody was using the radio i, I think you might have disabled the chat but i'll say okay you don't need to say anything just think about it for next 30 seconds why the villagers did not use the radio they had entertainment programs they had information and do's and don'ts in the local language was available and it was in very comfortable time and uh, those who are going for work they were avoiding that time all that was taken care but still the radio receivers were not in use after three months when they went and checked what could be the reason the person who went there one of them was a uh, violinist who was an aquatic trainer a trainer in a swimming pool he went around and found that he found a relation between aids and energy look at this don't giggle on when i say aids and energy i'm talking about energy the power and electricity can you connect aids and electricity in fact that's what this person did he saw that the radios were not used because they did not have sufficient money those who cannot just afford a square meal cannot afford or look for getting a two a batteries two numbers in order to listen to the radio so he found out a simple method of energizing this radio from available information he did not invent anything new but and he wasn't an engineer as such so what he did is he used the wind up approach to store potential energy in a spring and use that potential energy to get converted into kinetic energy and drive a small uh, generator which will power the radio for 2 minutes of winding up will give them almost one and a half hours of uh, power required to run the radio look at the connection wind up mechanism was available the domain which we are now talking is infectious disease or transmittable disease and we are connecting that with communication then communication got connected with power and to do to get the power we are now looking back to the basic physics and got something else done look at the research potential all around 
even though it looks very simple there are sufficient amount of social science research involved how people behave what they do etc plus you also look at what is how we are looking at the technology or information which we already have can be used for multiple applications and it is not necessary that it should be done by an engineer or a scientific person a person who was just doing uh, training in a swimming pool was a person who did this the question here is are we missing this kind of an approach in our research are we asking the right question or are we looking at the right solution we might have asked the right question but the right solution i'll take another example again i will take it from a domain such a way that it's not very complex look at carrying the load this is possible here when you are sitting in a team of research scholars ask them the question how do we help them obviously the solutions are existing hence it is easy to find but what we are looking at is are they also able to find what basic physics has, has been applied in order to do this look at the solutions it's a sustainable solution and economically i mean uh, environmentally friendly solution were in using bamboo sticks and few other materials they have made this and look at these three pictures and try to find what is the basic physics used to reduce the pain of carrying the load they still carry the load in both the pictures and the third picture it is getting rolled so look at what is that the basic understanding of our basic physics has been applied for a solution i'm sure that all of you have identified that here in the first case let me just put the uh, laser pointer in the first case here the area through which the force is acting has been widened we have used the same equation f by a force divided by the area as very large and if you want to connect it with mythology look at uh, uh, mahabharata and bhishma pitamaha on a row, uh, bed of arrows so same principle which is used reused here in order to reduce the pain look at the second picture this picture where we have used use something called the, the mass being close to the cg mass being close to the cg so that the arm length of the moment r into f or f into r that r we are able to reduce and the third picture it is why should i carry i can roll it the rolling friction is much easier to tackle rather than dragging it or keeping it on the head so look at this way of looking at a problem statement help me to carry the load become some product or a process when you have to create a product a lot of things goes behind what material to use is this material sufficient what cross section to be used what kind of load comes on is it dynamically safe whether the static analysis need to be conducted all that happens to be the normal thing which we need to do so it become part of the research i have taken a simple problem to explain in the talk whereas it can be extended depending upon uh, the domain it can be taken the problem statement can be taken from the corresponding domain so this was uh, from nid a national institute of design uh, in fact it, this product was a third semester assignment for uh, vikram tirubhai and later he uh, took a patent as well as uh, made it open to everyone to use similarly and the research research opportunity in many of the north indian play, uh, states fairly okay road may be there but water network may not be there that potable water may not be there and this is a very common site in many places uh, even for some places in uh, tamil nadu also it is quite common so how do we carry this i'm just getting into avoiding this and getting into the solution look at this and find research opportunities i'm looking at a material that can be used as a port that port itself will act as a wheel and i should be able to put it in such a way that i can roll it around and i need it to be as light as possible look at this picture this boy is carrying it of course it is empty carrying it like this so the problem statement could be looking very innocent not having any research opportunity 
but we should be able to find solutions to reach the solution we may have to do a lot of research so i am looking at this problem and its solution for that we are doing research it is not the other way i have done set of research and i have the solutions available now i look for, for the problem okay so here all these places we have used existing understanding okay existing understanding alone now those who are not happy with the kind of problems which i have taken i'll straight away get into how what i meant by an experiential learning try to connect it with one or two examples for the common understanding of an engineering or a science background person i'm sure that many of you do research in robotics and i'm now looking at research in robotics as an activity and in indian uh, research it is like an arranged marriage you get into an institute find a suitable gate no find a gate and make him suitable then he probably gives you an area and we get into that so it is more like an indian typical indian arranged marriage where we get married and start loving so in that condition somebody has come to robotics as his passionate area and he happened to be a mechanical engineer the person who was going to grade and he is good at something else and obviously the student has been assigned and hence looking at things so the student was very clear he want to do something on robotics so now the question is is robotics is all about uh, dsp electronics drives and motors or is it has something to do with mechanical engineering or basic physics or is it to do more with communicate communication or is it an interdisciplinary or a transdisciplinary activity so assume that the gate wanted to impress upon the student to say that you are working on robotics but my focus area is slightly different i want you to work on a gripper obviously that is again from the robotics area the person who came assume that the person who came to that is an electronics student student okay so he is looking at what is a gripper to do and how he can do a research in it okay just look at the slides started looking at the basic fund fundamentals and trying to simulate what happens when when things are moving etc what kind of input need to be given in order to create the required response of the movement this is very very close to your h omega that is transfer function here in each of these case only one rotation is the input and much complex response output are able to be made or if you are looking at a gate just by one rotation you with appropriate activity you should be able to recreate the gate or gate motion now remember the gate has already asked you to do on research on gripper and you are obviously looking at gripper how do i make it adaptive and make sure that whether i hold an egg or hold one kg of uh, uh, metal should be able to hold it appropriately and all that was your thing and you are looking at how do i make it more smart and things of that kind but to reach there you need to first make a gripper and you are not from that domain so this is how the gripper can be one approach now i need the student who is from an another domain get into this because this is not his major work he need to make it but then he is going to add sensors probably he will have n number of sensors will do a sensor fusion use artificial intelligence to make sure that the data what he gets is modeled and given appropriate response all that complexity we are adding but to start with he need to understand how this can be designed or made if he is not in an interdisciplinary lab work he gets the help from others at least even if that is there he may have to get the understanding of how is it functioning now for this you can very well use the basic things like this the building block those who are from mechanical or similar background will understand these were the basic building block which we used to make this gripper okay we will not dwell much about what is it but this is to communicate that yes even in from a different domain when a person comes probably we need basics of other domains to be experienced 
to make our research much better. Okay. From there, probably I'll also just demonstrate one simple thing of sewing machine. Just look at the sewing machine. Try to look at it from a research perspective. Okay. I want you to think about the kind of input you give and a box and a response. Okay. The system perspective. Look at what you are doing in a uh, sewing. I have the needle going up and down. There is two threads and thread has to get entangled and it has to have the sufficient tension to make sure that one is not loose. All that has to be done. And this has to be done with one input, remember. So you have only one input which you are going to give. That is a pedal swing. And that swing you need to modify in such a way that needle moves up and down, cloth moves forward after each stitch and pedal swing is converted to rotation in order to achieve all this. Are you able to find some, some relation with many of our system statements in this? We have one input, input is getting modified to required responses and get the final requirement. So it is not necessary that you need to look at very complex system to understand these basics. If you are able to experience this concept of system approach, probably we will be looking at research in a different way. So this is a double threaded uh, sewing which happens normally. Okay. So from here, we'll see how do we do it in an actual practice. So experiential learning, how do we implement that in this difficult time? We are looking at how do we make it online? So let us see. So I'm going to give you a degree in swimming for after three years, but I'll make you to sit on the side and give you all the equations, uh, buoyancy, how you need to float, what is the uh, force you need to give to move forward. Every equation you have learned, you know how to derive it. You know all the parametric studies which can be done in a computer. So you have beautiful running graphs, colored graphs saying that if mass, param mass as a parameter changes, what happens? If the arm swing changes, what happens at the speed, etc., etc. So all that is done. And at the end, I will give you a degree and ask you to swim. I know you are giggling at me. In fact, that's what exactly we do. Many, many a times we make our students to read engineering or science rather than do engineering or science. And that is true even in social or humanity side. But they do little more because those subjects are much more close to the heart than to the brain. So can we make the students, researchers or learners to do engineering and science rather than reading engineering and science? That too in the difficult situation like this where they may not even have close access to the laboratory. If you look at gurus, I'm sure this is either in the picture or in the textbook. And we have been doing dhyana with all this now. And our young smart people are quite happy with the loves and likes which they get for their postings. The question is, can we use the same medium for experiential learning of the basic concepts so that I can plunge into research in much better way? I get more philosophical approach towards the topic which I do, PhD. So you become philosopher in that small domain which you are working on. So you're coming from a wide area, getting down, narrowing down, knowing everything about nothing is what is going to happen. And for that, can we have an online activity which will help you to get that experience for the learning activity? So when you talk about experiential learning, I'm sure all of you look at these kind of pictures come to your mind and be ready for this. If, if you want to avoid this, one method, it may not be a replacement, but one method to augment your experiential learning is to get into a connected device and do things on that. Is there an opportunity for each one of you to do that is the question next. So let us now start dreaming. It's a nice time to dream five o'clock or 5.30 and you can grow as big as your dream is. 
so let us dream so you can be an administrator who are listening or you can be a professor or you can be a researcher so i am going to dream dream about a lab which is at my place my pace and my period so can you think about a lab at your place wherever you are and at your pace if you want to conduct experiments and learn the basics you should be able to do that and that too without any time restrictions and at your period assume that you are a rakshasa active after 12 o'clock midnight and you want to conduct an experiment don't ask me what experiment you want to conduct an experiment at midnight it should be possible remember it is a specification for the dream so we are dreaming at a lab and a probably a learning management system at my place my pace and my period not that enough i want this lab to be the way in which i can take home or carry home carry the carry with me and i don't want any lock and key and no holidays and the lab that helps me especially maybe for a phd or a research scholar it may not really matter the syllabus because he decides the syllabus rather and but it obviously matters the dream job can i get a lab which will help me to strengthen my basics so that i can get into a job or if you are already on a job you want to change the job and look at a new area etc can i dream about a lab which will do all this so look at the specification we have put for our dream so remember to put specification for your dream and make sure that you achieve each of that so that you achieve the dream and the dream what ministry of uh, education earlier it is known as ministry of human resource and development has done is they created virtual lab you can see that all seven iits are there and uh, among nits and adk Uh, COEP Pune, Real Bag, and Amrita University, and Triple IIT Hyderabad, along with Triple uh, IIT, Triple uh, IIT Hyderabad, along with other seven uh, IITs, together made something called virtual lab. And things are very simple. There are three different kinds of lab available, which is modeling or simulation-based labs. If the equations or uh, parameter variations are known quite well, you can create an equation. and you can add some white noise to create it as an experiment and that is simulation based lab or something like an universal testing machine you are breaking a component finding out the strength you want to do it for 100 different material conduct all that experiment of different materials keep store it as a database and when the user comes he will get an appropriate measured data as an output that is measurement based or king of all labs are remote trigger lab think about doing your research experiment sitting at your comfortable place just hooking on to your mobile phone switching on switching off adjusting the parameter getting the data without even visiting the lab that is called remote trigger lab so this approach most of us has implemented at many of the places and we quite successfully it is demonstrated that it is possible to do all three different kind of laboratory we'll just demonstrate one or two just to get a feel of it and then i'll also be talking about what we do as an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary center i'm just taking the tab where i can show you what is virtual lab so this is ministry of education's virtual lab and you can look at remember quite often during research we have a small very trivial question to be answered and we feel very difficult to go and ask another domain person what is it or probably we need that help just next to just after reading a paper i want to know why a diode is kept in one circuit as a flywheel um, diode but that is not explained in the paper if i can go back to some basics in electronics or electronic circuit i can get it then that saves my time as a researcher so is it possible to do that is the question and if you are able to do that your time is saved you get a better understanding experiential way of getting things on basics so that strengthen your research approach so we'll just look at one or two experiments 
uh, I'm taking um, I'm taking the clue, saying that an electronics engineer happened to do a gripper research on a gripper, and he was forced to make a gripper as such. Okay, and he had to use some of the basic mechanical things. So look at this diagram. I hope you are able to see the diagram. It's a simple mechanism and we are able to give all the complex things there, displacement, velocity and acceleration. And I can also change all the parameters, parameters and see whether I'm able to do variations. So I can change R, L and uh, Omega, all that can be changed. And I can get the variations. Similarly, uh, this is available in mechanics of machines in mechanical lab. So you see, you will have basic theory. Some basic theory will be given, very brief. And it is meant for people who are in a hurry to get the basic understanding. And simple procedure is also given, which may not be required many a times. Uh, then if you want to know what is your present uh, level of understanding, you can set a self-evaluation. Remember, it is not known to others. It is you only know out of 10 marks, how many you are able to answer. Then you do a simulation study. Uh, there are different methods on simulation. Then if you are interested, you can do an analysis. Then you can again do a quiz after doing this to understand what is the delta X which you could get. And there is also talk, spoken tutorial as well as the videos available on this itself. So this is one type of experiment available online. Another type is remote triggered experiments. Assume that you are an, you would like to do an experiment on a simple pendulum. I'll just connect this. So here, I think from my lab, this is from my lab, which is called SOR, Students Online Laboratory through Virtual Experimentation. Uh, behind we had a uh, green curtain, probably one of the PhD students want to video, uh, take video of his experiment hence he has taken it, otherwise there was a, a green curtain behind it. So you can see this. So I'm going to trigger this experiment first. There is absolutely no login. Um, Any one of you can try out rtlabs at nadk.ac.in and there is no login requirement. Yeah, you can see the setup triggering. Once it triggers, it gives you the data. You have the data available now. You can download this data and you can also change some parameter. So let me change the parameter, the length as a parameter. I'm just keeping it small. Change the length. I'm keeping it small so the Green, but green portion here should go up. It has gone up. Okay, I can conduct one more test and see what change I get. Remember, we are triggering the experiment once again. So it has triggered, it gave me one more set of data. Remember it is an actual experiment and you will have data one and data two. Now I'll change the length to the maximum. Let us see the change in length. Please look at the ball which is coming down, the ball which is coming down. Once it comes down, we'll do one more trigger. I think I have two more sec two more minutes to go. Here it shows me how much more time I have uh, the control given to me. Depending upon the experiment, we decide for three trials how much time a student may require. So I'll get data one, data two, and data three. You can download this data and you can do the analysis. Of course, this is we have made sure that the system is kept as simple as possible. 
and you can proceed to calculation it will ask you a few questions you can enter the data or if you want you can download this data and do your own analysis and find what you have learned from this now in this let me just go back here and start this to show you the we have made this experiment using an interdisciplinary approach in fact this this was created it's very simple but it was created by students with the help of research scholars we have kept a dc motor and once it is given the rotation after that when it is oscillating the motor rotor is also oscillating we made use of that and made it as a generator and depending upon how much a resistance i give i can increase or reduce the damping look at the system parameter modification which we are looking at and we also use some of the computer engineering students to implement see in a computer design i am sure that the computer engineers quite well know they do lot of uh, things to do with exception handling when you put a floppy or a drive it says uh, a drive not detected or file not found all those kind of things interrupts and things of that kind all that at the hardware level we try to implement on this look at now a computer engineer working with a mechanical person with an electrical student working on to create a lab which is accessible from everywhere so this kind of approaches helped us in making sure that we have right kind of a group to work together and all of them experience the basic concept so they are able to help each other as well as they are able to do the pro look at the problem statement in a much better way so from here let me just go back to my presentation so this is what we created center for system design wherein we made sure that every one of them gets an opportunity to look at different kind of problem statements we did something called uh, smart city uh, i think anavar uh, rajan when he was an mtech student here he had opportunity to work with uh, these kind of projects and many of these projects are interdisciplinary and they keep looking at it as there will be a phd student the mtech student and some btech students the group will be in such a way that it is so heterogeneous they keep fighting to make sure others understand what they are and that is one of the major part when it comes to research are you able to convince others about your idea so be it control system but everything has to be done by them that means we create doing engineers rather than reading engineers we also work on uh, software defined radios and amateur radio where we do have facility to transmit and receive and we conduct a lot of tests for many of these dynamic systems roller coasters and things of that kind so that is about how do we create that and are we just looking at only that or we have things more to do with i think we should give this is an interactive session i should give some time for interaction so what i will do is i just look at the interaction portion then i'll have one more slide to show at the end so i'll unshare yeah if you have any interaction at this stage uh, i am willing to take uh, then we can go further and see whether we have some questions coming afterwards and you can also go through the um, research expo which uh, rsd has put there we have put few few of the videos and you can also go back to center for system designs youtube channel each of the 2 minutes video which we have put have sufficient amount of story behind it and we have done multiple research and all that research together we made it as a single video as that because i insist my students to make a video for 2 minutes to tell to his or her grandmother what is the research he did so that we call it as this is in 2 minutes to your grandmother this is in 2 minutes to your grandmother if you are able to talk about your thesis to your grandmother then you have understood the uh, the area which you have worked in so you have become the philosopher of that or if you still need equations and diagrams to talk about your research area you are still in the beginning stage so that's what we have been trying out all the time now if 
I am lucky to get some questions. I can take it. Otherwise, I'll uh, I can continue with one more slide. Uh, sir uh, Arnav here. Good afternoon, yeah. sir. Uh, uh, sir, I have just one thing to ask. Like, uh, while we are uh, doing conducting an experiment in the lab, uh, be it at QG level or PG level, we uh, get a taste of uh, like uh, for a particular experiment, what all. Uh, things we need to assemble and how we need to assemble those uh, particular things so that the experiment runs uh, successfully. Successfully or not, that is a later part, but it runs. So in the virtual lab, do we have such a provision where the student gets a chance to assemble the different items that he will be needing for a particular experiment? Exactly. I mean, this was a question we also kept on asking. And not only that, can I make mistake? In a regular lab, you are not allowed to make a mistake. You cannot take anything uh, a speed which is greater than what is allowed. So in a virtual environment, the understanding is you are not really putting anybody's life into threat in doing an experiment because whatever parameter you want to change, only equations are taken care and no explosion happens. Hence, we are able to take care of you making a mistake. So the learner making a mistake in the virtual lab, one. Second, you can plug and play and put items together and see whether it is working. And for example, you can just go to IIT Gohati's uh, electrical machine lab. You can configure a machine uh, as an induction motor or an DC motor or even uh, different kinds of motors and give different kind of input and see what happens. Sometimes it may run, sometimes it may not run. But in a normal laboratory, what happens is we give all uh, the diagrams and say that just follow this line, do it, and draw the lane, draw the diagram, the efficiency graph. If you remember, from 1960 onwards, everybody in that institute is getting the same graph. I mean, I'm talking about NADK because we are we are born in 1960. So from there onwards, my engine graph was the same. There was no difference. Whereas in a virtual lab environment, because we are able to play with parameters, it is very easy to make such modifications. And we can also give random errors. That is another advantage. Putting a white noise in a sine wave is very easy. And I can even change the parameters in the error and see whether the student is able to conclude appropriately. Those are the advantages without troubling anyone. Without really going to the lab, you will be able to do. You can experience what happens when a parameter changes. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, actually, I also like experienced one such thing uh, in a, a fair, in a science fair. So there they have uh, assembled a virtual setup for welding. Welding, yeah. Yeah, so they were varying the current and voltage to ranges beyond the practical range and showing like what uh, can happen to the material and all. Mm. So yeah, it was a good learning experience. And uh, yeah, if we can integrate it in the virtual lab for the students, scholars and all, it will be it is an in-factor when you said welding. I don't know how many mechanical people are listening. Uh, overhead welding. And what happens if it is a DC welding is used? Uh, positive terminal, how, what is a uh, heat content? And the negative terminal, what is the heat content? Two by third and one by third. So if it is an overhead welding, where I should have the positive, where I should have the negative. And all these become an experience when you're doing it on an experiment at your own comfortable time. Because in the lab, normally a group of students go inside and somebody instructs you to do something and you finish it and come back. Because if you are a slow learner, you feel hesitant to ask questions. If you are a fast learner, you find it is boring because everybody taking too much of a time. So those kind of things can be overcome using virtual lab as an experiential module for basic learning or learning of basics in research environment. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Any uh, other questions? Uh, otherwise, I have something else to show before I can. Yes, sir. Uh, once again, tenor, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity, sir. When I was there in uh, CSP lab during my graduation, post graduation offer. And, um, and that was a great moment uh, where I learned many things. Uh, especially like uh, other subject, uh, design subject, when we take there are a lot of mathematics and other things involved. And uh, I took background or industry background, I used to get it. Not much uh, usual mathematics, but uh, you made me an expert.
fails again in the lab, but then we used to create some product uh, in the research, uh, research also in parallel at the same time. So that is a great experience we had, sir. And um, uh, in CSD and the Star Lab uh, is the source where students learn, in, learn many practical way and uh, they produce the product. That's what I uh, got experience from our CSD lab, sir. So once again, thank for the, again this opportunity to through this uh, meet as well. Sir. Okay. Thank you. So sir. before you officially conclude, I want to show one more slide. Yes, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Yes, sir. So I'll once again sure, screen. You're able to see my screen. Okay. Uh, give me a moment. I think I, I, I just came out of the PPT. I, I'll just uh, come back with that PPT. One, give me one moment. I'm just getting back my I'm back uh, with the, the big So this is about uh, research and I'm on mute, no? Uh, so this was a <coughs> problem statement where a car fell down in a river uh, and a normal crane came to take the car okay so for a crane uh, it's a normal work uh, this happens and uh, they are happy and likewise researchers are happy when we get a problem so we did not have plastics and we created plastic as a uh, as an output of research and created a bigger problem and we are trying to solve that now similarly here the car fell down and a crane the tool came in order to solve the problem and for such a problem, the crane was sufficient. It was something very simple. And a linear analysis was enough to solve this. Hence, we applied the linear analysis, uh, appropriate tools, all that we did. And there was absolutely nothing to worry. And problem is about to be solved. And we are in the final pre-synopsis condition or a synopsis condition. And look at what happens. Now you realize what is that you didn't take care, why the results came so wrong. So it was a simple problem, but finally the answer or the conclusion was disastrous. So obviously your research grade have given you ultimatum saying that no, what you have done is pure linear analysis, but your system was behaving non-linear. Hence you need a much more sophisticated tool. Obviously you started searching and you got a very sophisticated tool which can do 
much complex analysis. And you had the first problem statement, remember? And that was easily solved. But the gate was sh sharp enough, your Guruji uh, was sharp enough. Is that any way you have created one more problem? Because you have broken something and put it together. Please solve that, then submit your thesis and go. Quite often that happens when we have solved something, we found a much bigger problem aside. Uh, obviously, we'll have the inquisitiveness to, can I solve even that? So now the small problem is solved. Remember, your basics were the same. You were as clear as earlier when the initial tool failed. And you took, you solved the big, smaller problem which you have taken up in the beginning. But now you have much better confidence because you are using much complex tool which can do much more things. Hence, you are attempting the next problem also. So the problem which we have created now and that need to be attempted to solve. And remember, we have the same basics and see what happens. So this is a point where we would like to highlight. Your tool can do as much understanding as you have. Tool may give you more options, more complex analysis, unless and otherwise we are strong in the basics, any complex tool is going to give you wrong thing. So you saw the first linear analysis gave you a wrong result and that was a catastrophe. Finally, you learned a bigger tool to operate and even there, you found out it is miserable just because you did not know how to take care of simple CG or the learner or the researcher did not know how to take care of the CG. And this is what happens quite often at the end of the research when our basics were, are very, very, very uh, poor. And to avoid such situations, we would strongly recommend get into experiential learning, get into experiential learning so that you know the basics very clearly. On that adding, whether it is linear analysis or non-linear analysis become a happy moment. Otherwise it's going to be all with a very poor foundation. We are trying to make a large building and a huge structure over that. So my strong suggestion to all the research scholar is get into experiential learning every basic step Please experience it yourself. Then you can become a philosopher in the domain which you are working. Thank you very much for a patient listening. Uh, hope uh, I have made it as light as possible with no equations and no huge amount of uh, what we did kind of a statement I have made to make sure that it is as light as possible for an evening talk. Thank you very much for this opportunity and look at the experiential learning as a real activity to make your research better. Thank you. I'm, I'm closed. I have closed the talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for being here and for delivering such a beautiful and well crafted talk. We will surely look up to the advices so that we can take up experiential learning at every sector of our PhD journey. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
We'll start the session now. Hello. Hello, sir. Welcome. Hi. You hear me Good okay? Uh, we'll start the session now, sir. Good. Good evening, everyone. Welcome all to the session of Research College Day 2021. RSD 2021 has started with a variety of events ranging from lecture series to interactive talks and workshops to competitions. It aims to bring together great minds from different backgrounds and facilitate exchange of ideas and research interests. We welcome all the participants to the keynote le uh, lecture session on future of space transportation by Mr. Jim Cantrell, the co-founder and CEO of Phantom Space Corporation. It's a great pleasure and honor for us to have Mr. Jim Cantrell here in RSG 2021. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, here is a short intro about the, about the speaker. Mr. Jim Cantrell is the co-founder and CEO of Phantom Space Corporation. He is the co-founder of several entrepreneurial startups, including Vector Launch, Stratspace, and Vintage Exotics Competition Engineering. Mr. Jim Cantrell has played multiple roles and worked in multiple environments throughout his career. He completed his BS and MS in Mechanical Engineering from Utah State University. He worked as a research engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he worked on mass exploration missions. He has worked on a joint French Soviet mission in a French space agency. He has experience over uh, 46 satellite missions. He then worked on several joint missile defense programs conducted between America and Russia. Mr. Jim was one of the co-founders of SpaceX, serving as the vice president of business development. He helped the development of Falcon 1 launch vehicle. He has pioneered the concepts of micro launch vehicles and space situational awareness sensors. He has served on corporate boards of several aerospace companies. He also has a deep interest and actively participates in road racing. Now I invite Mr. Jim Cantrell to deliver his keynote lecture. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you guys uh, staying, uh, staying into the evening here to hear me. It's uh, morning time here in Arizona as the uh, sun comes up. So i um, glad to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to use a slide deck here and just a second. All right, can you see that okay? Yes, sir, we can see that. Great, thank you. So what I'm gonna talk about today is what I see as the future of space transportation and uh, where I think uh, we are in it and where I think it's going. Uh, what I tell people uh, when I'm talking about Phantom Space, uh, which is a uh, space transportation company, not, not coincidentally, um, is that to me right now, the, the uh, future space economy is really a very, very infant uh, economy. It's the very, very beginning of something very large. Uh, much like the New World was to the Spaniards in the 1500s, some, some hundreds of years ago. Uh, at that point, if you were standing on the shores of Spain, you might see the, the Spanish galleons going to and from the New World, and you might know that they were bringing gold back, but you, you would have no clue as to what the, what the uh, actual future uh, economic potential of the New World was. And we can see now, uh, after trillions and trillions of dollars of value generated in the new world, how absolutely large and influential that economy has been on the future of humanity. I think space transportation uh, is, is that, that uh, Spanish galleon going off to a similar kind of place that we, as of today, have absolutely no idea exactly of what will be there and how we will make create value and how we make money off of it but it's it's clearly a destiny for for humans and uh, we will uh, we will be a part of that all right let me see if I can get there we go um, so I'm going to start with something old uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the New York skyline in uh, the late 1800s if you've been in New York City, you uh, know that it looks quite different today. This is what it looked like uh, over 150 years ago. And you'll notice that there are not very many buildings that are very tall. And one of the reasons that is, is because there are no elevator uh, technologies 
in, in this time. And the uh, buildings were pretty much limited to three and four stories, the amount that humans could easily walk up and down. So by this point, however, you can see that the island itself was fairly crowded uh, horizontally, but uh, vertically it was very short. And uh, what it looks like today is quite different. Um, you see that it's grown vertically. It's also just as, as uh, crowded horizontally. And the uh, technology that, uh, that enabled this was elevators. And essentially what elevators did in New York City was to expand the real estate vertically. If you think about it, the amount of floor space that's in each one of these buildings uh, has uh, doubled, tripled, quadrupled the amount of uh, space that humans can exist and work in in the city, and so this is a very um, uh, a, a very fundamental transformation of the uh, of the New York skyline. So, in my way of looking at the world, the launch systems that we're working on today really are the future's elevators. And uh, they are uh, the thing that uh, will transform our terrestrial existence into the equivalent of the New York skyline of uh, many, many other places we can live and work and create value. So I think at space commerce, even though we don't know what it is, it's clear that it's going certain directions. Uh, what, what is going to be tomorrow is, you know, is uh, anybody's guess at this point. If we, if we all knew that, I guess we would uh, maybe be in the stock market <laughs> and betting on those, those things. But what, what I can tell you is that today it's, it's a very hardware-centric economy. Uh, it uh, requires a lot of uh, capital expense uh, to start a space company is almost always more than $10 million today. Uh, and it takes you years to create a new a new capability. Tomorrow, uh, the vision I see is that it's becoming like the rest of the tech economy, software centric, uh, and that will lower the capital expense required uh, to fairly reasonable values, much like uh, the terrestrial economy. And uh, as a result of this, we will be able to uh, deploy new capabilities in space in months rather than years. So this is this is an optimistic view, I think, but I think it's uh, clear that this trend is happening. And once this happens, you'll see more and more people around the world becoming involved in the space economy. Uh, you know, when I got into it 30 years ago, it was uh, for all purposes an intense a boys' club uh, where it was a small group of people who had a very specialized tribal knowledge of how to make these things work, and uh, you were admitted. Uh, based on your education and your uh, workplace. And uh, it was uh, the thing that we always looked for was an ability to be on a project and get something flown. Whereas today, you see uh, a lot of the graduates of the universities and so on uh, going out and starting their own space uh, companies and uh, just doing it. So rather than having to join the club. And uh, th that will draw in more and more people as we um, as we go forward into the future and uh, spread the uh, spread both the value creation in space, but also uh, how many people participate in it. So I see it as a very bright future that way. So right now, what we have happening is a disruptive technology we call microsats. And in the past, we've had uh, very large satellites. Um, this is a uh, a geostationary satellite on the left. You can see it roughly in the scale relative to a human. Uh, they weigh as much as a large bus that you might ride around a city. Um, and uh, they, they cost lots and lots of money, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they require very large launch systems and typically take four years to develop. But now we have micro satellites, which uh, you can buy parts for on the internet. Uh, you certainly can't buy parts for the uh, large communication satellites on the internet. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, this has uh, become something that's, that's uh, very inexpensive because of the uh, supply chain. They're, they're small compared to, you know, the human scale. And uh, they're also much, much cheaper. I've seen uh, some of these CubeSats being built for as little as uh, $10,000. Uh, 
and uh, typically build in a very short period of time. So this is becoming very disruptive. Um, the latest numbers I've seen uh, just last week uh, were 35,000 satellites over the next 10 years are going to be flown. Uh, this compares with, say, 20 years ago when we might have 30 satellites in the entire year uh, be built and flown. So you can you can understand that that uh, that disruption from that. Uh, we we have as part of that the size disruption, and I won't say that size has created these these um, uh, great numbers, but on the other hand, uh, it's been a rule of thumb in in the space industry that every every kilogram of spacecraft costs you ten thousand dollars to build, and that's a fairly reasonable uh, uh, approximation. And uh, so based on that, uh, people are building much smaller stuff because it's cheaper to launch and cheaper to build. And you can see here the uh, proliferation of satellites back in uh, the 90s. You had very, very few that were uh, below 1,000 kilograms. In fact, when I first got into this business, small satellites were con considered to be 1,000 kilograms or less. And really now what we're talking about is microsats in the 10 to 100 kilogram range and cubesats in the 10 to 1 kilogram range. And you can see how this is continuing to proliferate. Um, you know, future projections of this show an even stronger proliferation. And the other interesting thing about this, this, these data is you see this top line here, sort of a that's formed uh, by the top of the of the of the dots here. Uh, that's geostationary telecommunication satellites. You can see they've gotten bigger and bigger over time as the launch vehicles have gotten bigger to take them there. And you can think of geostationary uh, space being, uh, you know, much like a beach on Waikiki or any any place where a lot of people want to be. It's very limited, uh, high expensive property. And so uh, like Waikiki in Hawaii, uh, or, or, or Honolulu and Hawaii, you can uh, you can uh, imagine why people build skyscrapers there because they want to make the most money off of limited real estate. So the other thing is that uh, the commercial satellites are starting to be made by the hundreds. This is uh, Planet Labs' uh, image of their factory in San Francisco. This is in downtown San Francisco on Second Street, um, and this is an example of how many satellites they might have ready for launch. Uh, they have launched somewhere north of uh, 400 satellites now, and uh, they've been doing very interesting things with these. They're, they're imager satellites, uh, but but some of the first truly mass manufactured uh, uh, CubeSats that I'm aware of. And they, they are creating what Planet Labs calls a breathing, a living breathing image cloud of Earth. And uh, there, there's an enormous amount of value that can be created from this. Uh, traditionally, observation satellites would uh, fly over a spot several times a day. Uh, the swarm of satellites would fly over many spots in various times a day, various kinds of lighting, and get really some unusual and interesting data. And enough of them are happening that you can get some pretty frequent updates on the data. So, so this has led to the potential to do a lot of things with the satellite imagery data that's never been done before, um, such as monitoring, uh, you know, the the uh, the uh, conditions on the Earth and using uh, artificial intelligence learning algorithms to look at things like what's the real oil storage capacity in the world. You can see that from the top because the tops of the oil oil storage uh, facilities drop as the amount of oil in them drops. And, uh, you know, we find out that, uh, for example, in that domain, that uh, not all countries report true numbers. <laughs> for example, you can also monitor environmental impacts of, of human activity. You can uh, monitor human, uh, human growth in the cities. The other thing uh, that we've seen done with these very CubeSats is monitoring places like North Korea. Um, I was involved in this program uh, a number of years ago where the Pentagon came to us and said, uh, you know, gee, our, our, our traditional satellites are being uh, hidden from by the, by the North Koreans who know when they come over, can we use commercial imagery to set up a, 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 a 
neighborhood watch program on North Korea. At the time, the U.S. Department of Defense was unable to predict when the North Koreans were going to do missile tests uh, or, or uh, even worse, uh, nuclear weapons tests. And uh, so, so uh, uh, we put a program together to use this imagery to uh, set up a neighborhood watch program. And it worked out very well. Um, and we were able to track these uh, activities and correlate these activities for less than $10 million. And uh, in the Pentagon, you can't start a program uh, really unless it begins with a B in terms of the dollar amount, billions of dollars. So uh, this, was a, this was a great success and it shows how even uh, you know, military activities will be transformed by commercial space. So the other thing that you can say is of these CubeSats, this was uh, light sail one and two, uh, which I was uh, somewhat my brainchild. And uh, I, I uh, led the effort to build. And uh, it's the only private object or human object uh, that, that's capable of interstellar voyage using sunlight as a propulsion or any light, as, as a matter of fact, photonic propulsion to move out into the universe. It is uh, flying right now in Earth orbit, still still operating very well uh, for about four years now. Um, but uh, this was all privately built and it was uh, done with donations uh, from uh, individuals who believed in the idea of interstellar flight. But it just shows you that as this technology evolves, it becomes disruptive in many different ways. You know, we see economically, we see militarily, and now we see in terms of exploration that these are, are disruptive in every way. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, terrestrial transportation then, uh, let's talk about that for a moment, uh, typically involves, you know, people walking, getting on buses, you've got trams, you've got uh, 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 water transportation systems, you've got trains, you've got buses, cars, airplanes, and so forth. Um, and this is the traditional view of this. What we uh, sometimes forget to talk about, though, is the role of space transportation on Earth. It is new. It is um, something that is uh, coming along, but it is becoming, and I think in the future will be considered a, a core part of our, our uh, space tra our terrestrial transportation system. So let's um, step back a little bit again. Um, when I was very young, uh, men walked on the moon. And uh, this, however, in those days was really only something that nation states did. And up until very recently, uh, space exploration or launching of satellites into space was almost uh, universally only things that nation states did. That's, that's changing. They, uh, this was another uh, major milestone in, in my childhood, believe it or not. I can remember when the first shuttle launched uh, back around 1980. And uh, this, was, uh, this was our entire space transportation system in the United States. Uh, we got rid of many of our expendable launch vehicles uh, in favor of the shuttle. And again, the, the scale of the development of this kind of system was only something that nation states could do. The Soviets also had a similar program. Um, I had the opportunity to actually see the Soviet shuttles, uh, which one of which flew, the rest of which didn't. They had a fleet of four of them and uh, that they were in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. And, uh, you know, obviously billions and billions of dollars spent there as well. So, you know, only nation states can afford this. Only nation states could, could gather up all the the uh, intellectual uh, uh, brain power needed to uh, put this together. And so, so it went. But today things are different. And we see SpaceX, uh, which I had a small early role in, um, has done amazing things. And uh, they have uh, really uh, uh, done things that the government can't or wouldn't and uh, has inspired all of us in the process. And uh, I would say it's safe to say that, um, that SpaceX has made space safe for investment dollars. And that capital then has driven, you know, even more demand for uh, companies like SpaceX. So you see uh, them really, I see them really as the pioneers in 
not commercial space necessarily, but the way they've done commercial space. And you know, commercial space has been around easily since the 60s with the communication satellites, but in, in many ways it mimicked the nation state kind of activities, still very large, still very capital intensive. And to do, to do risky things, you actually have to bring the capital investment down because risk uh, disinvites capital and lower risk invites capital. So we've, we've hit that, that, uh, that, that, that inflection point in the risk versus capital curve. And a lot of that is due to SpaceX and what they've done. This, this is the double uh, landing of the, uh, the Falcon Heavy boosters. Uh, not only was this, this technically magnificent, it was a, a showmanship of, of high order. And uh, I remember watching this about four years ago, five years ago, as it happened. And uh, it was uh, something that brought a tear to my eye just to see this. This was a, a major event, uh, I think, for, for this industry. So, you know, the other thing that uh, private industry is now doing is in, in this country is, is the human transport. And uh, we saw just about a year ago, uh, the first uh, astronauts launched on a, on a privately funded and built rocket. And that was uh, something that was uh, unthinkable uh, some, some 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. Uh, most people didn't believe it would happen, but we watched it and we, we witnessed it. And uh, what a magnificent achievement for SpaceX. So tomorrow, um, we're already seeing this, that uh, private citizens will be going into space, some for the sheer pleasure of it, some on their own private scientific expeditions, and some maybe even searching for a new place to live. Uh, and yes, people ask me all the time, uh, do I think SpaceX is going to Mars? And the answer is absolutely yes. I can tell you in the very beginning, one of the reasons Elon called me was um, to uh, look at Russian rockets for ideas he had to invigorate this idea that humans could uh, go to other planets. And uh, that was really the main reason behind his wanting to get into the space business. And as we, um, as we worked together, um, you know, we worked on a Mars mission that could, could put a plant on the surface of Mars to inspire the idea of terraforming Mars from a dry, barren place to a green uh, place that, uh, that maybe has uh, flowing water on the surface and so on by uh, creating uh, uh, plant life on the, on the surface that uh, consumes the carbon dioxide and produces oxygen. So there, there was no doubt that Elon's intent has always been to go to Mars as a so-called backup to Earth. And uh, I, think, I think we'll see it uh, probably in my lifetime uh, where uh, SpaceX will go. So this is always what I imagine the future to be, uh, the Starship Enterprise. You know, I grew up watching Star Trek um, and uh, I, I, I didn't see the future turning out as it has, uh, but we all knew at some point, even in the, in the 60s and 70s, that humans would be venturing off into space and uh, permanently uh, living there uh, for some of us. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, but uh, you know, may maybe this uh, maybe this future that uh, was envisioned uh, will will become true eventually. the The problem really is right now uh, with space transportation is launch is hard, especially the large launch. And, and if you launch people into space, the launch vehicles have to be large. Um, you can't uh, cram humans into small cans send them into space and expect them to live there. Uh, if you've ever seen, you know, a Mercury capsule or a, an Apollo capsule, even in say the, the Smithsonian Museum or any of the museums in the United States, you know that they are very small. I'm, I'm a very large person and uh, I would get very claustrophobic inside such a capsule and probably cramped. Uh, I know after several hours in a car, I don't feel so good. Uh, and I have to get out and walk around. I can't imagine you know, flying in a, in a space capsule that size. So launch needs to be large. And, uh, you know, we need to deploy things like space stations into space. And uh, this is, uh, this is very, uh, very uh, difficult to do financially. It's very difficult to do technically. All right, hold on a second here. 
so the other part of it is large launch is very capital intensive. You can see here a, a space shuttle main engine uh, being transported. You know, just the sheer size of these things is is impressive and immense, and uh, everything about it is expensive. And uh, as you know, I mentioned earlier, ten thousand dollars per kilogram. Um, you know, you've got a lot of kilograms here. So uh, these are these are some of the most sophisticated engines that have ever been built in the world to launch the space shuttle. And uh, we see versions of this now on the uh, NASA space launch system and so forth. So, so everything about it becomes, becomes difficult, but uh, where there's a will, there's going to be a solution, I think. So in, in many ways, you don't, I don't find this distressing because if you look at public transportation systems, they're the same, you know, train rail systems, uh, the prices start with billions of dollars and they uh, transport a lot of people. Uh, but but there's something that takes many years to develop. So there's an analogy here between launching humans into space and the public transportation systems. And the evolution will continue and uh, things will get better and more dense and, and, uh, and, and the human transportation systems into space will continue to evolve. Uh, there, there's no doubt. And uh, so for me, the public transportation system analogy works very well. And I think there's a space, a place for, for space transportation system terrestrially going from point to point. If you look at a uh, spaceship that's being developed in Texas, and, I, and I'll just add as a, as a side note, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting story to watch. It's fascinating uh, how uh, SpaceX continues to fly these spaceships. They, they build them, they fly them, they destroy them, they build another, they fly them destroy it they're learning this is uh, this is something no government would ever do incidentally um, the governments are very uh, risk intolerant and uh, subject to public public uh, opinions and uh, politics and could not withstand the sort of uh, public failures that that uh, spaceship has been uh, experiencing yes SpaceX can SpaceX can because they've proven that they they can do things and they can make things happen. And so you see the public opinion, which really doesn't matter, incidentally, uh, very tolerant of the, of the failures. More importantly, is their investors and, and their, their internal management does support this. So you know, Elon's obviously very supportive of it. So when you watch that, you have to ask yourself, you know, spaceship is so big. What in the world is it meant for? And, um, you know, obviously, uh, uh, launching humans into space is one of the stated goals for it. But one of the less stated goals that I think is really going to be a reality is going from point to point on Earth. If you look at the cost of them doing this, um, you, you know, we may be in an era uh, by the end of my lifetime where I can go from Arizona to New Delhi in uh, an hour. And, uh, you know, I could come give you the speech and be back in the same day with a transportation system like this. Uh, so it becomes effectively the physical equivalent of our, of our internet, being able to move things around very quickly on the surface of the earth for very, very economical uh, costs. So I believe that's one of the very, very um, strong uh, uses of the uh, Starship. So let's go back to something a little more relatable for most of us, um, which is the automobile. And this is what I call bespoke transportation. It's uh, really tailored to us as individuals or maybe families. And uh, it's, it's more equivalent to, I think, a second class of launch that's, that's evolving. I really see the economics of the space transportation system being balanced between, on the left, we have large reusable launch like SpaceX is perfecting. And then on the right, we have small mass manufactured launch. And so these two economic systems in, in transportation, I think will coexist. I, they're competitive in the sense that, you know, they're all, they're all transporting the same thing, much like the automobile and, and airplanes, for example. But we have a uh, completely different sub-market that it will appeal to, uh, but a very large sub-market. All right. So I go back again to the turn of the century and a man named Henry Ford 
it was uh, here in this in this image. And uh, he had from the beginning, and he, by the way, he had two failures before he had a third success. Uh, most people don't know that Ford Motor Company, uh, it was, was his third try. And uh, he had this idea that he could produce cars for every person. And uh, if you go back to the turn of the century, automobiles were really play toys for the rich. They were things that only wealthy families could own. Uh, that that specialized operators uh, could could drive, and uh, Mercedes Benz famously uh, stated that the worldwide market for cars was something like three thousand vehicles because of the limitation of the skilled driver base. And while that might be intellectually uh, uh, correct uh, at the time, it was uh, massively incorrect in in its eventuality. And Henry Ford created. A car then that instead of costing something like uh, 20 times the average person's salary, he created one that the average person could afford uh, and would be less than a year of their salary. And this was the Model T. So through mass manufacturing, uh, which it's, it's really almost difficult to believe that nobody had come up with this concept until the early uh, 20th century, uh, Henry Ford really put mass manufacturing into play and uh, really built all of that, that infrastructure that became the automotive industry. And uh, the, the concepts were rather simple. Uh, all the cars were made pretty much the same. And they were, uh, his, his famous words were, you can have any color you like as long as it's black. Uh, they were made on a rolling assembly line. Each worker who would assemble a part of the car uh, acted in a, in a, capacity where they did the same thing over and over again. So they became experts at, for example, putting the lights on or experts at uh, dropping the engine in or experts at, at bolting the front seat in. And that's what they did all day long. And so as the next car arrived, the uh, person would uh, bolt, the, bolt the seat in and et cetera, next car and so on. So uh, as a result, uh, Henry Ford discovered what's called the learning curve uh, which uh, found that each successive car got less and less expensive, and uh, you could uh, you could provide these cars at a very affordable price. Most of the new automobiles you go out and buy right now for say twenty thirty thousand dollars. If you bought the first unit cost from from say Ford Motor Company, that would really be a hundred million dollar car or more, and uh, that 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 cost has been amortized over a large number of units and therefore has become a lot cheaper so that we can all afford it. The same thing is happening in space. And that's with our next generation of micro launchers. You may wonder why everybody is focused on small launchers. The, the idea is that it holds promise, uh, has yet to be proven, frankly, but it holds promise that it can be as inexpensive on a per kilogram basis as large launchers. It, it, it turns out Large launch vehicles are very efficient economically, and you can get, uh, for example, with uh, the Falcon 9, down to around three or four thousand dollars a kilogram for launching objects into space. But you have to buy the whole space, and uh, so that's either a lot of micro satellites or a very large satellite. With uh, micro launchers, we think we can get down to one or two thousand uh, dollars per kilogram and be able to do it in much smaller packages that become relevant to a customer or satellite operator who would like to uh, deploy a smaller constellation or single unit, small satellites and so forth. So the Electron is really the only one that's that's flying right now. It's built by Rocket Lab in New Zealand. Uh, had some involvement early on with these, these uh, folks, a, a very talented group. Um, uh, there's other companies such as Phantom. Uh, I'm one of probably five or other companies that that are uh, doing this uh, and uh, will be coming online in the next few years. And we all have competing ideas about how to do this, uh, but uh, I can tell you I'm one of the few who are really thinking about how we do uh, mass manufacturing and mass launching of these of these these uh, these launchers, which I think is the other the other next uh, uh, problem to solve. So really, when you talk about you know, small versus large, you know, you've got a, a number of um, 
of different uh, characteristics that you have to think about. Um, you know, the, the small uh, launch can be low cost if you can do enough of them. And uh, the reusable launch, if, even if you don't do a lot of them, there's fairly low cost because you're just launching a lot of mass. But they tend to be low, low responsive because, uh, you, you know, you're, you're fixed to a schedule that uh, in the case of Space Launch System, which is the SLS and the NASA vehicle, they're planning on launching that one, once every two or three years. And uh, so you got to wait around for that. Uh, but if you're doing high rate launch, you know, it may be a launch a week out there and you can jump on the bus uh, when it suits your schedule. So, so these are the, the kinds of things you have to look at. And one of the reasons why really the, uh, the, the market is going to the right on this chart into high rate small launch and then reusable large launch. Uh, so, so the other thing of going down in, in scale is the development costs uh, exponentially reduced. So, so you can kind of see some of the small launchers from the Electron up to the SLS, you know, how, how much physically different they are. And uh, the Falcon, for example, was about a half a billion dollar, or sorry, yeah, about a half a billion dollar development uh, cost on that. Whereas uh, the Electron was closer to about $150 million. And uh, you can see just the difference on that. So it's a lot easier to raise the capital for the small launchers as well. And the capital is willing to take bigger risks on that. So that's why you see a lot of innovation happening in that, in that area. So I talked earlier about you know, how small launch can, um, uh, can, can match the large launch cost efficiency. Typically, you know, large launch is between $2,500 and $7,500 a kilogram. And uh, although nobody buys on the kilogram basis, they look at absolute launch price. Uh, that is a, it's a measure of, of, of efficiency. So as you, as you watch this uh, and you, you see that, you know, you can get up to 100, 200, 1,000 uh, kinds of uh, launches, uh, you, you can get not only competitive with large launch, but even more competitive um, if, if it's the right size. And uh, so that's the real competition that's going to happen in the future is how do we get to the point where we've launched several hundred of these, maybe even several thousand of these, and uh, can be even more cost competitive than large launch. And uh, that, that, that's where uh, the winners and losers are going to uh, happen in this industry over the next decade. So, you know, when you talk about mass manufacturing rockets, people think of, uh, you know, and I even use the, the uh, Henry Ford analogy. They, they think of, um, uh, you know, millions of these coming out the door. And what we're really talking about is hundreds of, of a year. We're not talking about uh, uh, even tens of thousands of a year. And, you know, the analogy I use again is automobiles. If you look at how Maserati did it in the 60s, uh, which is the way rockets are built today, the large ones, um, you know, they would build hundreds of cars a year. That was it. In, in uh, I think it was uh, 1972, they had about 400 cars total. They came out of the factory. You know, today they're in the uh, tens of thousands, uh, uh, not not quite up to the millions, but you know they, they have a fundamentally different way of doing it. In the old days, they would have one car, one person that would build the entire car, and it would sit in one place. And uh, when that was done, it was done, and it would go out the door. Whereas today it's a they've converted to a, a Ford style uh, rolling uh, assembly line. That's really all we have to do to uh, micro launch is uh, is to, to convert to something like that. So the, the launch manufacturing um, is is actually easy. The manufacturing part's fairly easy. Uh, it's it's all about you know process engineering. It's about manufacturing engineering designed for manufacturability and getting enough uh, factory capacity and people, skilled, skilled labor to, to put it together. It's not a particularly difficult problem. The real problem is, is uh, the, the launch infrastructure, the launch sites and uh, where we can launch from. So right now, the way public safety is treated in the United States and most of the world, I would say, is launch is done from very remote sites away from people and uh, Maybe not so much in Florida anymore, but it's it's definitely launched out over the ocean where there are less people. And uh, uh, in the case of non-SpaceX flights, 
uh, typically the first stage is dropped into the ocean and uh, never recovered. Um, whereas SpaceX has started to recover that that stage through um, through return flight. Um, there, there's some interesting things that happen if you start thinking about you know, launching hundreds of these a year now. First thing you start thinking about is what do a hundred floating boosters in the ocean do to the environment? And uh, you can think of a lot of things, but none of them are really good. Uh, the other thing is, is the national security implications of hundreds of these boosters floating out in the ocean. Uh, again, none of those are good. And then you start to think about uh, you know, the economics of it. And you, certainly if you're reusing the stages, that's better. So I think uh, the future will be almost, even the small ones, almost all of them will have a reusable first stage. Even the Falcon 1, by the way, we plan to reuse. And uh, that's part of what I worked on was the uh, parachute system to recover the first stage. And those first few flights, uh, the, the recovery didn't work out so well. Uh, that's why SpaceX transitioned to the uh, to the landing leg uh, uh, concept later on. And, uh, you know, I can tell you that um, the only way that, that we'll be able to launch a lot of rockets in the future will, buy, will be to grow away from the traditional federal ranges such as Cape Canaveral, Vandenberg, uh, wherever in the world uh, where rockets are licensed to launch now, uh, we'll have to expand those numbers of sites uh, over time and really the only places that are likely to be able to launch from is not just over water, but will over maybe, maybe a, a desolate, uh, uh, low population territories, such as Southern Arizona, where I live. And uh, to do that, really, though, you'll have to have a uh, returnable first stage so that we control the disposition of that asset. It's in, in fact, no different than, a, um, than an aircraft. You know, you watch a 747 fly, out of Tokyo, for example, uh, you know, you have you know, hundreds of people aboard a vehicle that has tens of thousands of gallons of, of kerosene and a very flammable liquid and a flying out over millions of, of people, literally over the houses. And we don't blink at it. But, but yet a rocket, which has often a whole lot less explosive capacity, um, you know, flying out over the ocean, people get all upset about. So as, as space becomes more normal, and we can recover the assets and do it reliably, then the comfort level with flying, you see, out of Kansas, out of Texas, out of Arizona, uh, out of other places in the world where there's not a lot of people around will become more and more tolerant. And eventually we'll see rocket launches from all sorts of places in the world uh, once we can reliably uh, recover the, uh, the, the first stage. So the other thing you can look at for adoption of this small, uh, massive launched uh, capabilities, what I call micro mobility. And if you live anywhere near a city or been in a city uh, and COVID's put a dent in this, I'm sure uh, I haven't been out since COVID, uh, you know, to see how this is going in the cities, but um, you know, as, as a pre COVID, this was a very rapidly adopted technology where you can ride these scooters uh, from place to place and just drop them off. You put your credit card in it. And then you drop them off at your destination. And then uh, there's a system that picks it up. And uh, really something we had never imagined until recently. And, and I remember going to an automotive conference in Germany about four years ago, and somebody predicted the massive um, adoption of this. And this was just as Uber was starting to be adopted worldwide. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly, I couldn't believe this. Um, but the truth is that it, that it did. And, uh, you know, we watched as uh, e-scooters and that uh, the adoption rate uh, just went, went through the ceiling very, very rapidly. It's much more than car sharing and bike sharing and so forth. And so one of the things that's interesting is as to why that happened. And um, so as you, as you look at the data and you look at the industry, you start to find out that the e-scooters were, were able to um, expand their presence and, 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 and have such a high adoption rate due to two factors. One, the very low capital expense required for somebody to start one of these companies up. And number two was the ability uh, to scale the numbers of these uh, very rapidly. So, so the second part requires a supply chain that uh, allows the, uh, the number of scooters to be built to be high. 
So you have lithium batteries, which we all know have uh, become very common in our life, along with the uh, scooters themselves, uh, you know, the, 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 the hardware and, the, and the, uh, the computer and the software that go with it is, is readily available. So between that and the small scale of the hardware, which made them cheap to build, uh, they proliferated and people adopted to using them. So what we're starting to see, and this is the analogy with the small launch, is it, to me, they're kind of like the e-scooters. Uh, they've got all the same attributes. We're starting to see the supply chain, the small launch come along and uh, the, the relative affordability of it is, relative to the big rockets is, is, uh, is quite, quite high. So, so while they're not quite the price of e-scooters yet, uh, I think the analogy still holds very nicely. So what we'll end up with is a, a new transportation model of you know a million to four million dollars per flight and flights of a hundred per year, and that'll fundamentally change the economics of the space uh, industry, and it will change the way people uh, create space uh, companies and deploy space companies. It'll change the way governments use space. It'll change the way space is accessed completely. And uh, th this new transportation model will not uh, uh, displace large launches in the tens per years. It'll merely supplement them and, and facilitate and fuel the growth, I believe. So, you know, ultimately, um, we're at the very beginning of this uh, competition of small launch vehicles, but hopefully you understand a little bit better uh, what role they play in the future of, of space transportation. So yet I'm gonna start talking now about something much bigger, which is uh, uh, how humans are going to move out into the cosmos. And uh, first it's kind of important to understand at our core, we're still a very wandering species. We, um, we all possess some amount of curiosity about what's around the next corner, uh, what we have, uh, uh, ahead of us, uh, are, there, are there better places to be? This is what drove early humans out of the uh, out of the birthplace of our species into better hunting grounds, uh, ultimately around the world, uh, to places like India, to places like North America, and so forth. And it's what drove the Europeans away over to find the the quote new world unquote and uh, settle that and, and create what has become modern day America. And uh, we're gonna do the same thing in space. That's because this is what we do. And this is wired into our DNA as part of who we are. And uh, we, we, we can never deny it. This is why movies such as uh, Star Wars and Star Trek are so powerful and uh, so popular is that it, it touches that part of our DNA that we all have some more than others, uh, but, but that we all ultimately respond to. And uh, so I, I say that our import, most important revolution in space has begun uh, the human, human movement into the cosmos. And uh, this was, uh, this was the, this famous shuttle backpack, uh, but it represents you know, man alone in space with a, with a small machine uh, that I think is, is, is representative of the future of our species in space. So like we settled the new world here in North America, humanity will move into space and uh, become a, a permanent resident there. Uh, it may be in my lifetime, it may be in your lifetime, or it may be in our children's lifetime, but it certainly will happen. Uh, I'm becoming more and more optimistic that it will happen sooner rather than later, which is very exciting to me. Um, you know, one of my first jobs and this business was on a Mars mission. And uh, I spent a lot of time imagining what it would be like on Mars. We were building a balloon to float on Mars. And of course you, you, you have to imagine, you know, what is the surface like, you know, that we have to uh, contend with and, you know, what, what, what would the cameras pick up and what would the panoramas look like? So the idea of, you know, humans actually going there and seeing this is uh it's tremendously exciting for me, given sort of my historical interest in this sort of thing. And I think uh, it's one of the few things that actually brings all of us humans together, like the Apollo missions. Uh, that, was a, that was a human triumph, not an American triumph. It was an American triumph, but it was more a human triumph. 
And uh, I think the same thing will happen with Mars. So it's rare in this day and age, in any day and age, actually, to have something that we do as a species that actually brings us together as a species. So uh, that, that's the other side of this that excites me. Um, and when we first started talking about this, in fact, I, I can't say we started talking about it when I got into this business. I inherited the discussion had been going on forever um, about how we go to Mars and uh, how, we, how, we, how we send people into space. And it was always something when I was early in this business, you know, we would complain about NASA can't do this and NASA won't do that. And NASA needs this and NASA needs that. Well, most of us that, you know, got frustrated by that early in life uh, got pissed off and we just went and started doing it ourselves. And that's really, it's really the motivation that started SpaceX. It's really the motivation that's uh, led to a lot of what we see now and, in private space that uh, we're just tired of waiting around for governments. In fact, governments can't do it alone. And uh, the only reasons governments did it in the beginning were, was that there was a strategic need for it and uh, they could afford it. And uh, really, in a lot of ways, uh, it's, a, it's a creature of the Cold War uh, that got started, the, the, the lunar missions and so on, the competition between communism and capitalism and so on. Um, but today it's a different story altogether and governments are really just an end user of space rather than a, uh, uh, uh an entity that, that develops it. So I think it's important to understand this and to recognize that, that they're not ever going to be the solution to it. Um, I call it the Halon strategy. Uh, it, it, you know, as I looked at this, um, at, at this government dominance of the industry, uh, and I wanted to change it. Yeah, you know, I, there was a lot of ways you could do it. You could try to take it on and destroy it and replace it. And that's, that's a fool's errand because uh, government protects itself. They won't, uh, they won't give up what they view as their rightful role in this business and so on. So instead, you create the equivalent of halon. You just take the oxygen away and, and it withers and becomes, becomes something that survives the, the new conditions. And you do that by creating what we have today, which is a private uh, sector that moves so much faster than the government ever did uh, that they are forced to just adopt it. So the other thing you have to think about is, you know, as we move into space, the military is going to come along with us. This is the, the not so pleasant side of, of um, our, our move into space, but, you know, it's inevitable. There's a, there's a lot of people who are philosophically opposed to it. And I, like a lot of people are philosophically opposed to war completely. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very wasted activity. But uh, on the other hand, it's, it's a natural byproduct of our disagreements and, uh, and, and, and our sociological uh, makeup of, of our population. So the reality is that the, the military will always be ready to do battle in space. And that we just simply have to contend with this reality and uh, deal with it. So uh, it's, it's, it's not something I think that will slow us down per se, uh, but it's a reality that, that uh, will consume a lot of the resources that might otherwise go into space exploration. And in many people's eyes, it's a necessary diversion, but uh, uh, I'm not here to argue that. I, I just want to point out that uh, this, is, this is something that will go along with us regardless of whether or not we think it should be there. So the, the rest of the world, um, you know, really is unable to um, deal with a lot of these realities, uh, particularly at a government level, like I was saying. So private enterprise will, will, will be the ones that take us uh, to where nobody's gone before. Uh, in, in many ways, you know, the new world exploration was privately financed by the Queen of Spain. And uh, in, in many ways, it, it, it uh, was the same sort of thing. Uh, ultimately, it was you know Spain yeah, that uh, uh, started to explore the New World. But uh, as you start to understand the history of the New World's exploration, it was there were a lot of private companies that that would uh, come there. You know the Pilgrims, the famous Pilgrims that came to the United States in the 1600s, actually weren't the the first ones. Uh, they they were preceded by these um, these uh, trading companies that would come looking for 
beaver pelts and, and woods and things like that to trade. And in fact, my ancestors came here in the late 1500s. Um, I'm, I'm one of the oldest from one of the oldest families in the United States. And uh, they were here as merchants and uh, they weren't, they weren't here as representatives of any government. And the same thing will happen in space. So it's hard to imagine just like, you know, a couple of ships, wooden ships going across the ocean to the new world sparked an entire change in our history. This is what SpaceX looked like. That's Elon's um, uh, McLaren down there in the left-hand corner. This was um, our first factory in El Segundo. And uh, this is how it looked like when we moved in. And uh, I remember arguing with Elon over the cost of painting the floors with epoxy paint, which in my mind you had to do, right? There was no, no alternative. Uh, but this is where SpaceX began. And so you might not, as you go out and survey the rest of the space industry or any of these budding industries, you may not recognize these things that are, that are uh, the, the, the beginnings of something enormous. Uh, but this is what it looked like. And it, it, to me, it just uh, tells everything. I remember sitting in the offices, which were over behind the left wall over there. And uh, I remember looking out the window. I couldn't get the network to work. And I couldn't you know, hook up to the internet. Even back in 2002, that was fairly important to what we were doing. And I, and I saw a rat run across the the floor here and i thought really we're going to build rockets here <laughs> even i didn't have the faith that that we would do it but uh elon saw things that none of us saw and uh, just like this picture uh is is so symbolic of that um you know we've got to keep our eyes open and the rest of the industry uh to spot those things that are coming they may not they might not look at all like what the future looks like so keep this picture in mind as you think about it um, so here's what they build now. And it's just to connect these two is almost impossible in a person's mind unless you know that it's a fact and it's true and that, that you've seen the story. But uh, to go from here to here is just mind boggling. And, and this is in less than 15 short years, really, in human history. It's not long. So this gives you a sense of how rapid the, the pace is here. So I think that it's safe to say that the first humans to Mars will come by private taxi. They won't come by government black uh, suburban. Uh, they'll, they'll come, they'll stay and live off the land. Um, we all watched the, um, the movie, The Martian. And uh, I know the author of that. It was originally just a sort of an off the wall book that Andy Weir wrote and uh, that, that it got adopted for the movies. And, and it's a very, technically accurate story um, of, of using greenhouses. And again, this was the kind of greenhouse that Elon was talking about landing on Mars. That's why we went to Russia to buy rockets. It was a much smaller version of this, obviously, but the same concept holds, right? Uh, there's, there's no reason we can't go to Mars and uh, create an environment where we can live off of. Maybe some of it's underground. Uh, maybe it's all above ground like this. Uh, but the point is, we'll innovate and we'll figure it out. And if, again, if we could just get the stuff there, we can figure it all out. And uh, I think this is something that uh, is terribly exciting. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's only the precursor to much bigger things that look a little bit like the, uh, the enterprise uh, uh, and so forth. So, so at any rate, um, this is, uh, I think, a very, very fundamental part of our, of our future. So the other thing I want to sort of point out to you is, you know, I can tell you who the most famous human ever is, even though this person has probably not been born, definitely not been born. Uh, and uh, we don't even know who this person's parents are. Uh, but this, this, this most famous citizen ever will be the first human being born not on earth. That has never once happened. And once that happens, we've reached a new milestone in who we are as a species. And no doubt it will happen. Uh, it's just a matter of time. So, so we are really just in the very infancy of this whole thing. And there's so much to do here and so much opportunity here. It's, it's mind blowing. It's, it's, it's something that really requires the enterprise of the entire humanity to accomplish. And, and I'm confident we'll do it. 
So ultimately, the, this uh, human achievement will be not a government program, but it'll be, it'll be human achievement. It'll be something that we can all be proud of. It'll be all something that we can feel a sense of liberty from uh, having done it this way. Uh, I, I can't uh, think of going back to the mentality of the 80s and 90s, thinking that the uh, governments have to do this for us. Uh, so I, wanna, I want to plant the seed with all of you out there who are listening that uh, it doesn't matter if you're American, Indian, uh, Pakistani, uh, French, uh, Brit, British, I don't care. This is a human endeavor and uh, we, will, we will all achieve it together in one way or another. And it's going to take all of us to do it. So um, this will uh, conclude my, my talk. Um, I want to just leave you with the um, image of a star man, which is a real car and a, and a dummy. Uh, this was Elon's um, uh, Tesla that he launched on the uh, Falcon Heavy. Uh, very typical of Elon's sense of humor, uh, but uh, very symbolic of, of what he's trying to do. Uh, so I thought it was brilliant. I thought this is one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen is uh, launching a Tesla in, into our orbit. Well, I actually went to Mars, actually. So at uh, uh, any rate, uh, all, all of us go to the stars. We're all made from the stars and uh, to, to the stars we return. So thank you very much. I don't know if uh, anybody want, if we had a, Q and A session or what? But uh, yes, I'm happy sir. to hang around. Uh, thank you for that uh, inspiring talk, sir. Giving analogies with uh, automobiles and uh, that motivating uh, motivating lecture was awesome. Uh, we have some few few questions, sir. Um, yeah, can you uh, share a few of your memorable incidents working in SpaceX? You shared the humble beginnings, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some more. Well, you know the the stuff you can read on the internet covers our trip to Russia. I'll leave that one alone. Um, but uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the early days of SpaceX in in that picture you saw. Um, <laughs> we were a very small team. Um, you know, it was a, it was a team I'd put together to do the um, the Martian uh, lander. Really, was the core team. It was uh, Chris Thompson and and Tom Mueller and um, uh, Hans Koningsman and a, and a few others. Uh, but basically that was it um, to design this rocket. And, uh, you know, Tom had the engines and, uh, you know, I, I was in charge of a lot of different things, uh, contracts and, and uh, you know, the parachutes and, and so forth. And uh, Thompson was the, the he was doing the, um, the mechanical design of the rocket. In Koningsman, he was he was doing the all the uh, software and the guidance, navigation, control, and so forth. So it was a very uh, very small group, and uh, you know the the floor in the behind the offices was much like that. And uh, you know we had our own little laptop computers, and uh, that that's you know wouldn't wouldn't be any any different than any other startup you'd see today. And uh, you know we had all the same troubles of could get the internet to work. Um, you know, I remember the front door we'd use, this was in El Segundo, California, which is very near Los Angeles airport and uh, LAX. And uh, we'd leave the door open and we'd have homeless people walk in the front door. And uh, we, we eventually had to lock the doors, but uh, you know, it wasn't in a great part of town. And uh, you know, so, so it was very frustrating in the early days, I would say you know, to think that we were going to build this rocket. And I, I didn't have insight into the, into the raising of money that, you know, I was trained as an engineer, this, this business of raising money. I didn't learn until much later in life. Um, and of course, Elon knew it because he'd been through it with PayPal and so on. Um, but I didn't have that benefit. So that was one of the things I lacked was I understood how much money this was going to take, but I couldn't see how we would come up with that money. So that was like a completely foreign thing that, yeah, I didn't understand its existence of, and um, so uh, as as time went on, it's obvious they were able to raise the money, and I would say that that back then it wasn't as developed either as how you raise the money, um, but uh, you know it, it it was one of those things that caused me to uh, 
caused me to wonder about the viability of SpaceX. And, uh, you know, Elon was not always there either. He was, uh, you know, he had an office upstairs and, and he, he had an office where it was just a cubicle and uh, anybody could come and just grab him. And it was very accessible in those days. Um, as we added a few more people, he had a, he had an assistant, uh, Mary Beth Brown. Uh, and I, I really liked Mary Beth. She, she was very helpful to him, but, uh, I wouldn't call her an admin or anything like that. She was kind of a personal assistant and, uh, you know, sometimes you'd have to talk to her to get Elon's attention. He was always on the phone. Uh, but you know, he was very involved in, in the decisions. He, he was, he's very, he's very technical, very smart. Um, and he, you know, he's smarter than all of us. I'll, I'll admit that. I think his IQs exceeds all of us by, by, by far. It was apparent from the beginning. I, I'm considered pretty smart, but compared to Elon, he's, 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 he's a whole other thing completely. Um, but the thing about him that I found was he was very motivated and he would spend so many hours at this. It, I don't necessarily know that that's, that's the formula for success, but Elon certainly did spend the time at it. And I can remember a few times getting phone calls at 3 a.m. because he's still working. <laughs> I'm sleeping, but he's working. And, uh, you know, I, I was I was never the guy who, you know, who worked 20-hour uh, days or anything like that. I, I get to 12 and I'm done. Elon would get to 20 and he was done. I don't think he slept very much. Um, you know, and so, so part of his success is, is this. Part of it is the fact he just doesn't give up. And I think that's probably, probably the bigger part of it, as I, as I saw from the early days. And, uh, you know, a lot of us were getting discouraged because of, you know, the conditions of not having internet and, you know, our, it was, it was these shitty little desks that we were sitting at and, uh, you know, just, it just didn't meet our mental expectations of, of what a big rocket company would be. And uh, having not seen this go from that, that, that picture that you saw, to the to the other picture of the rockets going out the door it was hard to believe in it right it was it was a little bit like believing in god maybe so so uh we just we just didn't have that faith and uh you know a number of people stuck with it because they had to uh and and it turned out very good for them of course uh, people like me i didn't have to and i i left because i uh i just got i got tired of uh all the things that that i didn't like to deal with like the 3 a.m calls with him yelling at me and and so forth. And I, frankly, I just wasn't, I wasn't into the idea of what Elon wanted to do. I, I just didn't believe in, in uh, what he was doing at the time. So, so I went off and did my own thing. And uh, I, I rationalized the money side of it and said, I could make as much money on my own. I made a lot of money on my own, but, but <laughs> not as much as Elon's made. So, so clearly, you know, I could have stayed, but I would have had to have been a different person frankly, just stayed there. And uh, at the time I had family, I had young children, and uh, they needed me. And uh, so I chose a, I chose a different life that kept me closer to my children and you know, where I could raise them and, and be a part of their lives. And I don't regret it. Um, so it's, it's okay. But I, I do think a lot about it. And I think back on, you know, the choices we make in life, and how small choices have big consequences. And, and that's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing for me to think about. You know, you, uh, again, I say I had a small part in a very large enterprise in the beginning and uh, probably influential, but, but it was, it's definitely a small part. And, uh, you know, I like to think that I help, I help change things uh, in, in that respect. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, what do you feel about electric power traffic? Like, uh, what is its feasibility in the future? Oh, electric propulsion, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> let me just say on a larger scale, propulsion is um, one of those things that has to improve for all those things I talked about, about going into the cosmos, right? And I think propulsion systems today are still like engines were in, in, in for the Model T, right? very primitive and uh, chemical propulsion is fine, uh, but it's, it's very inefficient and, and you have to take so much mass with you to go anywhere. We have to find a better way in order to, to go beyond earth and to go at speeds that, that we don't die by the time we get to our destination. So 
really what um you know electropropulsion is a step along the way but it's certainly not the answer uh because it's not that much more efficient plus the problem is is it's it's very difficult to get the kinds of thrust levels up to get to the the points where uh you can get the kinds of speeds we need in a reasonable period of time don't get me wrong it's a great it's a great technology uh, at phantom we have electro propulsion we build for satellites but the, the the issue is really it's it's not going to be the ultimate solution it's it's a it's a stepping stone so uh, my, my gut sense is that there's probably something that is more based on quantum physics and things we don't understand today that will create propulsion of the future you know antimatter propulsion for example that that will uh, create the kinds of things that will propel us to the stars electric is going to make what we do in space more efficient but getting from the earth to space serves almost no purpose because of the uh, below thrust yeah thank you sir uh, we have few more questions uh, what are your views on reaching some uh, planets uh, outside the solar systems with our earth like like uh, what are the feasibilities uh, near future that we can achieve that it's a great question so um one of the people i had the uh, honor of knowing in my life was was carl sagan he was a famous astronomer maybe some of you have seen his uh, series cosmos and uh, when i was a young young boy i watched cosmos on tv and uh, got me interested in science and uh, when i was living in france he um, he called my house he was in town he was in toulouse and the phone rang and uh, it was this familiar voice and uh, he was asking for me to give him a uh, tour of what we were doing with the mars balloon and uh, so so i did and we got stuck in traffic and uh, carl was very impatient uh, about a lot of things he didn't like traffic too much so so we got talking and uh, what he asked me he says he said jim are you are you a man of religion and and my answer was you know uh, my life would be a lot easier if i were more so and uh, i said i struggle with it and he i struggle with faith and he said you know he says who has more faith he says you 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 look up in the sky and this and the scientist sees these dots of light with uh millions and millions of dots of light and you imagine creatures living on each one of those dots of light and or somebody who uh who looks around this earth and says this is a place of beauty that was obviously created by a god um you know who has more faith and i said, I said clearly the scientist has more faith right so so it's an act of faith to, to that's based on our intellectual understandings of these things and and yes i believe that that we do absolutely have life and elsewhere in the universe we may have life on mars frankly uh, i'm not convinced that we haven't haven't truly discovered that it will be a, in in a lot of ways i hope that we don't because if if we find life on mars it'll be very complicated about how we explore mars and all these great pictures of people living on mars or even going to mars uh will be greatly complicated we've seen what this this virus called uh, covid-19 has done to us can you imagine uh the idea of of a of a, uh, a non-planetary virus coming back so this reverse contamination of earth so so in many ways you know in our solar system i hope kind of hope we don't find it but on the other hand i do hope we find it um but but clearly out on the stars there are other planets like earth that have habitable conditions in fact i would dare say that that life as we understand it, as a carbon based life form is only one of many different kinds of life forms that, that might exist so there may be other conditions uh like we find life at the bottom of the ocean now when we go to new places there there are things down there that we never thought existed near sulfur vents and so forth same is going to happen in, in the universe and that's that's the magic that you know that sparks my dna to think about what what's really out there right and uh if only we could go there thank you sir thank you so much uh in your view like uh, uh, when can we see the future uh, uh, like space transportation affordable for uh, a large number of population yeah yeah i think so you know i uh, i look at what we're doing again i think the answer is mass manufacturing 
And I think if we build enough of these things and we can figure out how to launch rockets from places that aren't, you know, Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg Air Force Base and places like that, it's going to be it's going to be very affordable. Maybe maybe not for the average person, but it'll become more like aircraft transportation was, you know, 100 years ago. And uh, and and now you look at you know almost all of us can afford an airplane ticket to go somewhere else in the world. So you know you know we're looking at uh, the possibility of human transport on our small launch vehicles, for example, as part of the future of transportation uh, uh, sector. You know it doesn't necessarily have to be a Falcon Nine, which is always going to be forty fifty million dollars. But if we can get you know our launches down to single digit million dollars. That, that's accessible to a whole other class of people. And if you start reusing these, these, these systems, then again, it becomes even, even more, more affordable. So, yeah, I, I think it, it, the future is very bright there. Um, and maybe even within my lifetime, we'll see that my life's getting, my, what's left is shorter and shorter, but uh, you know, you're much younger than me. I'm sure you'll see it. Uh, to, maybe even you will, you will uh, be able to, to go into orbit and then after you're done, drop into uh, New York City when you're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, like uh, for a given type of launcher, uh, like what is the uh, difference between the cost to or orbit uh, if we have an object sending to orbit or a human? Like what is the primary difference between uh, both and what are the uh, challenges in each? That's a great question. So um, I would say a rough order of magnitude difference in cost is probably a factor of three or four. Um, and, and the main reason is just the safety of, you know, we, 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 at least in most countries in the world, we consider life somewhat sacred. So we don't uh, necessarily want to endanger it unnecessarily. So, so we have a higher reliability and a lower tolerance of failure Therefore, uh, you know, th there's going to be more attention paid to that, more money spent on it and so forth. So, you know, the, the big differences between a human rated system and a non-human rated system is the number of levels of redundancy in, in the technical backups and so forth. You typically have a, a, a triple voting system on, on uh, uh, all the uh, software uh, and you might have physical uh, redundancy on that level for the hardware itself. Um, I know on the shuttle, they had at least two, preferably three systems for everything. A lot of spacecraft you see that are unmanned uh, often will have you know, full redundancy on, on all the avionics and so forth. The, the power systems, they generally don't. And so, so there are some things you, you can't have redundancy, like on a, on a structure, on a rocket, you can't have redundancy on that. You only have one structure but you might have something that's built a little sturdier. It's got more safety margin into it. So, so those are the sort of things you look at. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a wide variety of things it impacts. And, uh, but fundamentally, it's the same device, right? And uh, you see the Falcon 9, the human rated Falcon 9, they had to spend a lot of development money on that. And so that, that's the other side of it is that that development money has to be recuperated through an increase in the pricing. So, you know, the, the, the numbers I'm seeing for some of these private flights of astronauts to these private space stations, again, it's an early market, but I'm starting to see $50 million a passenger, uh, which seems very high to me. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, Virgin, uh, you know, when they talk about their trip to space, that's actually not to orbit, it's, it's energetically a lower amount. You go up, you experience 15, 20 minutes of zero Gs and you come back and, um, you know that's that's hundreds of thousands of dollars up to a million. It's not it's not fifty million. So um, so so you know we'll see again with the, with the small launchers. I think they give us a chance of you know having single digit million dollar human trips to the space station uh, rather than fifty million dollars, and and that'll be through mass manufacturing. Yes, sir. thank you for sharing your uh, thought. Um, we have uh, one more question. Um, like uh, we have, we always have this quality and cost issue, right? So uh, in all the transportation things. So uh, uh, particularly in space transportation, like uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, like uh, uh, like if you have 
if we develop partnership between uh, space agencies of companies uh, would you would you uh, uh, vision reduction in uh, the cost and what quality could be uh, what sort of quality issues could be solved by having partnership between companies that's that's an interesting question um you know, how could we you know partner between companies i i think what's evolving is is a supply chain which is kind of what you're describing um, in, in this industry, it's, you know, SpaceX was what we call vertically integrated. They build everything. Literally, there, there's, there's very, very few contractors to SpaceX. A lot of people, you know, over the years, I get a lot of people asking me to get introduced to SpaceX. And uh, just for the record, I don't do it, so don't ask. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not that I'm annoyed by it. It's just it, it's not going to work. But, uh, you know, they, they have done that for historic reasons. Number one, you know, 20 years ago, as we looked at the supply chain, it was really related to the military industrial complex. And so we realized in order to uh, uh, disrupt the price and, and the cost of the business, we had to build all of our own uh, parts of the rocket uh, because we couldn't rely on the, on the basic core costs that were baked into it by the way the government does business. So that's why we vertically integrated SpaceX. The other thing was that uh, we knew that eventually if we were successful in disrupting the industry, that the large companies like Lockheed Martin, like Boeing, whose capabilities we were actually disrupting, uh, they would, they would uh, resort to political uh, acts to to uh, keep us from becoming competitive. So, so we decided we had to be independent of their supply chain, which they largely controlled because they were doing the most business with them. So it was those two things together that forced us there. What you're starting to see now is, 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 is a change. It's a maturing of the industry. And at Phantom, for example, um, we, we took a, a completely contrarian view of this vertical integration and we're buying our engines from another company that has already designed and built them and tested them. Uh, we licensed our avionics from NASA. We're buying, you know, the batteries from another company and so on. So, so we're not doing it like SpaceX did. Almost every launch company that starts does it like SpaceX. And if you go ask them, you know, why are you vertically integrated? They just look at you with this look and they say, well, because SpaceX did it that way. They don't think about it. And, um, the reality is that no industry is built on vertical integration. Uh, that's that's very large and very successful. Even, you know, even General Motors or Ford or any of these any of these companies, they all have to rely on a supply chain. So, so I think it's healthy. I think it's one of those things that's happening here. It's in the very early stages of it. Uh, but uh, in terms of you know how SpaceX and other companies work together, by and large, I think that will be. Uh, you know, Blue Origin and SpaceX will probably never work together because they're they're competitive in nature. Um, but say some of the smaller launchers and some of the large companies, there there will be a consolidation of those companies. SpaceX will probably end up buying a few companies. Blue Origin, the same thing. We'll we'll see that consolidation happen. That's probably about ten years away. Um, so so that that'll happen with time. So uh, we have one quick la last question. A last question, like, uh, are we going to see space elevators? Is it really possible? <laughs> so I'm not a believer in space elevators. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke's <laughs> idea. Uh, I, I don't see how they practically work, but you know, I've been wrong about a lot of things. So take that with a, as we say, with a grain of salt. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful session, uh, inspiring right. talk. Uh, I hope all the audience would have got enriched uh, with your uh, keynote lecture. Thank you, thank you for uh, uh, giving this lecture in RSG 2021. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you very right. much. Thank you very much. All right. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, for the notice of the audience, we have a, a merchandise sale which is live online. So you can visit rsdiitmetras.com uh, to find your polos and t-shirts. 
tomorrow we have uh, two lectures coming up uh, uh, one is at 10 am ist biomimicry by mr prashant dawan sima anand co-founders of uh, biomimicry india network and at 2 pm we have uh, uh, mr max narasimhan managing director and ceo of place solar uh, on the rise of the planet of renewables so we have the final uh, yeah uh, we will play uh, day 3 a uh, video just now uh, and we'll con con conclude the session yeah thank you Yeah, thank you all. Hope to meet you tomorrow.